part one of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution excerpt from trial of henry wirtz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part one opening material fortieth congress second session house of representatives ex doc number twenty three trial of henry wirtz letter from the secretary of war ad interim in answer to a resolution of the house of april sixteenth eighteen sixty six transmitting a summary of the trial of henry wirtz december seventh eighteen sixty seven referred to the committee on the judiciary and ordered to be printed war department washington city december five eighteen sixty seven sir in compliance with the resolution of the house of representatives dated april sixteenth eighteen sixty six i have the honour to send herewith a summary of the proceedings etc of the trial of henry wirtz very respectfully your obedient servant u s grant secretary of war ad interim hon s colfax speaker of the house of representatives the trial of henry wirtz prepared in the office of the adjutant-general united states army in accordance with the following resolution of congress thirty-ninth congress first session congress of the united states in the house of representatives april sixteenth eighteen sixty six on motion of mr garfield resolved that the secretary of war be requested to have prepared for publication the proceedings of the trial of henry wirtz in which shall be embraced as nearly as practicable in the language of the witnesses a summary of the testimony given and the decisions findings and sentence of the court together with the address of the judge advocate and that made in defence of the prisoner attest edward mcpherson clerk plan of the work the entire testimony taken upon the trial of henry wirtz is set forth in the following pages it is arranged in narrative form for the sake of compactness and as being more easily read the exact language of each witness being given as nearly as practicable in cases where the meaning of a witness is doubtful or his answer evasive and also where the testimony is of great importance the questions and answers have been given the testimony of the witnesses is given in the order in which it occurs in the original record most of the witnesses have been examined upon many separate and distinct points and it has been deemed advisable to gather the entire testimony of a witness upon each subject under a suitable heading in the examination in chief and also in the cross-examination the reader can by reference to the index of testimony ascertain at once the entire testimony upon each allegation set forth in the charges and specifications and by turning to the page therein indicated find under its suitable heading that which he may select for perusal the compiler proceedings of a military commission convened at washington d c by virtue of the following order war department adjutant general's office washington august twenty three eighteen sixty five special orders number four five three extract three a special military commission is hereby appointed to meet in this city at eleven o'clock a m on the twenty third day of august eighteen sixty five or as soon thereafter as practicable for the trial of henry wirtz and such other prisoners as may be brought before it detail for the commission major general l wallace united states volunteers brevet major general g mott united states volunteers brevet major general j w gary united states volunteers brevet major general l thomas adjutant general united states army 
brigadier general francis fessenden united states volunteers brigadier general e s bragg united states volunteers brevet brigadier general john f Ballier, colonel ninety eighth pennsylvania volunteers brevet colonel t alcock lieutenant colonel fourth new york artillery lieutenant colonel j h stibbs twelfth iowa volunteers colonel n p chipman additional aide-de-camp judge advocate of the commission with such assistance as he may select with the approval of the judge advocate general the commission will sit without regard to hours by order of the president of the united states e d townsend assistant adjutant general washington d c wednesday august twenty three eighteen sixty five the commission met at eleven o'clock a m all the members named in the foregoing order and the judge advocate being present the commission proceeded to the trial of henry wirtz who having been brought before the commission and having heard the order convening it read was asked whether he had any objection to any member named therein to which he replied in the negative the judge advocate then laid before the commission the correspondence requesting the services of major a a hosmer as assistant judge advocate and the approval of the judge advocate general of such selection the members of the commission were then duly sworn by the judge advocate and the judge advocate and assistant judge advocate were duly sworn by the president of the commission respectively in the presence of the accused henry g hayes d wolf brown and william hinks were duly sworn by the judge advocate as reporters to the commission the accused was then duly arraigned on the following charges and specifications End of part one. Part two of Henry Wirtz, Commander of Andersonville Confederate Prison, Trial and Execution by United States Army Staff Judge Advocate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. Two charges and fourteen specifications charge one maliciously willfully and traitorously and in aid of the then existing armed rebellion against the united states of america on or about the first day of march a d eighteen sixty four and on diverse other days between that day and the tenth day of april eighteen sixty five combining confederating and conspiring together with john h winder richard b winder joseph white w s winder r r stevenson and others unknown to injure the health and destroy the lives of soldiers in the military service of the united states then held and being prisoners of war within the lines of the so-called confederate states and in the military prisons thereof to the end that the armies of the united states might be weakened and impaired in violation of the laws and customs of war specification in this that he the said henry wirtz did combine confederate and conspire with them the said john h winder richard b winder joseph white w s winder r r stevenson and others whose names are unknown citizens of the united states aforesaid and who were then engaged in armed rebellion against the united states maliciously traitorously and in violation of the laws of war to impair and injure the health and to destroy the lives by subjecting to torture and great suffering by confining in unhealthy and unwholesome quarters by exposing to the inclemency of winter and to the dews and burning sun of summer by compelling the use of impure water and by furnishing insufficient and unwholesome food of large numbers of federal prisoners to wit the number of thirty thousand soldiers in the military service of the united states of america held as prisoners of war at andersonville in the state of georgia within the lines of the so-called confederate states 
on or before the first day of march a d eighteen sixty four and at divers times between that day and the tenth day of april a d eighteen sixty five to the end that the armies of the united states might be weakened and impaired and the insurgents engaged in armed rebellion against the united states might be aided and comforted and he the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states being then and there commandant of a military prison at andersonville in the state of georgia located by authority of the so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war and as such commandant fully clothed with authority and in duty bound to treat care and provide for such prisoners held as aforesaid as were or might be placed in his custody according to the law of war did in furtherance of such combination confederation and conspiracy and incited thereunto by them the said john h winder richard b winder joseph white w s winder r r stevenson and others whose names are unknown maliciously wickedly and traitorously confine a large number of such prisoners of war soldiers in the military service of the united states to the amount of thirty thousand men in unhealthy and unwholesome quarters in a close and small area of ground wholly inadequate to their wants and destructive to their health which he well knew and intended and while there so confined during the time aforesaid did in furtherance of his evil design and in aid of the said conspiracy wilfully and maliciously neglect to furnish tents barracks or other shelter sufficient for their protection from the inclemency of winter and the dews and burning sun of summer and with such evil intent did take and cause to be taken from them their clothing blankets camp equipage and other property of which they were possessed at the time of being placed in his custody and with like malice and evil intent did refuse to furnish or cause to be furnished food either of a quality or quantity sufficient to preserve health and sustain life and did refuse and neglect to furnish wood sufficient for cooking in summer and to keep the said prisoners warm in winter and did compel the said prisoners to subsist upon unwholesome food and that in limited quantities entirely inadequate to sustain health which he well knew and did compel the said prisoners to use unwholesome water reeking with the filth and garbage of the prison and prison guard and the offal and drainage of the cook-house of said prison whereby the prisoners became greatly reduced in their bodily strength and emaciated and injured in their bodily health their minds impaired and their intellects broken and many of them to wit the number of ten thousand whose names are unknown sickened and died by reason thereof which he the said henry wirtz then and there well knew and intended and so knowing and evilly intending did refuse and neglect to provide proper lodgings food or nourishment for the sick and necessary medicine and medical attendance for the restoration of their health and did knowingly wilfully and maliciously in furtherance of his evil designs permit them to languish and die from want of care and proper treatment and the said henry wirtz still pursuing his evil purposes did permit to remain in the said prison among the emaciated sick and languishing living the bodies of the dead until they became corrupt and loathsome and filled the air with fetid and noxious exhalations and thereby greatly increased the unwholesomeness of the prison insomuch that great numbers of said prisoners to wit the number of one thousand whose names are unknown sickened and died by reason thereof and the said henry wirtz still pursuing his wicked and cruel purpose wholly disregarding the usages of civilized warfare did at the time and place aforesaid maliciously and wilfully subject the prisoners aforesaid to cruel and unusual and infamous punishment upon slight trivial and fictitious pretences by fastening large balls of iron to their feet 
and binding large numbers of the prisoners aforesaid closely together with large chains around their necks and feet so that they walked with the greatest difficulty and being so confined were subjected to the burning rays of the sun often without food or drink for hours and even days from which said cruel treatment large numbers to wit the number of one hundred whose names are unknown sickened fainted and died and he the said wirtz did further cruelly treat and injure said prisoners by maliciously confining them within an instrument of torture called the stocks thus depriving them of the use of their limbs and forcing them to lie sit and stand for many hours without the power of changing position and being without food or drink in consequence of which many to wit the number of thirty whose names are unknown sickened and died and he the said wirtz still wickedly pursuing his evil purpose did establish and cause to be designated within the prison enclosure containing said prisoners a dead line being a line around the inner face of the stockade or wall enclosing said prison and about twenty feet distant from and within said stockade and having so established said dead line which was in many places an imaginary line and in many other places marked by insecure and shifting strips of boards nailed upon the tops of small and insecure stakes or posts he the said wirtz instructed the prison guard stationed around the top of said stockade to fire upon and kill any of the prisoners aforesaid who might touch fall upon pass over or under or across the said deadline pursuant to which said orders and instructions maliciously and needlessly given by said wirtz the said prison guard did fire upon and kill a large number of said prisoners to wit the number of about three hundred and the said wirtz still pursuing his evil purpose did keep and use ferocious and bloodthirsty beasts dangerous to human life called bloodhounds to hunt down prisoners of war aforesaid who made their escape from his custody and did then and there wilfully and maliciously suffer incite and encourage the said beasts to seize tear mangle and maim the bodies and limbs of said fugitive prisoners of war which the said beasts incited as aforesaid then and there did whereby a large number of said prisoners of war who during the time aforesaid made their escape and were recaptured and were by the said beasts then and there cruelly and inhumanly injured insomuch that many of said prisoners to wit the number of about fifty died and the said wirtz still pursuing his wicked purpose and still aiding in carrying out said conspiracy did use and cause to be used for the pretended purposes of vaccination impure and poisonous vaccine matter which said impure and poisonous matter was then and there by the direction and order of said wirtz maliciously cruelly and wickedly deposited in the arms of many of said prisoners by reason of which large numbers of them to wit one hundred lost the use of their arms and many of them to wit about the number of two hundred were so injured that they soon thereafter died all of which he the said henry wirtz well knew and maliciously intended and in aid of the then existing rebellion against the united states with a view to assist in weakening and impairing the armies of the united states and in furtherance of the said conspiracy and with the full knowledge consent and connivance of his co-conspirators aforesaid he the said words then and there did charge two murder in violation of the laws and customs of war specification one in this that the said henry wirtz an officer of the military services of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the eighth day of july a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states 
for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously wilfully and of his malice aforethought did make an assault and he the said henry wirtz a certain pistol called a revolver then and there loaded and charged with gunpowder and bullets which said pistol the said henry wirtz in his hand there and then had and held to against and upon a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown then and there feloniously and of his malice aforethought did shoot and discharge inflicting upon the body of the soldier aforesaid a mortal wound with the pistol aforesaid in consequence of which said mortal wound murderously inflicted by the said henry wirtz the said soldier thereafter to wit on the ninth day of july a d eighteen sixty four died specification two in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the twentieth day of september a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously wilfully and of his malice aforethought did jump upon stamp kick bruise and otherwise injure with the heels of his boots a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown of which said stamping kicking and bruising maliciously done and inflicted by the said wirtz he the said soldier soon thereafter to wit on the twentieth day of september a d eighteen sixty four died specification three in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the thirteenth day of june a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did make an assault and he the said henry wirtz a certain pistol called a revolver then and there loaded and charged with gunpowder and bullets which said pistol the said henry wirtz in his hand there and then had and held to against and upon a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown then and there feloniously and of his malice aforethought did shoot and discharge inflicting upon the body of the soldier aforesaid a mortal wound with the pistol aforesaid in consequence of which said mortal wound murderously inflicted by the said henry wirtz the said soldier immediately to wit on the day aforesaid died specification four in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the thirtieth day of may a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did make an assault and he the said henry wirtz a certain pistol called a revolver then and there loaded and charged with gunpowder and bullets which said pistol the said henry wirtz in his hand there and then had and held to against and upon a soldier belonging to the army of the united states 
in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown then and there feloniously and of his malice aforethought did shoot and discharge inflicting upon the body of the soldier aforesaid a mortal wound with the pistol aforesaid in consequence of which said mortal wound murderously inflicted by the said henry wirtz the said soldier on the thirtieth of may a d eighteen sixty four died specification five in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the twentieth day of august a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did confine and bind with an instrument of torture called the stocks a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown in consequence of which said cruel treatment maliciously and murderously inflicted as aforesaid he the said soldier soon thereafter to wit on the thirtieth day of august a d eighteen sixty four died specification six in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the first day of february eighteen sixty five then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did confine and bind within an instrument of torture called the stocks a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown in consequence of which said cruel treatment maliciously and murderously inflicted as aforesaid he the said soldier soon thereafter to wit on the sixth day of february a d eighteen sixty five died specification seven in this that the said henry wirtz an officer of the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the twentieth day of july a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did fasten and chain together several persons soldiers belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as prisoners of war whose names are unknown binding the necks and feet of said prisoner closely together and compelling them to carry great burdens to wit large iron balls chained to their feet so that in consequence of the said cruel treatment inflicted upon them by the said henry wirtz as aforesaid one of the said soldiers a prisoner of war as aforesaid whose name is unknown on the twenty fifth day of july a d eighteen sixty four died specification eight in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the fifteenth day of may a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously wilfully and of his malice aforethought did order a rebel soldier whose name is unknown then on duty as a sentinel or guard to the prison of which said henry wirtz was commandant as aforesaid 
to fire upon a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown and in pursuance of said order so as aforesaid maliciously and murderously given as aforesaid he the said rebel soldier did with a musket loaded with gunpowder and bullet then and there fire at the said soldier so as aforesaid held as a prisoner of war inflicting upon him a mortal wound with the musket aforesaid of which he the said prisoner soon thereafter to wit on the day aforesaid died specification nine in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the first day of july a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did order a rebel soldier whose name is unknown then on duty as a sentinel or guard to the prison of which said wirtz was commandant as aforesaid to fire upon a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown and in pursuance of said order so as aforesaid maliciously and murderously given as aforesaid he the said rebel soldier did with a musket loaded with gunpowder and bullet then and there fire at the said soldier so as aforesaid held as a prisoner of war inflicting upon him a mortal wound with the said musket of which he the said prisoner soon thereafter to wit on the day aforesaid died specification ten in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the twentieth day of august a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did order a rebel soldier whose name is unknown then on duty as a sentinel or guard to the prison of which said wirtz was commandant as aforesaid to fire upon a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown and in pursuance of said order so as aforesaid maliciously and murderously given as aforesaid he the said rebel soldier did with a musket loaded with gunpowder and bullet then and there fire at the said soldier so as aforesaid held as a prisoner of war inflicting upon him a mortal wound with the said musket of which he the said prisoner soon thereafter to wit on the day aforesaid died specification eleven in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the first day of july a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did cause incite and urge certain ferocious and bloodthirsty animals called bloodhounds to pursue attack wound and tear in pieces a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown and in consequence thereof the said bloodhounds did then and there with the knowledge encouragement and instigation of him the said wirtz maliciously and murderously given by him attack and mortally wound the said soldier in consequence of which said mortal wound he the said prisoner soon thereafter to wit on the sixth day of july a d eighteen sixty four died specification twelve 
in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the twenty seventh day of july a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as said commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did order a rebel soldier whose name is unknown then on duty as a sentinel or guard to the prison of which said wirtz was commandant as aforesaid to fire upon a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown and in pursuance of said order so as aforesaid maliciously and murderously given as aforesaid he the said rebel soldier did with a musket loaded with gunpowder and bullet then and there fire at the said soldier so as aforesaid held as a prisoner of war inflicting upon him a mortal wound with the said musket of which said mortal wound he the said prisoner soon thereafter to wit on the day aforesaid died specification thirteen in this that the said henry wirtz an officer in the military service of the so-called confederate states of america at andersonville in the state of georgia on or about the third day of august a d eighteen sixty four then and there being commandant of a prison there located by the authority of the said so-called confederate states for the confinement of prisoners of war taken and held as such from the armies of the united states of america while acting as such commandant feloniously and of his malice aforethought did make an assault upon a soldier belonging to the army of the united states in his the said henry wirtz's custody as a prisoner of war whose name is unknown and with a pistol called a revolver then and there held in the hands of the said wirtz did beat and bruise said soldier upon the head shoulders and breast inflicting thereby mortal wounds from which said beating and bruising aforesaid and mortal wounds caused thereby the said soldier soon thereafter to wit on the fourth day of august a d eighteen sixty four died by order of the president of the united states n p chipman colonel and a a d c judge advocate end of part two part three of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part three statement of prisoner henry wirtz in answer to charges part one in this closing scene of a trial which must have wearied the patience of this honourable commission and which has all but exhausted the little vitality left me i appear to put on record my answer to the charges on which i am arraigned and to protest and vindicate my innocence i know how hard it is for one helpless and unfriended as i am to contend against the prejudices produced by popular clamour and long-continued misrepresentation but i have great faith in the power of truth and i have much confidence in the intelligence and impartiality of the officers who are my judges i am here to answer for all my official and personal acts at andersonville and if i can convince this court that they have been void of offence before god and man i trust that i shall not be held responsible for the official or personal misdeeds of others that is all i ask by my own acts let me be judged and if they have been such as to warrant my conviction on any one of the charges or specifications preferred against me let me be visited with punishment commensurate with the offence i do not ask mercy but i demand justice and i humbly pray that the god of justice will enlighten the minds and quicken the perceptions of those whose solemn duty it is to discriminate between the truth and falsehood of all that has been testified to in the case 
i will leave to my counsel the presentation and argument of such points of law as they may deem of importance and will myself endeavour to analyse the evidence group together the main facts and explain away all that may seem to weigh so heavily against me in doing so i will strive to be simple and concise and let me beg the court to believe that i will be above all things frank and truthful there are three distinct and clearly defined parts into which the prosecution and the defence are necessarily compressed and it appears to me that a close observance of those natural divisions will do much to simplify the question and to enable the court to arrive at a fair and just conclusion these are first have i as is charged maliciously wilfully and traitorously combined confederated and conspired with john h winder and others to injure the health and destroy the lives of soldiers in the military service of the united states second am i the person who was officially responsible for the privations and sufferings of the federal prisoners at andersonville and third have i committed the crime of murder or perpetrated all or any of the atrocities laid to my charge in regard to the first division that of conspiracy i am not conscious of there being one particle of testimony in the entire record going to establish the charge or giving even faint colour of probability to its existence out of the hundred and sixty witnesses that have testified before this court has any one said that i was ever heard or known to have uttered a syllable or done an act tending to show my knowledge of the existence of such a hellish plot has any one shown or even hinted in the remotest manner that such a conspiracy existed and if no living witness could be found to lend even the weakest support to the monstrous supposition surely if it was not all a myth a dream of the imagination a fantasy of the brain there could be found among the papers of my office or in the archives of the confederate government some scrap of documentary evidence to give it at least the semblance of probability i think the court may fairly assume that if this wild chimera was not as unsubstantial as the baseless fabric of a vision there would have been some effort made by the learned and diligent judge advocate to give it form and substance no such attempt has been made no such attempt could be successfully made the idea is altogether too horrible for human credence and i can hardly think the learned judge advocate is serious in asking this honourable court to pass upon that charge even if all the specifications which are grouped under it were literally true if hundreds and thousands of brave men were subjected to all the horrible sufferings depicted therein there is not a shadow of testimony by which it can be proven that it was the fruit of a conspiracy it is incredible to believe that any number of created beings wearing the imprint of their maker could be found in any one age and clime to band together for such a purpose the land that could produce one such fiend should stand accursed no country could possibly be expected to contain two such monsters is it necessary for me to address another word to this honourable court defending myself from the charge of conspiracy if it be let me say this the government has shown in this very prosecution that its high officers do not believe that there is any foundation for the charge the court has official cognizance of the fact that on my first arraignment some of the highest functionaries of the confederate government general robert e lee james a seddon secretary of war lucius d northrop commissary general and dr moore surgeon general were described as my co-conspirators the facts on which the charge rested were as fully known to the government then as they are now if the charge be true now it was true then and if there was guilt anywhere in connection with it that guilt lay more deep and damning on their souls than it did on mine just in proportion as their positions were high and mine was humble those co-conspirators were all in the custody 
direct or implied of the government yet not one of them was called upon to take his place beside me and answer to this court for his crime on the contrary they have all been favoured with executive clemency and their names have been expunged from the charge i appeal to the intelligence of this court whether there could be a plainer or ampler disavowal by the government of its belief in the existence of this monstrous thing styled conspiracy and then i appeal to its sense of justice and fair play whether a different rule shall be applied to me from that which was applied to my superiors i am no lawyer gentlemen and this statement is prepared without the aid of my counsel but unversed as i am and as perhaps some of you may be in legal lore my reason tells me that before a man can be convicted of a crime there must be either a confession on his part or some proof of his guilt here there is no confession of guilt but a solemn affirmation of innocence here there is no attempt at proof but a virtual abandonment of the charge as against the real culprits if there were any such is not conspiracy a positive crime just as murder is or as robbery is and is it not like those crimes to be proved by direct testimony my reason answered yes can a charge of conspiracy bringing with it such consequences as are involved here be supported on far-fetched inferences surely not common sense revolts at such an idea and i am confident that law which is said to be the perfection of common sense utterly repudiates it i believe that that which the judge advocate principally relies upon as proof of the existence of a conspiracy is the expression attributed to me by some of the witnesses that i was of more service to the confederate government than any regiment at the front connected with equally wicked and significant expressions attributed to general winder general howell cobb and captain w s winder so far as concerns the remark imputed to myself i will speak of it in another part of my defence general winder has gone to the great judgment seat to answer for all his thoughts words and deeds and i surely am not to be held culpable for them general howell cobb has received the pardon of the president of the united states showing that he could not have been regarded as a conspirator and when i asked that he should be brought here as a witness and given an opportunity of contradicting the testimony referring to him the judge advocate in the exercise of his large discretion declined to summon him thus virtually admitting that which i desired to prove as to captain w s winder he is i believe within the jurisdiction of the united states government and can be made amenable for any crime committed by him surely under such circumstances i am not to be held to answer for the rash wicked or imprudent expressions of general winder captain winder or general howell cobb i think i may also claim as a self-evident proposition that if i a subaltern officer merely obeyed the legal orders of my superiors in the discharge of my official duties i cannot be held responsible for the motives which dictated such orders and if i overstepped them violating the laws of war and outraging humanity i am to be tried and punished according to the measure of my offence as well might every general colonel and captain in the rebel service be held criminally responsible as a co-conspirator with the chiefs of the rebellion as i who simply held a subordinate position at andersonville be held to answer with my life for the motives which may or may not have inspired my superior officers for all these causes i humbly but confidently submit to this honourable commission that on charge one a verdict of not guilty must be rendered i also submit it to the consideration of the court whether if the charge fall the specifications under it must not as a legal and logical consequence fall with it the charge is as it were the foundation of the edifice and when it gives way the whole superstructure topples with it this however is a legal question which i am incompetent to argue and which i willingly leave to the court to decide for itself 
under the rules governing military courts i now come to the second division of the question viz am i the person who from my position at andersonville should properly be held accountable for the crowded condition of the stockade the want of shelter the unwholesomeness of food the impurity of the water the inadequacy of hospital accommodation and the lack of medicine and medical supplies all which causes combined led to the dreadful mortality which prevailed at that place this division covers a large proportion of the testimony and will render it necessary for me to go a little into detail i will endeavour to avoid prolixity and to present the points as briefly as possible it is in evidence before the court that the stockade was laid out in the winter of eighteen sixty three by captain w s winder and that i was assigned to duty there on the twenty seventh of march eighteen sixty four whatever therefore may be thought of the good or bad selection of the locality no imputation in that respect can rest on me i was actually in europe at the time of its formation it is no part of my purpose in this defence to accuse or to defend others and therefore i pass by the testimony of lieutenant colonel persons one of the principal witnesses for the prosecution tending to show that for the accommodation of ten thousand prisoners the stockade was sufficiently large and properly located but lieutenant colonel persons does give some evidence which has a direct bearing upon my own guilt or innocence and to which i ask the attention of the court he testifies that in february eighteen sixty four he was assigned to duty as commander of the troops at andersonville and was subsequently advanced to the command of the post from which duty he was relieved in may or june that captain w sidney winder had laid out the prison that at that time he persons was relieved he was in the act of procuring lumber for the purpose of erecting shelter for the prisoners who then numbered between fifteen and twenty thousand that there was great difficulty in procuring transportation that there were a great many trees inside the stockade when the prisoners first went in and which were used by them in erecting buildings that the confederate authorities never removed those trees and that w s winder had told him he had had absolute discretion in the location of the prison as to the question of responsibility the following testimony drawn out by the judge advocate is of great importance part ten page six o seven question what control had he general winder of the prison answer he was as i understand in command of all the prisoners question he had control over everything answer that was my understanding on cross-examination lieutenant colonel persons gives the following testimony page six twenty one question by whose orders was that prison enlarged answer i think i did it without any orders question would captain wirtz have had any authority to enlarge that prison answer no sir question would he have dared to do it answer no sir question was he to be blamed at all for the size of it answer no sir again on page six twenty three the witness says i remember that captain wirtz time and again wanted to have lumber brought there question did he ever show any inclination to prevent its being used answer never on page six twenty seven he testifies question was there anything about the location of that prison that you discovered which led you to suppose that it was located for any bad purpose answer nothing sir question did that idea ever enter your mind answer no sir again on page six twenty nine lieutenant colonel persons says when that prison was in its infancy in its very inception and when the officers there were instructed not to build accommodations for more than ten thousand there were forty thousand prisoners sent there question was captain wirtz to be blamed for that answer no sir captain wirtz was not to be blamed for that by the court question who in your opinion was responsible for that answer well sir the authorities were responsible for that i cannot say who 
the great blunder on the part of the government was the concentration of so many men at one place without preparation being made to receive them the authorities were notified of the act but to no advantage i think that some of the higher officials were responsible but who they were i cannot say no man on earth could have abated the rigors of that prison except the man who wielded the power over them question who was that man answer i do not know general winder was in advance of me and several others were in advance of him who was responsible i cannot say i think the court will agree with me that so far as the testimony of lieutenant colonel persons can do so it completely exonerates me from all complicity in the selection of the locality the overcrowding of the stockade and the failure to provide proper shelter for the prisoners and the court will not fail to take notice of the fact that this gentleman was an important witness for the prosecution that he had evinced no leaning or sympathy towards me and that his testimony stands above all suspicion another important witness for the government was dr john c bates he has given to this court a terrible but truthful picture of the stockade and of the hospital i do not wish to have a single line erased from that description it is all but too true the only question with me here as it is all through the case is was i to be blamed for the existence of those things i will let dr bates that humane physician and honourable man speak for me on page two o five and following pages part four he testifies as follows Question was he captain wirtz responsible for anything the prisoners lacked or for anything good that they had answer it was not considered so by the medical officers there they never blamed captain wirtz that i heard of i never heard captain wirtz's name mentioned in reference to the ration so far as the sick were concerned question as to the medical department did he have anything to do with it answer not that i knew question did you not recognize him as having any right to do so answer i did not question you have no hard feelings towards him answer none at all he always treated me very respectfully and kindly question do you know of his treating any one else otherwise answer i never saw him use any hard means towards anybody on page two twenty four dr bates testifies as follows question did it ever strike you that any one about those premises was conspiring for the death of union prisoners there answer it never so impressed me i always objected to the shortness of the allowance but i never attributed it to a conspiracy i claim therefore and ask the court so to hold that so far as any responsibility for the condition of things in the hospital is concerned the testimony of dr bates entirely relieves me that testimony is also corroborated by that of dr g g roy who says on page five thirteen part eight question then captain wirtz exercised no control in that respect over the good effects of dr clayton's administration any more than over the bad effects of the other surgeon's administration answer no sir the fault was with the surgeon the same witness on the preceding page having spoken of seeing one case of a man being bucked as a punishment says he meaning me would have been more severe and his orders would have protected him question you never saw captain wirtz exercise severity except in the one instance you speak of answer only in the one instance that came under my special observation so far the court will observe i have been relying on the statements of the most intelligent witnesses on behalf of the government i propose to continue to quote from that class of witnesses and to extract from the evidence for the prosecution the elements for my own vindication lieutenant colonel d t chandler assistant adjutant and inspector general at richmond was sent as the court will recollect to inspect the condition of the prison at andersonville he was there at the end of july and beginning of august and his report of fifth of august is one of the exhibits in this case 
he found general winder in command of the post and captain r b winder in the position of quartermaster the suggestions which he had to make for the amelioration of affairs there were made as the court will recollect not to me showing that i was not the responsible party i quote from the report of his testimony page sixteen eighteen part twenty four question with whom did you at first consult when you arrived at andersonville answer general winder the commandant of the post and prison question how long had he been in command there answer i cannot say several months i know question what was his whole duty as commandant of the post answer in regard to the prisoners to keep them safe to have them taken care of properly protect them defend them prevent them being recaptured question page sixteen thirty two who had the ordering or directing of the surgeons or who ought to have given orders for them to go inside the surgeon-in-chief or general winder answer the order would properly have come i should think from the senior surgeon question then if they did not go in it was owing to his negligence in not giving the order answer yes sir i suppose so question page sixteen forty four you looked upon captain wirtz and his duty as nothing more than a part of general winder answer i considered him merely the executive officer of general winder in his particular branch of the business question page sixteen forty nine you have no reason to believe that they general winder's staff officers had any unusual latitude answer no sir i have not question by the court page sixteen seventy four part twenty five how did you regard general winder answer as commander of the post and prison question under whose orders were those medical officers answer under the orders of the chief surgeon and general winder they were under the immediate orders of the chief surgeon question was captain wirtz responsible in any degree for the scarcity of rations in the commissary department answer i should think not i can state positively he was not he had nothing to do with it and no control over it general winder was in command with captain armstrong reporting directly to him question who established the police regulations for the stockade general winder or captain wirtz answer general winder was responsible for them i do not know who drew them up i suppose that the deadline was established certainly with the knowledge and consent if not by the direction of general winder question the regulations touching that from whom did they come answer those instructions i suppose came from general winder i know that he was responsible for them by the judge advocate page sixteen eighty six question you have given it as your opinion that captain wirtz was not responsible for the rations furnished to the prisoners answer yes sir question are you positive of that answer yes sir by the court page sixteen ninety question did the post commander always exercise command over the prison answer he did through his executive officer with these extracts from the testimony of the most reliable witnesses for the prosecution all of them officers of the late confederate government all of them in positions favourable to a knowledge of the subject none of them evincing any bias in my favour and none open to a question as to their veracity i submit that on the second division of this subject that of responsibility for the general management of the prison at andersonville i am entitled to an acquittal it seems to me with great respect to this court that there is no room for doubt or hesitancy on the subject i have deemed it entirely unnecessary to put in any evidence on my own side bearing on that point although the testimony of captain wright quartermaster major proctor and captain armstrong commissary of post would have furnished additional proof and unqualified evidence that their respective departments were under the exclusive control of the commandant of post the judge advocate has very kindly saved me that trouble and indeed has not so far as i recollect made any serious effort to contest the point and the court will recollect that it embraces stockade and hospital alike 
that i have neither to answer for the location of the stockade the establishment of the police regulations in it the lack of supplies or of accommodation the management of the hospital nor any of those matters which have entered so largely into the evidence it is not for me to suggest where the culpability or responsibility lay enough for me to defend myself i try to do so without reflecting on any one else and i trust that that will not be regarded as diminishing the strength of my case and now may it please the court i come to that division of the case where i could not if i would evade or shirk responsibility for my acts i do not seek to evade it if i have violated the laws of war if i have outraged humanity if i have perpetrated any of the murders or atrocities laid to my charge let me suffer but i hope to be able to convince the court that i am not guilty and to that object i will now devote myself it does seem to me that with great respect for the judge advocate whose many acts of kindness i appreciate that this should have been the starting point of the prosecution and to that class of allegations it should have been confined a poor subaltern officer should not have had the ordinary performance of his routine duties treated and characterized as proof of his being a conspirator nor should he have been called upon to bear upon his overburdened shoulders the faults or misdeeds of others enough for him if on being called to account he can show that in fulfilling his own hard task he acted honestly faithfully humanely i do hope and trust that this enlightened court will bear with me in my humble effort to convince it that while commandant of the prison at andersonville i was not the monster that i have been depicted as being that i did not cause or delight in the sad spectacle of the sufferings woes and death of union prisoners that i did not contribute to their sufferings but that on the contrary i did what little lay in my power to diminish or alleviate them and prove that although i have been represented as little less than a fiend in human form heaven left some remnant of the angel still in that poor jailer's nature but how can i approach the task before me how can i collect and bring together the varied statements made by the witnesses before this court in a trial of nearly two months duration and particularly is it impossible to do so with any approach to completeness from the fact that there was no regular order observed in the proofs and that there was no connection established between the circumstances testified to by one witness and the same circumstance detailed by another in a different version and perhaps with an interval of weeks between them i must therefore appeal to the court to believe that if i do not allude to and try to disprove or explain every piece of testimony against me it is owing to these facts and not to my inability to do so let the court be tolerant and charitable and i will do my best and first as to the charge of murder the specifications accuse me of no less than thirteen distinct crimes of this grade three by shooting with my own hand one by jumping and stamping upon a prisoner three by torturing prisoners in stocks and chain gang four by ordering sentries to fire upon prisoners one by having a soldier torn in pieces and one by beating a soldier with a revolver the name regiment date or circumstances are not in a single instance stated in the specifications and in the whole mass of testimony there are but two cases of this character that there is any possibility of fixing with any definiteness in these two cases i am prepared to make my defence and i hope to do so satisfactorily and completely it cannot be expected neither law nor justice requires that i should be able to defend myself against the vague allegations the murky foggy indefinite and contradictory testimony in which the other so-called murders are enwrapped i do not know that even these two were in the judge advocate's mind when he prepared the charges and specifications i should suppose that they were not 
otherwise it would have been his duty and i am sure he would have performed it to have described them with some particularity the two cases that can be reached with any definiteness are first the real actual case of a federal prisoner well known by the nickname of chickamauga and the second the unreal imaginary case of a myth described by the name of william stewart and represented as having belonged to the ninth minnesota infantry as to the real case of chickamauga it has been described by at least twenty witnesses and in as many different versions these versions range all the way from one or two highly colored descriptions in which i am made to shoot him with my own hand down to one in which i am shown not to have been present at all the truth in this matter is to be found as usual midway between the two points one witness whom for his own sake i will not name inasmuch as his statements must have been and were i believe recognized by every one who heard them as undeserving of the slightest belief describes him part six page three ninety nine as a kind of weakly man who when i entered the stockade one day wormed around me saying that he wanted to go out to get air whereupon captain wirtz wheeled again pulled out a revolver and shot him down another witness who i believed meant to tell the truth testifies part seven page four fifty seven he chickamauga was asking the sentinel to take him outside of the prison as he had enemies in the camp he said his leg was not healed and that he had enemies in camp who clubbed him captain wirtz never answered him but said to the sentinel shoot the one-legged yankee devil the sentinel shot and the ball struck him in the head and passed out the lower jaw this witness the court may recollect was one of those who from a circumstance that occurred about that time was not cross-examined that may account for his statement not being corrected by himself another witness gives this version of it part fourteen page eight eight two captain wirtz was in the stockade and this man went up to him and wanted him to take him outside captain wirtz would not do it and finally this cripple went over the dead line and said that he would rather be shot than to stay there and begged the guard to shoot him the guard would not shoot him and captain wirtz went outside the stockade there was a large crowd inside the stockade pretty soon i heard captain wirtz halloo to the sentry on the post i heard him tell him if the man did not go back over the dead line the guard was to shoot him the guard told the man to go back he did not and was shot this witness testified on his cross-examination that chickamauga had been inside the dead line fifteen or twenty minutes that the sentry wanted him to go back over the dead line saying that he did not want to shoot him that there were from a hundred and fifty to two hundred federal prisoners near the dead line that they did not try to persuade him to return from inside the dead line that page eight nine two they stood there and looked at the man no one said anything a still different version of this transaction is given in a more laconic and reckless style by another witness page nine thirty six i will quote it question did you ever see captain wirtz shoot any man answer yes question when answer about the first of april i think shortly after he took command there question state the circumstances of the shooting answer captain wirtz was coming in the south gate one day a sick man as i took him to be a lame man asked captain wirtz something and captain wirtz turned round and shot him there is but one of all the witnesses who testifies on this point whose testimony was absolutely correct he stated that being out on parole he noticed one evening an excitement down at the gate that he started to see what was the matter that down near the gate he met captain wirtz riding back from the stockade to his quarters that he asked the captain what the fuss was about that the captain told him it was that chickamauga fella who was jawing with the sentry and insisting on going into the line that after captain wirtz had parted from him he heard the report of a musket and on arriving at the gate he found that chickamauga had been shot will the court permit me to make a statement which may serve to explain all these conflicting accounts of the death of poor chickamauga 
on the evening in question the sergeant or the officer of the guard came to my quarters and stated that there was a man within the dead line jawing with the sentry and refusing to go outside and that there was a crowd of prisoners around him and a good deal of disturbance i rode my horse down to the stockade dismounted outside and went in there i found things as they had been described to me i went up to chickamauga and asked him in a rough tone of voice what the hell he was doing there he said he wanted to be killed i took my revolver in my hand and said in a menacing manner that if that was all he wanted i would accommodate him i scared him somewhat and he was taken outside by some of the prisoners i then in his presence and solely as a menace told the sentry to shoot him if he came in again i little thought that he would come back or that his comrades would permit him after their hearing the order to go once more across the forbidden line i left the stockade remounted my horse and was on my way back to my quarters when i heard the report of a musket i hastened back and ran up to the sentry box from which the shot had been fired there is the simple history of the case without any reserve or misrepresentation the court i am sure will recognize all the marks and evidences of truth in it it is consistent with itself and consistent with the average line of the testimony it also explains many statements of witnesses that have probably been made by them under the impression of their truth but which were absolutely untrue for instance the two men who swore they saw me shoot the prisoner with my own hand were probably led to make that statement from having seen me draw my revolver in the manner i have described the witness who swore that i was within the stockade and gave the order to fire when the man was shot had seen me there and may have witnessed what passed their mistake being in making me present when the shot was fired and other witnesses who swore that i gave the order from outside the stockade had supposed that that was so but this instance will suffice to show how very carefully the court should deal with all the evidence produced against me i might take the ground that the witnesses for the prosecution so contradicted each other and gave such totally opposite versions of the same transactions that i could not properly be called upon to refute them they refute each other i am sure the judge advocate would have been inexplicably puzzled to select which version he would adopt but i have thought it better in this and in every other matter charged against me to give a truthful honest account of it i pray the court to believe me and to give me whatever consideration that truthfulness should entitle me to there can be no doubt that the unfortunate man whose name appears to be unknown and whose only appellation in this court is derived from the name of the famous field of battle where he lost his leg was shot in consequence of a violation of a rule of prison discipline not an unnecessarily harsh rule nor an unusual one because at andersonville it was absolutely indispensable to the security of the prison and because the same rule was enforced at macon florence salisbury bell island and the other principal prisons of the southern confederacy and i presume though i do not assert in the military prisons of the united states this court will know better than i whether the presumption is a correct one i have certainly heard of cases occurring in the very prison wherein i am now confined of prisoners having been shot for similar violations of prison discipline the court cannot but be aware of the fact that such rules are not unusual even in other than military prisons and it may remember the incident which occurred some years since in france where an american citizen was shot at the debtors prison of vichy for standing at a window against the rules and that too even without warning from the sentry it is important to me also that the court will take cognizance of the fact that the rules of the prison at andersonville were printed and posted on conspicuous places all through the stockade that the internal police of the stockade was exclusively in the hands of federal prisoners and that the squads of ninety men into which the occupants of the stockade were divided were officered by federal soldiers 
is it therefore within the range of probability that there was a single prisoner within the stockade who did not know the penalty of encroaching on the deadline if there was not and if the rule was violated and the penalty inflicted on whom does the responsibility rest certainly not on me if there was and if soldiers ignorant of the rule and violating it were shot who was responsible again i say certainly not i while on this subject although it diverts me a little from the direct line of argument which i had intended to pursue i suppose i had better dispose of all these cases connected with the violation of this rule it is impossible for me to say what number of prisoners shot upon the deadline might not be counted up from the evidence for the prosecution if each case sworn to by each witness is regarded as a distinct and separate case and the difficulty is that there is no key to the arithmetical problem furnished by the prosecution the judge advocate did not in the course of the trial or at its close intimate how he proposed to solve it am i to be called upon to defend myself in regard to one two three ten twenty or a hundred such cases really gentlemen i do not know is the court any wiser is the judge advocate i can do nothing more than dismiss with these remarks the whole of this class of cases End of part one part three of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part three statement of prisoner henry wirtz in answer to charges part two and now i return to the second and only other charge of murder that i can be expected to meet and refute it differs from the case of the unfortunate chickamauga in this that the alleged victim had the good fortune never to have been within view of the andersonville stockade william stewart of the ninth minnesota infantry is as much a creation of the fertile imagination of the witness who testified to his murder by me as the conspiracy charged against me is a creation of the fancy of the judge advocate he sprang from the prolific brain of that witness a soldier of the republic although unhappily situated as minerva is said to have sprung full armed from the brain of jove the judge advocate will not i venture to say find on any of the books of the andersonville prison the entry of that name and regiment it will not be found in the hospital record on the death register there has not been produced here a witness who knew either of his life or death and who could tell us aught of either but george w gray knew him and tells of him and here is the story that he tells part thirty nine page twenty seven hundred question do you know anything about the prisoner having shot a prisoner of war there at any time answer he shot a young fellow named william stewart a private belonging to the ninth minnesota infantry he and i went out of the stockade with a dead body and after laying the dead body in the dead house captain wirtz rode up to us and asked us by what authority we were out there or what we were doing there stewart said we were there by proper authority wirtz said no more but drew a revolver and shot the man after he was killed the guards took from his body about twenty dollars or thirty dollars and wirtz took the money from the guard and rode off telling the guard to take me to prison question were you at the time attempting to make your escape answer no sir but it was my intention if i could to do so i was not attempting it at that time nor was stuart on cross-examination part forty page twenty seven twenty eight he says i think captain wirtz made some remark like this damn you you talk that way to me do you i think that was what he said but i am not positive question and captain wirtz shot stuart simply because he said that you were out by proper authority answer whether he shot him because he said that to him or because he was a yankee i do not know i leave that to himself but that was all stuart said to him 
i was talking to the guard i acknowledged that i was trying to bribe that fellow trying to get away question how many persons were present at that time answer i did not count them i know that there were two came up after the man was killed i think that was all who came near question what day did that happen answer it was just as much as i could do to keep the month let alone the day i do not know the day it was in september i would not be certain what part of the month by the court question what kind of a horse did the prisoner ride page twenty seven twenty eight answer he was riding a sorrel horse i think i am sure it was a sorrel it is a somewhat singular circumstance that the only two witnesses who describe me as riding any other horse than the grey old mare are precisely the two whose general testimony is entitled to the least possible degree of credit they are the witness who originated the murder of william stewart of the ninth minnesota infantry and the one who saw the assassination of chickamauga by my own hand is this accident or does it go to show that these two men had put their heads together and concocted their stories the spectator and narrator of my murderous attack on chickamauga is the individual who told the very credible story of having had his arms and money taken from him on his arrival at andersonville he having been then in the hands of confederate soldiers for over a week as if he could have retained his arms and a hundred and fifty dollars in coin besides a hundred and thirty dollars in greenbacks for an hour after his capture who accounts for the gold by saying that he got it under the root of a tree in the woods near jackson mississippi having been piloted to the spot by the most unselfish darkey that ever existed and who makes that money be turned over by me to colonel gibbs who did not take command of the post for months afterwards should the court desire to refer to this veracious history it will be found in part six commencing at page three ninety eight in it the court will discover that i rode a kind of roan horse with dark mane and tail and that the author of that veracious history saw me ride him a hundred times whereas if there is any fact in the whole case as fully established as the existence of a prison at andersonville it is the fact as the court will recognize that i invariably rode an old grey mare if the man who originated the romance of william stewart had not been too voluble and too anxious to ensure to me a felon's doom if he had been satisfied with one dramatic production he might have secured his object and saved his reputation but like vaulting ambition he overreached himself and fell with much injury to himself on the other side he was as original as the author of the treasure trove discovered in the woods near jackson he first page twenty six ninety six makes me an inmate of the sutler's shanty and makes me demand a dollar from his friend underwood for a piece of an old shirt which the extortionate fechner was giving him for charity's sake and when underwood handed over to me a ten dollar bill and requests his change this imaginative genius makes me kick him out of the door i will not insult the intelligence of the court by criticizing that story further on at twenty seven o three he gets off another piece of romance which must have astonished even the witnesses from andersonville albeit accustomed to hear and believe wonderful things about me and which i will give in his own words there came an order to parole all the sick soldiers there they were to be removed from that prison and all the prisoners were to be brought to the gate it being late in the afternoon and the roads being very muddy i requested captain wirtz to permit us to aid these men in getting to the cars his reply was that when we were needed he would call upon us he said to lieutenant davis if any of the men refuse to go or if they lie down on the road on their way to the cars bayonet them i have seen many poor soldiers bayoneted there by the guards when they were crawling on their hands and knees to the cars must it not have occurred to the court either that all the hundred and more witnesses for the government were remarkably stupid not to have made some allusion however slight to the bayonetting business 
or else that sergeant george w gray of the seventh indiana cavalry is gifted with miraculous powers of vision on the principle that optics good have they i ween who see what is not to be seen but that is not all his powers of sight are only equalled by his powers of hearing for he declares page twenty seven o three that he heard me say to one of the surgeons who asked me when i was going to remove these yankees damn those yankees they will all be dead in a few days anyhow i must not omit to mention as an additional proof of his invention or of his optical powers that he saw a man page twenty seven o four who had his cheek torn off by bloodhounds and his arms and hands and legs gnawed up so that the man only lived some twenty-four hours after he came into the stockade as this dog story rests solely on the evidence of the author of the william stewart romance and of the bayonetting incident and of the anecdote in regard to my prophecy that the yankees would all be dead in a few days anyhow and of the metamorphosis of the old grey mare into a sorrel horse i presume the court will not expect me to criticise it when i come to that part of the case before closing with this remarkable witness let me remind the court of his farewell speech before leaving the witness stand in which not satisfied with all he had sworn he summed up all in one burst of indignant eloquence as follows i have seen men falling and dying in every direction at the prison gate there is a graveyard close at hand where i can safely say that twelve thousand of our brave boys are buried in the georgia sands and from nothing else but sheer starvation they died from starvation and vaccination how much longer the record of this case would have grown if the president had not ruthlessly ordered the orator from the stand it is impossible to say if the judge advocate had never placed him there having had an opportunity to judge of him in his preliminary examination his exclusion would have been more creditable to the government though perhaps of some injury to my interests i thank the judge advocate for gray and for alcock the treasure trove man and for that other witness whose name i will not here mention because he holds the commission of an officer of the united states and who knows so little of what he was swearing to that he located the stocks within the prison enclosure and doggedly and immovably persisted in keeping them there after his attention being called to the fact that they never was so three instances of such witnesses on the side of the prosecution give a pretty clear indication of the difficulty of my defending myself against all those loose charges and specifications and the impossibility of my doing so with success unless i find in the members of the commission as i hope and trust to find fair and charitable judges who will take all the circumstances into consideration be guided more by the doctrine of probabilities than by positive statements and not assume as the judge advocate did on one occasion that because the witnesses for the prosecution were mostly soldiers of the united states a doubt of their veracity was a stigma on the service i think i can say no more on the subject of chickamauga or william stewart they are the only two murder charges in the testimony that can possibly be reached either by evidence or argument detached and utterly unconnected declarations of this or that witness that some time in the spring or in the summer or in the fall of eighteen sixty four they saw me near a sentry who fired upon and killed some man whom they knew nothing about and could not designate make up all the medley of murder the court cannot reduce that chaos to order the judge advocate cannot i will not attempt it i claim therefore that so far as the charge of murder is concerned the prosecution has failed so signally that the judge advocate cannot with any show of reason or justice ask the court for a conviction i am arraigned under the general charge of murder specification eleven with having caused incited and urged certain ferocious and bloodthirsty animals called bloodhounds to pursue attack wound and tear in pieces a soldier belonging to the army of the united states whose name is unknown 
thereby causing the death of such prisoner the only dog story that i have been at all identified with in the testimony is that in which the man nicknamed frenchy was the chief actor and the whole of it amounts simply to this i will give it in narrative form but the court will find the elements of it scattered throughout the record frenchy was a little wiry active fellow whom bolts stocks and guards were alike powerless to prevent escaping he got away half a dozen times and was brought back generally by planters living within a circuit of twenty miles and owning hounds which they kept for the recapture of their slaves and with which escaped prisoners were almost sure to be tracked out at last i said to frenchy it is only a waste of material to put shackles upon you i will parole you i did so next day frenchy was gone again he returned voluntarily in the evening saying that he had been blackberrying i remarked that it was a nice way for a paroled man to work when he declared that he would do no work still i did not put him back into the stockade the next day he was gone again this time he deliberately broke his parole i was glad to get rid of him and took no measures to have him recaptured three or four days afterwards to my regret he was brought back by some planters at that time the chain gang was being formed by directions of the commandant of the post for the punishment of men who had broken their parole and i ordered frenchy to be sent to the provost marshal so that he might have a place in the chain gang the lieutenant of the guard was afterwards taking him down to the smith when frenchy again effected his escape by jumping into a thicket near the creek the matter was reported to me i had the dog sent for they soon came on his track he took to a tree one of the pursuing party not i fired a pistol close to him to induce him to come down he was not hit but he dropped or fell from the tree into a mud hole when the dogs rushed upon him i jumped on the dogs and drove them off the court will recollect the evidence as to both frenchy and myself being covered with mud that was the cause frenchy had his clothes barely torn and had some scratches but otherwise received no injury i neither sent him back again into the stockade nor placed him in stocks or chain gang i simply had him put in the guard tent and kept there till i had a chance of sending him to be exchanged i availed myself of the first opportunity his name was trado and the disposition thus made of him will be found in the prison record which is in the hands of the prosecution and is not accessible to me there are a few other dog stories in the testimony but none of them directly connecting myself with them this of frenchy's is the only one with which i am personally identified the fact that frenchy was not seriously hurt by the dogs has been testified to by guizetti part fifty three page fifty four thirteen and the fact of his being sent away to be exchanged is verified by other witnesses the man did not die and therefore i cannot be found guilty of his murder what other cases of the kind may be found scattered throughout the testimony are of that floating character that they cannot be in any way fixed and i certainly cannot be called upon to answer them as to any death of a prisoner in the stocks i believe the only tangible case is that of frenchy whom some witnesses causes to end his career in that manner if there is any other instance of the kind it too is of the stuff that dreams are made of i believe i have gone through all the specifications under the charge of murder and claim in all confidence that to find me guilty of any single one of them would be an outrage on common sense which i earnestly trust and believe this high court is incapable of committing these same and other allegations are mixed up i believe under the charge of conspiracy it puzzles me to understand the logic or reason of that thing but i suppose it is necessary to say something in regard to them the idea of keeping a pack of dogs for the tracking and recapturing of prisoners did not originate with me nor am i responsible for the odium or blame attaching to it on this point i can only cite the testimony of colonel james h fannin 
who commanded the first georgia reserves stationed at andersonville on page twenty nine twenty four part forty four he testifies as follows do you know anything about a man named turner answer sergeant turner the owner of the dogs belonged to the first regiment georgia reserves my regiment company k i do not know that i ever saw turner till an order came from general winder in june or july eighteen sixty four requiring this man turner to report to him in person i recollect sending for the man and his reporting to me i sent him over to general winder and he came back and reported to me that general winder had given him a furlough to go home i said that was something rather irregular i thought and i asked him on what business he had been ordered he said that the general had ordered him to go home and get a pack of negro dogs he had and bring them there in order to capture prisoners he was sent for his dogs and returned with them i think in the latter part of june or about the first or the middle of july so too lieutenant colonel persons part forty six page thirty seven o eight testifies could captain wirtz in any way give furloughs to the guards for shooting union prisoners answer no sir he could not question did you ever know or hear of one obtaining a furlough for shooting a union prisoner answer i never heard of it and i do not believe there was any i think i would have heard of it if any such thing had happened need i quote any more witnesses to confound that slanderous charge the court is aware that there is much more to the same effect in the record but i should suppose that would suffice it has been contradicted i am sure to the full satisfaction of the court and i will only quote the testimony of one or two witnesses on that point the same colonel fannin page twenty nine seventeen says question did a guard ever apply to you for a furlough on the ground that he had shot a union soldier or did you ever hear of such a thing while you were there answer i heard that such things were spoken of there but they were mere rumours and there was no truth in them i do not know that any application was made on that ground none ever was that i know of i heard it as camp rumour nothing more as to the stocks and other means of punishment resorted to at andersonville i am not aware that they are unusual or cruel the stocks and the ball and chain have been resorted to perhaps in every regiment in either service they were never used at andersonville except in flagrant cases and where the prisoner had deliberately broken his parole there has been a good deal of testimony taken in regard to granting furloughs to confederate soldiers as a reward for shooting union prisoners that is sworn to by many witnesses for the prosecution just as strongly as many other things alleged against me and there is just as much truth in it it was a mere idle absurd camp rumour there is a large amount of testimony in reference to depriving prisoners of their rations two witnesses samuel dand and jacob d brown have it that from the first to the fourth or from the second to the fifth of july no rations entered the stockade part seven page four sixty two to four seventy if this story were true how many prisoners reduced as they were would have survived it and yet that is but a fair example of the sort of testimony on which i am sought to be condemned there is just one-fourth of the story true the men did not get their rations on the fourth of july not however as a matter of punishment the cause was simply this that was the day when the conflict with the raiders occurred the commotion in the camp was so great that the quartermaster who was distributing the rations at the time had to leave the stockade some men had their rations distributed but comparatively few the rest had to do without theirs till the next day when both days provisions were supplied that is the whole story when simplified and denuded of those wondrous exaggerations which the judge advocate and his witnesses have woven into it any other stoppage of rations was but partial confined to a squad and for the reasons that have clearly been assigned and that is the whole story of starvation the amount and character of the provisions i have shown that i was not responsible for 
the prisoners as has been fully shown were allowed the same rations as confederate troops at posts and on light duty there is one circumstance not in evidence but which perhaps the judge advocate will admit bearing on the general question of my responsibility for rations and so forth captain r b winder quartermaster of the post at andersonville forwarded to the secretary of war in this city a communication which will be found in the war department stating that in regard to food shelter water burial of the dead and all other matters appertaining to the quartermaster's department at andersonville he alone was responsible up to the time that the matter of provisions was turned over to the commissary all the testimony in that respect whether oral or written of official or unofficial persons established that fact and the court's own knowledge of military routine must confirm it by what show of justice can the government endeavour to hold me responsible for all these things there is some testimony in regard to my violently assaulting prisoners and i believe one witness of the sergeant gray stripe has represented me as knocking down and stamping upon a prisoner with such violence as to cause his death the date is fixed as september but there is no name regiment or anything else to vindicate who that soldier was and therefore i am precluded from the possibility of direct contradiction but the indirect contradiction is perhaps equally positive the court has seen for itself the helpless inflamed condition of my right arm which was as bad then as it is now see dr roy's testimony part seventy page forty four sixty eight and the court knows that it would be utterly impossible for me to use that arm in any active manner much less commit violence of that nature with it my left arm is equally powerless the shoulder having been dislocated and in september i was only recovering from a long sickness that is the only contradiction that i can give to that and similar stories except indeed that general contradiction which i now approach and which applies to the whole range of evidence brought against me father whelan the catholic priest who visited andersonville that good pious simple-minded god-fearing and man-loving priest whose self-sacrificing labours there entitle him to the reverence of all who witnessed or may ever read of them testifies as follows part forty two page twenty eight seventy two while you were there did you ever hear or know of any personal violence of captain wirtz to any soldier answer no sir i never saw captain wirtz inflicting any personal violence on any prisoner neither did i hear of it during my stay there it is the highest probability that such a thing could not have occurred without my knowledge i mingled with the prisoners entirely i have been there for a fortnight perhaps without speaking to any but prisoners if anything of that nature had occurred it is highly probable that i should have heard it he afforded me every facility with regard to the prisoners he never showed any objection to giving me at any time a pass to go into the stockade or hospital he was always calm and kind to me his fellow clergyman father hamilton testifies as to the same point page twenty eight sixty nine it seemed to me that he was disposed to do everything in his power for their spiritual comfort and as far as i could see for their bodily comforts also colonel fannin testifies at page twenty nine thirty one that he never heard while at andersonville of my doing such a thing as killing or otherwise injuring a prisoner in any way lieutenant colonel persons part forty six page thirty eighty testifies as follows question did you ever know or hear of captain wirtz in any way shooting or beating with a pistol or kicking to death any prisoner while you were there answer no sir question did you ever know of his killing them in any way or brutally treating them answer no sir i never did if he had used any extraordinary violence it strikes me i would have heard of it question but you never did answer i never did these were all witnesses for the prosecution who were re-examined for the defence 
another witness for the prosecution robert h kellogg who was in the stockade from may to september acting as sergeant of a squad and who has since published a book on the subject testified on his direct examination in answer to the judge advocate that he never heard captain wirtz give any orders and never page three seventy saw him perpetrate any acts of cruelty on cross-examination he repeats this adding page three ninety one that he never heard captain wirtz order anything to be taken from a prisoner colonel d t chandler another important witness for the prosecution and whom i have quoted on other points visited andersonville in august eighteen sixty four as inspector general of the adjutant general's department at richmond he described how he went into the prison and examined matters for himself he says part twenty four page sixteen o nine i took the men aside and questioned them so that wirtz could not hear me as to any complaints they had to make and none of them made any complaints against him the complaints were mostly of insufficient food of want of shelter and want of clothing no complaints were made about him to me the report which colonel chandler made to his government and which is in evidence in this case on the part of the prosecution exhibit nineteen speaks as the court will recollect in most favourable terms of me while recommending the relieving the commander of the post on account of the exhibition of the very qualities which are now imputed to me i quote from his report part twenty three page fifteen forty three captain henry wirtz in immediate command of the prison is entitled to commendation for his untiring energy and devotion to the discharge of the multifarious duties of his position for which he is pre-eminently qualified i respectfully concur in the recommendation which has been forwarded by general winder for his promotion i put it to the court whether if there was any truth in the stories of cruelty heartlessness and oppression of which i have been the subject an officer of the keenness intelligence and breadth of views of colonel chandler would not have discovered in his week's close inspection of all pertaining to the prison at andersonville that i was an improper person to occupy the position that i filled and whether instead of recommending my promotion he would not have recommended my instant removal cruelty to and neglect of prisoners were no passport to colonel chandler's good opinion for on those very grounds he urged and pressed upon the war department at richmond the removal of my superior officer and who can believe that if one hundredth part of what is here charged against me were true none of the prisoners within the stockade none of the paroled men outside none of the officers attached to the post would have whispered in his ear that i was cold heartless cruel why gentlemen he could not have passed an hour there without learning of it the very stones would have cried out against me i claim therefore that if there were nothing in this case in my favour except the testimony of sergeant-major kellogg colonel persons colonel fannin colonel chandler father hamilton all witnesses for the prosecution and father wheelan for the defence that alone ought to outweigh the medley mass of incongruous and self-contradictory statements put in by the government even if it reached ten times its present volume if there was truth in it then the testimony of those honourable gentlemen whom i have named could not possibly be true but if their statements are reliable and the judge advocate can certainly not call them in question then the whole prosecution must inevitably fail i put it to the good sense the judgment the justice of this court as to which side the testimony is in favour of only adding that besides the paragraphs i have quoted every respectable and reliable witness either for the government or for myself who was in a position to know anything about the everyday history of andersonville has stated before this court in the most positive and unequivocal terms that all the stories about my cruelty were entirely new to them when they came to washington and had never reached their ears before 
is not this utterly inconsistent with the truth of the wondrous stories told by those witnesses who represent me in their own imaginations and to a too credulous public as the incarnation of all that is monstrous and cruel in this connection i will allude in passing to that incident testified to by several of my witnesses viz my collecting and taking out of the stockade all the little boys who were in it in order that the poor little fellows might in the enjoyment of purer air and healthful exercise have a better chance of being restored to their yearning mothers and sisters at home did that in me indicate a totally depraved condition is it consistent with the picture drawn of me by the prosecution no gentlemen the fabulous words of this case should be like ambition made of sterner stuff my services in seeing to the proper distribution of father whelan's supply of flour to the patients in hospital my politeness to miss rawson who came with her fortnight's supply to one poor federal soldier my bearing towards the ladies of americus and toward the methodist minister rev e b duncan who came there twice to preach the gospel are all irreconcilable with the picture drawn of me as to the vaccination matter i might as well be held accountable for an unskilful amputation an improper dose of medicine or anything else of that sort the testimony of the prisoner who was put in the stocks by my order in connection with that subject is true to this extent that the medical officer of the day reported to me the man's refusal to be vaccinated and when i spoke to him on the subject he replied in an insolent and offensive manner the putting him in the stocks was not a coercive but a punitive measure is it necessary to plead before this court the absolute necessity of maintaining strict discipline as to the whipping of prisoners of war there are in the evidence two undisputed cases of the kind one that of an italian named bardo another that of a colored man named hawkins bardo himself was produced before you and testified part fifty three page thirty four sixty that he was whipped because he had disguised himself as a negro but that the order to whip him was given not by me for he knew the old dutch captain but by a lieutenant who wore a black feather in his hat the whipping of hawkins was in punishment for an outrageous assault upon a respectable white woman in the neighbourhood and for forging my name to a pass there is enough of evidence in the case although some was excluded to establish these facts any other whipping of negroes that may have taken place was in the quartermaster's department they were made to work not being regarded by the confederate government whose officer and servant i was in the light of prisoners of war as to my profane expressions wherein i am represented as comparing my services to the confederate government with those of generals or regiments at the front these too are gross exaggerations the only remarks of that character were to the effect that i had a larger command than any general in the field the court can see how easily this natural remark could have been tortured as it was into one implying devilish purposes the remark at the graveyard as to the yankees receiving the land they came to fight for was actually made but not by me there were other officers present and one of them was the utterer of it the insulting language attributed to me by the witness spencer never was uttered in fact he makes the conversation take place in the presence of two officers who had left andersonville months before just as in his story about negotiations for land he puts in the mouth of w w turner language in regard to his earning money enough in the hunting of escaped prisoners to pay for the land never for a moment supposing that his turner was a totally distinct person from the owner of the hounds and now i have gone over as much of this case as it is within my power to do i have not purposely avoided any subject properly in the case if i have overlooked any i pray the court not to impute it to my inability to dispose of it favourably to myself i hope that as it is i have not wearied the court i have sought to compress my statement into the smallest possible compass 
perhaps i might here end what i have written a few paragraphs more and i will do so there is one consideration in the case which perhaps may not have escaped the impartial attention of this commission placed as i am represented by the government to have been in a position where i had unlimited powers i never used those powers for the purpose of my own aggrandizement there is not even an insinuation i believe that i ever robbed a federal soldier there of anything that belonged to him the property taken from the prisoners who belonged to raiding parties and none was taken from any other was turned over invariably to the quartermaster the case of exchange of bad pork for good beef was a trifling and innocent matter that has been grossly magnified i had had some hogs slaughtered and fearing that all of the meat might not keep i asked the commissary if he would exchange some fresh beef against it pound for pound if he found the pork good he consented to do so and the exchange was effected to the extent of just seventy pounds not an ounce of that pork was ever furnished inside the stockade it was so good that the paroled men outside sought and obtained it with that simple exception the record shows that i never interfered with provisions there on the contrary there is much testimony to show that in several instances i regularly paid for the extra ration of paroled men i stand therefore as i humbly claim with my character for honesty and fair dealing spotless and unsullied if i was the tyrant and ruffian that i am represented to be and had everything my own way is it likely i would have made such an arrangement with paroled men and here i will close with one or two final remarks the court will observe that in this statement i have studiously avoided any deviation from the strict legitimate path of my defence i have not said a word to bring discredit upon any officer of the late confederate or of the federal government i have not attempted to complicate the case with any allusions as to where the responsibility rested for non-exchange of prisoners of war closely connected as that question is with the general subject it has nothing to do with the subject of my guilt or innocence if i were rash or imprudent enough to touch that question it might be imputed to me as an acknowledgment of the weakness of my case i want all the sympathy good feeling and confidence of this court too much to say or do anything that might give offence it is composed of brave honourable and enlightened officers who have the ability i am sure to distinguish the real from the fictitious in this case the honesty to rise above popular clamour and public misrepresentations and who have names and reputations to transmit to history and to leave unimpaired to their descendants i cannot believe that they will either darken their intellect or prostitute their independence for the sake of crushing out the last faint embers of a life that is just ebbing out i cannot believe that they will consent to let the present and future generations say of them that they stepped down from their high positions at the bidding of power or at the more reckless dictate of ignorant widespread prejudice to consign to a felon's doom a poor subaltern officer who in a different post sought to do his duty and did it the statement which i now close will probably survive me and you alike it will stand as a complete answer to all the mass of misrepresentation heaped upon me may god so direct and enlighten you in your deliberations that your reputation for impartiality and justice may be upheld my character vindicated and the few days of my natural life spared to my helpless family h wirtz late captain a a g c s a washington october eighteen eighteen sixty five end of part two part four of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution 
by united states army staff judge advocate part four closing statement of judge advocate prosecutor part one argument of the judge advocate special military commission washington d c friday october twenty eighteen sixty five the court met pursuant to adjournment present all the members and the judge advocate the prisoner and his counsel were also present the proceedings of the last meeting were read and approved the judge advocate submitted the following argument may it please the court deeply sensible of the importance and solemnity with which you have clothed this trial and quickened as i know you are to a high sense of duty by the obligation you have taken to well and truly try and determine according to the evidence the matter now before you between the united states of america and the prisoner to be tried and to duly administer justice according to your conscience the best of your understanding and the custom of war no word of mine is needed to increase the impressiveness of this occasion in many of its aspects and bearings this trial presents features more startling more extraordinary and more momentous than are found in the whole annals of jurisprudence the charges and specifications here laid accuse this prisoner and other persons named and unnamed with having maliciously traitorously and in violation of the laws of war conspired to impair and injure the health and to destroy the lives by subjecting to torture and great suffering by confining in unhealthy and unwholesome quarters by exposing to the inclemency of winter and to the dews and burning sun of summer by compelling the use of impure water and by furnishing insufficient and unwholesome food of large numbers of soldiers in the military service of the united states held as prisoners of war at andersonville georgia by the so-called confederate states of america to the end that the armies of the united states might be weakened and impaired and the insurgents engaged in armed rebellion against the united states might be aided and comforted i invoke gentlemen your calm deliberation your most dispassionate and humane judgment while i endeavour to unfold the proofs of guilt in a field so broad presenting so many issues and involving so many persons it has been a question of grave thought with me how to present the argument in this case my desire being only to give to the court a perspicuous and faithful analysis of the testimony nothing extenuating and setting down naught in malice with this view i have thought it best to notice first such legal objections as have been made to the commission as a judicial tribunal and such other objections as may be deemed worthy of notice touching the manner in which the case has been tried second to present a truthful analysis of the testimony without regard to the responsibility of parties for the purpose of ascertaining as nearly as language can portray them the horrors of andersonville that we may be prepared to appreciate fully the fearful responsibility of those inculpated by the evidence third to examine charge first alleging conspiracy in this connection showing the extent of the conspiracy its purposes and the criminality of each of the conspirators and fourth to show the guilt of the prisoner at the bar under charge second alleging murder in violation of the laws of war jurisdiction of the court among the numerous special pleas filed by the counsel denying the right of the court to try the prisoner there is but one i believe which has not been abandoned this is the plea to the jurisdiction i can hardly suppose that any member of this commission entertains a doubt on this point yet i do not feel at liberty to pass unnoticed a question so seriously made and about which honest and loyal men differ if there be neither law safe precedent nor right upon which to base this proceeding then it is a serious assumption of power and alike dangerous to yourselves and the prisoner and one in the exercise of which the order of his excellency the president will not protect you 
while i have yet to read the adverse opinion of a single lawyer given outside the court-room who speaks from the standpoint of one who knows from the teachings of experience how strong has been and is still the necessity of checking and punishing crimes against the laws of war committed in rebellious districts during and in aid of rebellion against the government yet it must be conceded that there is a colour of reason in the argument and it is because with great persistency your right to proceed is denied that i shall presume to address myself to this question as we recede from a state of actual war and approach a condition of profound peace we doubtless travel away from the cornerstone upon which the military commission as a judicial tribunal rests but that your right to try the case before you is disturbed by a mere suspension of hostilities on the part of the rebels in the field while the spirit of rebellion is still rampant i do not for a moment suppose and in a very brief resume of the argument on the subject i hope to make it so appear as i view this question of jurisdiction it is one of both law and fact to determine which each case must rest upon its own merits it involves a question of law in determining whether a court of this kind can be legally constituted and a question of fact as to whether the present case can be thus tried for a military court may be properly constituted yet the case brought before it not properly triable by it if this be true the subject may be disposed of in the examination of the following questions first has the president of the united states the constitutional power to convene a military commission for the trial of military offences committed in time of war second is this case triable by military i believe it is not claimed by any that the power assumed by the president in convening this commission for the purpose named in the order dwells in him except in time of war and great public danger or during insurrection or rebellion your jurisdiction is a special one resting upon no written law but derived wholly from the war powers of the president and congress which are themselves of course derivable from the constitution if it can be shown to safely rest upon these you become invested not only with a right but a high duty to sustain it in obedience to the proper order of your commander-in-chief on an examination of the opinions expressed against the right claimed you will discover the whole argument to rest upon the negative declaration or prohibitory clauses of our fundamental law denying to congress the exercise of certain powers as for example no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury etc etc in all criminal prosecutions the accused shall enjoy the right of a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury etc articles five and six amendments to constitution the trial of all crimes except in cases of impeachment shall be by jury article two section second constitution whatever else may be brought into the argument these and kindred clauses are the real source of complaint whence a misguided loyalty a super technical judgment have found reason for withholding their approval of the measures adopted by the government through the military commissioner to aid in suppressing a rebellion for its overthrow and hence you are told gravely the act of the president is a usurpation of power this court without a legal existence your proceedings a nullity for a moment let us try and ascertain the purpose of those who frame the constitution and by fair interpretation arrive at the true meaning of that great chart of liberty alexander hamilton wrote at the time the constitution was being canvassed before the people for final adoption the circumstances that endanger the safety of nations are infinite and for this reason no constitutional shackles can wisely be imposed on the power to which the care of it is committed 
this is one of those truths which to a correct and unprejudiced mind carries its own evidence along with it and may be obscured but cannot be made plainer by argument or reasoning the means ought to be proportioned to the end the persons from whose agency the attainment of any end is expected ought to possess the means by which it is to be attained federalist number twenty three mr madison in speaking of the impossibility of anticipating the exigencies which might arise and the futility of legislating for what could not be anticipated at the same time insisting that the powers as granted to the president and congress are now ample for every emergency says it is vain to impose constitutional barriers to the impulse of self-preservation it is worse than in vain because it plants in the constitution itself necessary usurpations of power ibid number forty one many years later and after its adoption with such light flooded upon it as the great minds of those early days could shed mr adams in unequivocal phrase enunciated the same idea in speaking of the authority of congress in time of war he says all the powers incident to war are by necessary implication conferred upon the government of the united states there are then in the authority of congress and of the executive two classes of powers altogether different in their nature and often incompatible with each other the war power and the peace power the peace power is limited by regulations and restricted by provisions prescribed within the constitution itself the war power is limited only by the laws and usages of nations this power is tremendous it is strictly constitutional but it breaks down every barrier so anxiously erected for the protection of liberty of property and of life these are bold words uttered when civil war was not impending when a powerful rebellion to overthrow this great nation could hardly have been anticipated the opinion of a great mind and a pure patriot with judgment free from the tyranny of partisan clamour they come to us with all the force of law itself do you find difficulty in reconciling these constitutional incompatibilities your statute punishes assault and battery yet a law underlying the statute not expressed says you may resist force with force and this well-grounded rule will allow you to defend yourself even to the slaying of your antagonist necessity knows no law inadequate to its demands and self-preservation antedates all law who shall say that a government in whose perpetuation rest the hopes of the world a constitution broad enough and liberal enough to protect the rights of all over whom it reaches a people whose confidence in the perfection of their form of government four years of internecine war have not shaken who shall say that these are denied nature's first law no these lawgivers and wise men of olden and modern times spoke truly when they laid down the doctrine that the principle of self-preservation belongs to nations no less than to individuals and that it is not in the power of a nation to code away this right the supreme court of the united states has in numerous decisions declared that congress and the executive possess the right to do whatever the public safety may require to suppress rebellion or repel invasions for wheaton for twenty twelve wheaton one nineteen to one twenty eight eight crunch fifteen this opinion was entertained by the fathers of the constitution and is found embodied in congressional legislation as early as seventeen ninety two reiterated in seventeen ninety five and eighteen o seven which seem to have been statutes made to meet just such emergencies as this war brought upon us see statutes at large volume one pages two sixty four four twenty four volume two page four nineteen in twelve wheaton martin versus mott 
mr justice story in an opinion sustaining the constitutionality of these laws says the president is the exclusive judge of the exigency and his action must be conclusive of the exigency thus taking from the supreme court the right to impeach the president's judgment this same opinion is sustained in luther v borden seven howard forty two forty three i suppose it will not be denied that war changes the relations of all parties brought into antagonism as belligerents by it no one can attack me without forfeiting his right for redress if i injure him by proper resistance without resorting to the forms of law to make him keep the peace and no one can levy war upon our government without placing himself beyond the aegis of the constitution it must be remembered when objection is made to the exercise of this necessary power of the president that what might be a good plea for a loyal citizen who has committed a civil offence against the criminal statutes of the land is not a good plea for a traitor who is on trial for the commission of a military offence against the laws of war as we are endeavouring to determine whether the president can by right exercise the power to organize a court for the trial of military offences committed by those not in the military service it may not be necessary to pursue this line of argument further let me however place by antithesis some things expressly prohibited in the constitution but which it is generally conceded may be done in time of war the united states shall guarantee to every state a republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion constitution article four section four yet the whole power of the government has been concentrated in one grand invasion of the south for four years the right of the people to be secure in their persons houses papers etc against search and so forth shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath etc amendment constitution article four yet i suspect an action of trespass would not lie against the officer who broke open certain escritoires bringing to light the proofs of conspiracies entered into by leading rebels south and north to poison burn and assassinate no soldier in time of war shall be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner but in a manner to be prescribed by law amendment constitution article three yet it was hardly expected that our generals in an enemy's country could consult the statutes in such case made and provided the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed ibid article one yet the general or executive who would fearing to violate this right permit the knights of the golden circle or any other hostile combination to organize or menace the government could hardly defend himself before his country the freedom of speech shall not be abridged ibid article one yet who would hesitate to say that the inciter of treason by speech is no less a traitor than he who raises his hand against the government private property shall not be taken without just compensation ibid article five yet during the rebellion millions of dollars worth have been seized and used for military purposes without any process of law whatever and millions more have been libelled under the confiscation act of congress and converted to public use without just compensation who so bold as to deny the principle upon which this has been done article four section eleven constitution provides for the recapture of slaves escaping to free states and the supreme court of the united states has said also pledges the federal government to protect the rights thus secured to slave owners against and in violation of which rises like a pillar of fire the proclamation of freedom apotheosizing its author the crowning glory of his administration the highest proof that our cause is approved in the forum conscientiae how can there be such antagonisms in our magna charta how are these things defensible they are the incompatibilities of which mr madison speaks 
we see here the harmony at the same time the conflicts between the war powers and the peace powers of which mr adams speaks and there is presented in strong light the adaptation of means to ends which mr hamilton insists upon and above all that inherent power which spurns all barriers and grounds itself upon great first principles dwells always with the source of all power and is inseparable from it the people and declares as fearlessly as it battles that in times of war and great public danger laws and constitutions are silent if they stand in the way of the nation's life but it is said that congress may have the power to create military commissions yet as it has not done so or conferred that right upon the president it is therefore an unwarrantable assumption it seems to me that as the constitution expressly confers no power of this kind upon congress it matters little whether congress or the president exercise it and if one can do so with equal right can the other the whole question still rests upon necessity to meet which the neglect of one will not excuse the other still inquiring whether this can be done in any case let us recur a moment to opinions contemporaneous with the constitution we began our struggle for independence under the articles of confederation and it is well known that the colonies reserved all rights to themselves not expressly delegated to the confederacy then as now there were traitors whose crimes partaking of the nature of military offences were made punishable by military courts if you will examine the legislation of the country it will be found that from seventeen seventy five down to the present time authority has been conferred upon military courts to try civilians for the commission of certain offences see acts of congress seventh november seventeen seventy five seventeenth june seventeen seventy six twenty seventh february seventeen seventy eight twenty third april eighteen hundred tenth april eighteen o six thirteenth february eighteen sixty two seventeenth july eighteen sixty two congress conferred this jurisdiction on both courts martial and military commission until during this war however resorting to the court martial now it has been frequently decided by the supreme court that a court martial is a tribunal provided for in the rules and articles of war but with a jurisdiction limited to military persons as well as military offences so that it is as much a usurpation to try a civilian by court martial as before a military commission admitting this we find ourselves strongly fortified by those early enactments especially in the light of the decisions of the supreme court stuart v laird one cranch two ninety nine decides that a cotemporary exposition or construction of the constitution acquiesced in for a period of years fixes it beyond the reach of doubt and we are compelled to conclude that the power assumed grows out of a necessity of which congress or the president must judge at the time many things are proper to be done in time of peace which in time of war become high crimes no criminal code and no civil criminal tribunal can reach these they are incident to and grow out of a state of war every student of history whether or not he may have studied law understands this it is a timid loyalty a yielding to doubtful and hasty clamour that during this war questioned a practice sanctioned by all nations and begun on this continent cotemporary with the constitution but again a declaration of war institutes a code of laws for the government of the belligerents known as the laws of nations and this is true of an insurrection as well as of a foreign war so that we are to look more to the custom of nations than to our own constitution for guides we have enumerated some of our constitutional guarantees intended to protect all persons but it will hardly be pretended that rebels war traitors assassins in aid of rebellion banditti guerillas and spies could plead them or derive any immunity by them 
the true guide and the higher power is the law of war and the customs of civilized nations from a recent opinion of the present attorney-general given in support of the commission for the trial of the president's assassins taking this view i extract the following a military tribunal exists under and according to the constitution in time of war congress may prescribe how all such tribunals are to be constituted what shall be their jurisdiction and mode of procedure should congress fail to create such tribunals then under the constitution they must be constituted according to the laws and usages of civilized warfare and they may take cognizance of such offences as the laws of war permit that the laws of nations constitute a part of the laws of the land is established from the face of the constitution upon principle and by authority see also opinions of attorney-general volume one page twenty seven five wheaton one fifty three he then proceeds to show that an army has to deal with two classes of enemies one of which is the open active belligerent or soldier in uniform who observes the law of war the other is a violator of the laws of war and usages of civilized nations who when caught may be shot down as an enemy to the human race or tried by military courts and subjected to such punishment as the laws of war authorize here as before we see that the only safe rule is to place in the hands of the commander-in-chief of the army or his subordinates acting under proper orders full and exclusive discretion as to the means to be used to protect the existence of his army subject only to be held responsible for the abuse of the discretion so conferred and whether he resort to military commission court-martial drumhead court summary and instantaneous execution right reason and wise public policy must sustain him so long as he keeps within the code of civilized nations i do not think it necessary to notice the distinction made between material law and military law your guide being as i conceive it the law of nations rather than either i might remark however that military law is a part of the law of the land in times of peace and war but martial law is an incident of war and may or may not be declared i do not rest your right however to sit as a military commission upon the action of the president in this particular he may not have declared martial law to be in force still your existence be legal he may not have suspended the writ of habeas corpus still your jurisdiction be undisturbed to declare martial law is one act of war power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus another to order this court to try the prisoner before it another it is an error to suppose there must be an enemy menacing you pendente lite a declaration of war a suspension of trial by civil tribunal before you can proceed the civil courts may be in never so complete operation the enemy in a remote part of the country and the place of trial in the midst of a peaceful portion of the land still if there be a necessity and the offence be properly punishable by the laws of war the duty at once falls upon the proper officer to meet that necessity as the public safety may require i believe this view to be sustained by the best military writers and a legitimate sequence of the argument in support of military commissions the practice of european powers confirms this opinion the right having never been seriously questioned but its abuse being provided for by bills of indemnity if further precedent be required it is amply presented in the action of president washington during the whiskey insurrection of seventeen ninety four and seventeen ninety five of president jefferson during the burr conspiracy of eighteen o six of general jackson in eighteen fourteen at new orleans and afterwards in florida in all of which cases though of infinitely less moment compared with the exigencies growing out of the present war it was enunciated that whatever the existing necessity demands must be done see halleck's international law page three seventy one three eighty and cases cited 
second having presented sufficient reasons for concluding that the president has usurped no authority and violated no laws in constituting you a military court for the trial of military offences it remains to notice whether the present case comes within the scope of your jurisdiction here i think we will have less difficulty as it is more a question of fact than law this prisoner is charged with the perpetration of offences many of them unknown to common law or statute law they were committed by a belligerent in his own territory in the exercise of a commission assigned him by the enemy and in the execution of the orders of his superiors given in violation of the laws of war the government he served never did and never can try him no civil tribunal is possessed of power the duty then as i think devolves upon you but it is said the war is over there is no longer any necessity for military tribunals and however proper in times of war and public danger to assume the functions of civil courts there is now no reason for doing so if it were necessary i would traverse the fact the war is not over true the muskets of treason are stacked the armies of the rebellion are dissolved some of the leaders are in exile others are in prison but by far the largest portion sullen silent vengeful stand ready to seize every opportunity to divide the loyal sentiment of the country and with spirit unbroken and defiant would this day raise the standard of rebellion if they dared hope for success this opinion of the war still existing is not mine alone the attorney-general in his return to judge wiley's writ of habeas corpus issued for the surrender of the body of mrs surratt spoke of it in that sense congress in many of its enactments provided for a state of war after a cessation of hostilities the whole policy of the government towards the southern states sustains this idea the president by suspending judge wiley's writ in the birch case on the sixteenth of september since this trial began his adherence to president lincoln's proclamation of martial law and his declining to take any action that might be construed into a proclamation of peace all show beyond doubt that the time of public danger has not passed but however this may be with the fact you have nothing to do the president by constituting you a court to try this prisoner has by that act alone declared the presence of a public danger and that a necessity exists to still cling to military tribunals for the punishment of military offences and it is beyond your power to dispute his judgment you may perhaps pass upon the question as to whether you are a court but as to the emergency requiring you to try and punish this prisoner if guilty the president is the sole judge the supreme court has so decided as we have before seen i hope then gentlemen you may find it not against your consciences or judgment to proceed to a final verdict in this case and that you may illustrate the wisdom expressed in the judicial opinion of one of our most eminent jurists given in four wheaton three sixteen the government of the union is a government of the people it emanates from them its powers are granted by them and are to be exercised for their benefit and the government which has a right to do and act and has imposed upon it the duty of performing the act must according to the dictates of reason be allowed to select the means having thus disposed of the question of jurisdiction i ask indulgence a moment to notice some of the objections which have been made by the counsel for the prisoner in the progress of the trial i am not prepared to believe that this court would stultify itself by declaring that their action after argument pro and con as to the admissibility of evidence overruling of motions of pleas or sustaining the same was wrong and that they now desire to correct it however as the conduct of the case has been somewhat criticised and as the counsel who declined to argue the defence intimated that a large part of the address would have been directed to those objections and has asked that they be not wholly overlooked i think it is not entirely out of place 
to review at this time very briefly the points of objection it has been frequently asserted in court by counsel that the whole power of the government was concentrated upon the prosecution of this prisoner and that he single-handed and without the aid of the government has been conducting the defence it is well known that witnesses for the defence receive a per diem and their actual expenses in coming to the court and returning to their homes the records of this court will show that every subpoena asked for has been given except in the cases of a few rebel functionaries who for reasons stated at the time were not subpoenaed of this however there should be no complaint as the facts which those witnesses were expected to establish were shown by other witnesses and as a proposition was made by the judge's advocate to admit that those witnesses thus excluded would testify here to the same facts a proposition which was declined by the counsel the records of this court will also show that there have been one hundred and six witnesses subpoenaed for the defence of whom sixty-eight reported of these thirty-nine many of them soldiers of our army and sufferers at andersonville were discharged without being put upon the stand the counsel for reasons known only to himself declining to call them besides this the government has without a precedent furnished at great expense to the prisoner a copy of the record from day to day during the progress of the trial the government has also given his counsel the benefit of its clerical force and in short shown the prisoner indulgences which should forever close the mouth of one whose treatment of its soldiers was in such striking contrast that he must have felt the more deeply his guilt again it has been frequently complained of during the trial that the court has excluded the declarations of the prisoner made in his own behalf and has refused to allow him in other instances to show what he did i think the court will remember that in every case the whole of any particular transaction has been given for and against the prisoner and that the res geste properly so called has never been excluded all the prison records in possession of the government which could throw any light upon this case are in evidence the prisoner has been allowed to show acts of kindness wherever they could with any legal propriety be given as for instance the taking of drummer boys out of the stockade because of their youth the allowing miss rawson to administer to the wants of one soldier the giving of passes to ministers of the gospel to enter the stockade his letters and reports with reference to the wants of the prison his kindness to the prisoners whom he detailed for duty outside the stockade and many other things all of which we shall show hereafter are not incompatible with the idea of his guilt but even admitting more than is claimed or proved for the prisoner in regard to his urging winder and the rebel authorities to do certain things the law is clear that if a party remain in a conspiracy though protesting against it and seeking to escape from it or if he continue in an unlawful enterprise insisting that he does not mean to do harm yet if harm results or serious and criminal consequences follow he is nevertheless responsible if in the course of one year's pursuit of an illegal business a stupendous crime indeed the perpetrator could show less than this prisoner has shown in his favour he would not be entitled to the human name it would be strange indeed if this record of five thousand pages of thirty-eight days of weary laborious trial presented no wrong rulings no improper exclusion or admission of evidence in a greater or less degree pertinent to some issue made but i assert with all confidence and with honest belief that the interests of this prisoner have not been and cannot be affected injuriously by such action in any instance that can be named it must not be forgotten and to do this i call the special attention of the counsel and of the court that nowhere in this record can there be found the exclusion of a scintilla of evidence bearing on the defence 
to the charge of murder and to which this prisoner is more especially called to answer there is another fact to which i would also call the attention of the counsel and the court and it is this that if after a careful examination of the evidence there be found sufficient legal proof legally spread upon the record you must proceed with your finding without regard to any illegal evidence and not as the counsel would insist declare the whole vitiated this is sustained by reason and by law wherever it comes up to the true standard which after all is but the perfection of human reason the only instance in which appellate courts remand cases for new trial is where from the bill of exceptions presented they cannot determine whether the jury were or were not misled by the evidence improperly admitted but where they find that the errors complained of were not material or where the verdict is sustained after disregarding the errors no courts will subject the parties to a second trial or interpose to save the complainant out of place as this may be in the order of my argument i have deemed it just to say this much sufferings at andersonville we come now to notice the evidence spread upon the record with regard to the sufferings of union prisoners at andersonville end of part one part four of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part four closing statement of judge advocate prosecutor part two character of testimony it is argued that the evidence presenting the horrors of andersonville is not of that class which is entirely reliable that those who were in the rebellion have been brought here forcibly by the government and made to testify in anticipation of reward by pardon or through fear of being themselves punished and that the evidence of soldiers who were sufferers at andersonville was highly colored testifying as they did under the sense of the injuries inflicted upon them while prisoners and warmed to enthusiasm in the enumeration of their wrongs i need say only in reply that the careful observer of this trial must have discovered how utterly powerless has been the language of witnesses to describe the condition of affairs at andersonville that where science has spoken through her devotees where inspectors have tried to convey a correct idea where the artist has sought to delineate or the photographer to call the elements to witness they have all uniformly declared that with all these appliances nothing has presented in their true light the horrors of that place the evidence before you is of the highest character it consists of many kinds from many directions from persons speaking in the interest and for the good of the rebel government from persons under a strong sense of the wrongs done those miserable wretches from disinterested observers neither in the one nor the other army and from the injured themselves and yet there is a most striking concurrence in all this testimony all agreeing that history has never presented a scene of such gigantic human suffering if i can succeed in presenting to your minds a faithful picture of andersonville as it was or make such an analysis and grouping of the testimony as to show to the civilized world a tithe of its horrors the suffering endured i shall have accomplished all i can hope and shall have done more than i fear i am able to do the stockade the stockade at andersonville was originally built as we learn from many sources with a capacity of ten thousand its area being about eighteen acres it continued without enlargement until the month of june eighteen sixty four when it was increased about one-third this area then as shown by actual survey being twenty-three and a half acres 
the prison is described by dr joseph jones a surgeon in the rebel army in his official report to the surgeon general consisted of a strong stockade in the form of a parallelogram twenty feet in height formed of strong pine logs firmly planted in the ground with two smaller surrounding stockades one sixteen and the other twelve feet high these latter being as he says intended for offence and defence if the inner stockade should at any time be forced by the prisoners the second forms another line of defence while in case of an attempt to deliver the prisoners by a force operating from the exterior the outer line forms an admirable protection to the confederate troops and a most formidable obstacle to cavalry or infantry record page forty three twenty eight manuscript page one seventy two to show more clearly the strength of this stockade i quote again from dr jones report the four angles of the outer line are strengthened by earthworks upon commanding eminences from which the cannon in case of an outbreak among the prisoners may sweep the entire enclosure record pages twenty three twenty eight and twenty three twenty nine manuscript page seventeen twenty one on the outside of the inner stockade were erected thirty-five sentry boxes or watch-towers overlooking the area within and so constructed as to protect the sentries from the sun and rain from colonel chandler's inspection report dated august five eighteen sixty five i quote the following a railing around the inside of the stockade and about twenty feet from it constitutes the dead-line beyond which prisoners are not allowed to pass a small stream passes from west to east through the enclosure about a hundred and fifty yards from its southern limit and furnishes the only water for washing accessible to the prisoners bordering this stream about three-quarters of an acre in the centre of the enclosure are so marshy as to be at present unfit for occupation reducing the available present area to about twenty-three and a half acres which gives somewhat less than six square feet to each prisoner and he remarks even this is being constantly reduced by additions to this number from the beginning to the close the only shelter in the prison was such as the ingenuity of the prisoners could devise all the standing timber and undergrowth having been cut away and with the exception of a small shed covered but not enclosed stretching across a portion of the north end of the stockade nothing whatever existed to protect the prisoners from the inclemency of the weather or the intolerable heat of that climate the prison was entered by two gates called the north and south gates the first situated a short distance north of the bakery the other a short distance from the southwest corner and on the west side the cookhouse immediately above the stockade and on the stream passing through it was situated an immense cookhouse at which all the rations provided for the prisoners if cooked at all were prepared the drainage and offal of this bakery passed immediately into the stream running through the prison still above and on the same stream were located at distances varying from five hundred yards to half a mile several rebel encampments these washed into the stream and their sinks were located on it the hospital the hospital which was erected some time in june eighteen sixty four prior to which the sick were treated under the shed already referred to inside the stockade was a stockade enclosure similar to the prison situated on the south side of the prison about four hundred yards from the southeast corner and containing five and a half acres a stream of water passing through its southeast corner emptied itself into the stream crossing the stockade a few yards from the east side of the stockade within this enclosure were erected four hospital buildings long sheds constructed of poles with roofs made of pine boughs and in some instances of planks without any siding or other protection in some cases wall and fly tents much worn and in very bad condition were used 
this constituted the shelter furnished the sick the dead house the dead house was a building similar to one of the hospital sheds except that it was partially enclosed by boards and puncheons nailed on its sides to this the dead were conveyed upon litters blankets stretchers and by such other means as the prisoners could devise and were conveyed thence in army wagons about twenty-five in each load piled up like cordwood or as a western farmer hauls his rails as one of the witnesses told you to the burying ground which was situated a few hundred yards northwest of the stockade condition of the stockade having thus given an outline of the stockade the hospital and their surroundings let us inquire into the condition of each of these places taking first the stockade it will be remembered that the testimony is drawn from many sources i present first the opinions of medical officers in the service of the rebel government on duty at andersonville and elsewhere at the time these sufferings were alleged to have been endured second the opinions of rebel officers assigned to the special duty of investigating the condition of affairs at andersonville together with the records of the prison third the opinions of officers and soldiers of the rebel army on duty at andersonville fourth the observations of persons residing in the vicinity during this period and who paid frequent visits to andersonville and fifth the testimony of prisoners themselves i shall endeavour to present the subject in the order above mentioned testimony of medical officers among the earlier official inspections given this prison was that of surgeon e j eldridge who made a report pursuant to instructions of major-general howell cobb and which accompanied the report of that general made upon the same subject to the adjutant-general of the rebel government for the information of the war department and which reached that department may twenty one eighteen sixty four see exhibit fifteen a he says i found the prisoners in my opinion too much crowded for the promotion or continuance of their health particularly during the approaching summer months the construction of properly arranged barracks would of course allow the same number of men to occupy the enclosure with material advantage to their comfort and health at present their shelter consists of such as they can make of the boughs of trees and poles covered with dirt the few tents they have are occupied as a hospital i found the condition of a large number of the bell island prisoners on their arrival to be such as to require more attention to their diet and cleanliness than the actual administration of medicine very many of them suffering from chronic diarrhoea combined with scorbutic disposition with extreme emaciation as a consequence the hospital being within the enclosure it has been found impractical to administer such diet and give them such attention as they require as unless constantly watched such diet as is prepared for them is stolen and eaten by the other prisoners he then proceeds to urge upon the authorities at richmond the necessity of removing the hospital on this point he says i consider the establishment of a hospital outside of the present enclosure as essential to the proper treatment of the sick and most urgently recommend its immediate construction and to meet an objection which he says was made at richmond to doing this because additional guards would be required he says nurses could be detailed with such discretion that but few would attempt to escape and with frequent roll-calls they would not be absent but a few hours before detected and would be readily caught by the dogs always at hand for that purpose up to this time no bakery for the prisoners existed their rations being issued to them raw as will appear from the following paragraph in the report the bakery just being completed will be a means of furnishing better prepared food particularly bread the half-cooked condition of which has doubtless contributed to the continuance of the bowel affections the mean strength of prisoners at the date of this report as shown by the journal kept by the prisoner was about fourteen thousand 
thus we see that the sufferings at andersonville were anticipated as early as may and the rebel government duly warned of that question however hereafter without pretending to analyze the evidence of each medical gentleman who has testified upon this subject as they all concur in the general facts in relation to the condition of the stockade i select the report of one of the most intelligent of their number quoting him somewhat fully the gentleman who speaks through the report i am about to give is dr joseph jones professor of chemistry in the medical college of georgia a graduate of the university of pennsylvania and a man of eminence in his profession he went to andersonville under the direction of the surgeon general of the confederacy pursuant to an order dated richmond virginia august sixth eighteen sixty four in which the surgeon general uses the following language the field of pathological investigation afforded by the large collection of federal prisoners in georgia is of great extent and importance and it is believed that results of value to the profession may be obtained by a careful investigation of the effects of disease upon the large body of men subjected to a decided change of climate and the circumstances peculiar to prison life record page forty three twenty five manuscript page seventeen twenty one from this will be seen there was authority from a high source for his proceedings certifying a knowledge of the condition of things at andersonville in the surgeon-general's office if it does not specially commend the humanity of that office after making some remarks in regard to the character of the soil the internal structure of the hills and so forth dr jones proceeds to give a table illustrating the mean strength of prisoners confined in the stockade from its organization february twenty four eighteen sixty four to september eighteen sixty four this computation i may remark is only approximately accurate and is arrived at by adding together the number of prisoners at the first the middle and the last of each month and dividing the result by three his table however shows the following as the mean result march seven thousand five hundred april ten thousand may fifteen thousand june twenty two thousand two hundred and ninety one july twenty nine thousand thirty august thirty two thousand eight hundred and ninety nine he says within the circumscribed area of the stockade the federal prisoners were compelled to perform all the offices of life cooking washing urinating defecation exercise and sleeping the federal prisoners were gathered from all parts of the confederate states east of the mississippi and crowded into the confined space until in the month of june the average number of square feet of ground to each prisoner was only thirty three point two or less than four square yards record page forty three thirty one these figures he says represent the condition of the stockade in a better light even than it really was for a considerable breadth of land along the stream flowing from west to east between the hills was low and boggy and was covered with excrement of men and thus rendered wholly uninhabitable and in fact useless for every purpose except that of defecation record page four thirty one and four thirty two it will be remembered that besides this swamp must be excluded the space between the dead line and the stockade which together with the bog must be excluded from the whole area colonel chandler in his official report makes a computation showing that the actual space allowed to each prisoner was only six square feet there being scarcely room for the prisoners all to lie down at the same time dr jones report continues with their characteristic industry and ingenuity the federals constructed for themselves small huts and caves and attempted to shield themselves from the rain and sun and night damps and dews but few tents were distributed to the prisoners and those were in most cases torn and rotten in the location and arrangement of these tents and huts no order appears to have been followed 
in fact regular streets appeared to be out of the question in so crowded an area especially too as large bodies of prisoners were from time to time added suddenly without any previous preparation the police and internal economy of the prison was left almost entirely in the hands of the prisoners themselves the duties of confederate soldiers acting as guards being limited to the occupation of the boxes or lookouts arranged around the stockade at regular intervals and to the manning of the batteries at the angles of the prisons record page four three three four and forty three thirty five again even judicial matters pertaining to themselves as the detection and punishment of such crimes as theft and murder appear to have been in a great measure abandoned to the prisoners a striking instance of this occurred in the month of july when the federal prisoners within the stockade tried condemned and hanged six of their own number who had been convicted of cheating and of robbing and murdering their fellow prisoners they were all hung upon the same day and thousands of the prisoners gathered around to witness the execution the confederate authorities are said not to have interfered with these proceedings in this collection of men from all parts of the world every phase of human character was represented the stronger preyed upon the weaker and even the sick who were unable to defend themselves were robbed of their scanty supplies of food and clothing dark stories were afloat of men both sick and well who were murdered at night strangled to death by their comrades for scant supplies of money and clothing i heard a sick and wounded federal prisoner accuse his nurse a fellow prisoner of the united states army of having stealthily during his sleep inoculated his wounded arm with gangrene that he might destroy his life and fall heir to his clothing the large number of men confined within the stockade soon under the defective system of police and with imperfect arrangements covered the surface of the low ground with excrements the sinks over the lower portion of the stream were imperfect in their plan and structure and excrements were in a large measure deposited so near the borders of the stream as not to be washed away or else accumulated upon the low boggy ground the volume of water was not sufficient to wash away the feces and they accumulated in such quantities in the lower portion of the stream as to form a mass of liquid excrement heavy rains caused the water of the stream to rise and as the arrangements for the passage of the increased amount of water out of the stockade were insufficient the liquid feces overflowed the low grounds and covered them several inches after the subsidence of the waters the action of the sun upon this putrefying mass of excrements and fragments of bread meat and bones excited most rapid fermentation and developed a horrible stench improvements were projected for the removal of the filth and for the prevention of its accumulation but they were only partially and imperfectly carried out as the feces of the prisoners were reduced by confinement want of exercise improper diet and by scurvy diarrhoea and dysentery they were unable to evacuate their bowels within the streams or along its banks and the excrements were deposited at the very door of their tents the vast majority appeared to lose all repulsion to filth and both sick and well disregarded all the laws of hygiene and personal cleanliness the accommodations for the sick were imperfect and insufficient record page forty three thirty three forty three thirty four forty three thirty five and forty three thirty six again he says each day the dead from the stockade were carried out by their fellow prisoners and deposited upon the ground under a bush arbor just outside of the southwestern gate from thence they were carried in carts to the burying ground one quarter of a mile northwest of the prison the dead were buried without coffins side by side in trenches four feet deep the low grounds bordering the streams were covered with human excrements and filth of all kinds which in many places appeared to be alive with working maggots an indescribably sickening stench arose from this fermenting mass of human dung and filth 
record page forty three thirty nine and again there were nearly five thousand seriously ill federals in the stockade and confederate states military prison hospital and the deaths exceeded one hundred per day and large numbers of the prisoners who were walking about and who had not been entered upon the sick report were suffering from severe and incurable diarrhoea dysentery and scurvy i visited two thousand sick within the stockade lying under some long sheds which they had built at the northern portion for themselves at this time only one medical officer was in attendance whereas at least twenty medical officers should have been employed record pages forty three forty and forty three forty one by comparing the two very interesting tables of statistics given in this connection by dr jones it will be observed that although the number of sick in the stockade was the same as that in the hospital while the number of surgeons in attendance in the stockade was greatly below that in the hospital the deaths occurring were about the same in each or in other words the prisoners died as rapidly with treatment as without it this is confirmed by the opinions of several surgeons among them doctors roy fluellen hard rice and others who have stated that medicine was of little use and that more could have been done by dieting again dr jones says scurvy diarrhoea dysentery and hospital gangrene were the prevailing diseases i was surprised to find but few cases of malaria fever and no well-marked cases of typhus fever the absence of the different forms of malarial fever may be accounted for in the supposition that the artificial atmosphere of the stockade crowded densely with human beings and loaded with animal exhalations was unfavourable to the existence and action of the malarial poison the absence of typhoid and typhus fevers among all the causes which are supposed to generate these diseases appeared to be due to the fact that the great majority of these prisoners had been in captivity in virginia at bell island and in other parts of the confederacy for months and even as long as two years and during this time they had been subjected to the same bad influences and those who had not had these fevers before either had them during their confinement in confederate prisons or else their systems from long exposure were proof against their action record page forty three forty three a most striking fact is here presented which illustrates perhaps in as strong a light as is possible the terrible condition of our prisoners the report shows that in a region of country favourable to malarial fevers persons lying in the open air on the border of a swamp without shelter drinking unwholesome water in short with every surrounding conducive to malaria still the poison of that atmosphere made so by the peculiar circumstances overcame all those influences and rendered the place comparatively free from fevers of a malarial nature after describing at some length the effects of scurvy and hospital gangrene the report proceeds the long use of salt meat oftentimes imperfectly cured as well as the almost total deprivation of vegetables and fruit appeared to be the chief cause of the scurvy i carefully examined the bakery and the bread furnished the prisoners and found that they were supplied almost entirely with corn bread from which the husk had not been separated this husk acted as an irritant to the alimentary canal without adding any nutriment to the bread record page forty three forty six after speaking of the sheds used for the sick in the stockade which were open on all sides he says the sick lay upon the bare boards or upon such ragged blankets as they possessed without as far as i observed any bedding or even straw pits for the reception of faeces were dug within a few feet of the lower floor and they were almost never unoccupied by those suffering with diarrhoea the haggard and distressed countenances of those miserable complaining dejected living skeletons crying for medical aid and food 
and the ghastly corpses with their glazed eyeballs staring up into vacant space with the flies swarming down their open and grinning mouths and over their ragged clothes infested with numerous lice as they lay among the sick and dying formed a picture of helpless hopeless misery which it would be impossible to portray by words or by the brush record page forty three forty eight it would hardly seem necessary if indeed it were possible to add colouring to the picture here drawn i cannot refrain however from noticing further the condition of these prisoners as we learn it from the same class of testimony dr amos thornburg a rebel surgeon on duty at andersonville from the fourteenth of april until the prison was finally broken up fully confirms everything said by dr jones after speaking of the terrible mortality among the prisoners and in reply to the question to what do you attribute it he says i attribute it to the want of proper diet the crowding together of too many men in the prison and in the hospital the lack of shelter and fuel and consequent exposure while i prescribed at the stockade after the hospital was moved outside the number of sick who could not be admitted into the hospital became so great that we were compelled to practice by formulas for different diseases numbering them so that instead of a prescription a patient was told to use number blank record page twenty three twenty one manuscript page nine nine six manifestly improper as this method of treating diseases must appear to every one it did not escape the criticism of the more conscientious even of those at andersonville dr head persisting in giving a prescription in each case as he thought his duty as a conscientious physician required and not willing to accept a number prepared for all stages of any one disease was told on asking why he could not be permitted to pursue the safe course that he was not to practice in that way that he had to practice according to the formulas and numbers that they had record page twenty five hundred manuscript page ten sixty six in reply to the question why did you object to it he says because i could not prescribe properly for my patients i looked upon it as utter quackery anybody whether he had ever read medicine or not could practice according to the formulas it was often doubtful whether a prescription would suit a case in its present condition the doctors however had to take that or nothing dr g l b rice another surgeon on duty there speaking on this same point says i commenced prescribing as i had been in the habit of doing it at home but was informed that i would not be allowed to do that i was handed a list of formulas and numbers from one up to a certain point and we had to use those my opinion was that we could do very little good with that kind of prescription it was very unsafe practice i know nothing about the ingredients in them and had no means of knowing it i made complaints but the chief surgeon would not allow a change record page thirty six o four manuscript page eleven forty six the testimony of dr thornburg and other surgeons who prescribed at the stockade shows that after the hospital was moved outside patients were not treated in the stockade at all but only those who were able to crowd their way through that living mass to the south gate or could induce their companions to carry them there or as happened in rare instances could have medicine sent into them received any medical attention whatever hundreds and thousands as appears from the concurrent testimony of all the witnesses sickened languished and died in that terrible place without any medical attendance whatever horrible as this may appear the hospital register bears indubitable proof of its truth let me in this connection refer to exhibit blank showing certain computations made from that register the phrase died in quarters in the column of remarks 
dr thornburg says describes those cases just alluded to and they are shown to have amounted to the frightful number of three thousand seven hundred and twenty seven these dead as we have learned from dr thornburg's testimony after being brought out were examined and as far as possible the diseases from which they died never entered on the hospital register for a purpose so diabolical that one shudders at the thought and which i shall hereafter notice others the causes of whose death could not even be guessed at or as dr jones describes it morbi verii were marked on the register unknown prisoners would often die on their way to the sick gate or while waiting their turn at the gate or on their way from the gate to the hospital and although in some instances such men might have been prescribed for they could not afterwards be identified but had to be carried to the graveyard and buried among the nameless to prevent if possible this utter annihilation of memory name and fame dr thornburg instituted a system of placards by which he sought to prevent if possible this reckless wiping out of all traces of the dead and which prevented its occurrences he thinks after june eighteen sixty four but there had already gone to their last home as captain moore who reinterred the dead at andersonville tells us four hundred and fifty one of our brave soldiers who they are the andersonville register tells not but there is a register where they are all recorded in letters of light and one by one will these unknown rise in judgment against those who are responsible for their deaths another frightful feature brought out by the testimony of dr thornburg and others and confirmed by nearly every soldier who testified before this court is this that only the worst cases were allowed to enter the hospital and so closely was the line drawn discriminating against these supplicants that often prisoners who had been refused admission into the hospital died on their way back to their quarters i will not stop now as i am not inquiring into the responsibility of parties to notice the ineffable cruelty of compelling the sick to remain in the stockade until they were in a dying condition as some of the witnesses say before they were eligible to a space as large as their own persons in what was falsely termed a hospital nor did the rigours and sufferings of this prison cease till its very close their shelters continued the same no more while the treatment both in and out of the stockade was not perceptibly better from a temperature ranging during the summer up to near a hundred and fifty degrees fahrenheit in the sun as dr thornburg tells you during which there were many cases of sunstroke it fell in the winter to a temperature much below the freezing point nothing being left these miserable creatures with which to resist the inclemency of the weather but diseased and emaciated bodies and ragged and worn-out clothing dr thornburg says that during the winter there was weather sufficiently severe to have frozen to death men with the scanty supplies these prisoners had and in their emaciated condition and dr rice after stating that the prisoners were exposed more or less during the whole winter says i knew a great many to die there who i believe died from hunger and starvation and from cold and exposure record page twenty six o six manuscript page eleven sixteen this is more than confirmed also by dr bates record page one sixty four manuscript page forty three and to the eternal infamy of the man who registered it and of the heartless wretches who caused it let it be spread before the world that on the hospital register there appears this entry t garrity one o sixth pennsylvania frozen to death admitted january third died january third died in the stockade showing that he not only froze to death in the stockade without medical treatment and without shelter but that he was admitted into the hospital after death for a purpose which i shall hereafter show 
wishing only to get at the truth of these things and desirous particularly that the parties responsible shall be judged as far as possible out of their own mouths i must trespass upon the patience of the court for a moment to notice the evidence of dr g g roy a rebel surgeon who was on duty from the first of september until the close of the prison in response to the question what was the condition of the men sent to the hospital from the stockade describe their diseases and appearance he says they presented the most horrible spectacle of humanity that i ever saw in my life a good many were suffering from scurvy and other diseases a good many were naked a large majority barefooted a good many without hats their condition generally was almost indescribable and he goes on to say i attributed this condition to long confinement wants of the necessaries and comforts of life and all those causes that are calculated to produce that condition of the system where there is just vitality enough to permit one to live the prisoners were too densely crowded there was no shelter except such as they constructed themselves which was very insufficient a good many were in holes in the earth with their blankets thrown over them a good many had a blanket or oilcloth thrown over poles some were in tents constructed by their own ingenuity and with just such accommodations as their own ingenuity permitted them to contrive there were you may say no accommodations made for them in the stockade record page four eighty five and four eighty six manuscript page one ninety two speaking of the east side of the stockade along the stream he says it is composed of marsh and was blocked with trees which had been cut down acting as an obstruction to all the deleterious animal and vegetable matter that passed after heavy weather through this stream it accumulated and became very noxious and was a very fruitful source of malaria he then speaks of the large quantities of insects and vermin which resulted from a decay of animal or vegetable matter and to such an extent was this place a breeder of insects that he says mosquitoes rarely heard of in that vicinity before so filled the air that it was dangerous for a man to open his mouth after sundown he speaks also of the multitude of fleas there and says the fleas were as bad as mosquitoes and several weeks after the evacuation of the stockade they emigrated and came up to the private houses in the vicinity so that the occupants had to leave on account of them when we remember the facts brought out in such bold relief by the elaborate report of dr jones as to the effect of slight abrasions of the skin of man under the peculiar condition of body that most of these prisoners laboured under it would seem to have been almost useless for them to have attempted to resist the destroyer further along in the testimony dr roy says this marshy place that i spoke of was just in rear of the hospital and the winds of course blew the odours from there across the hospital and it was not until late in the winter if at all that any attempt was made to drain it still pursuing our inquiries in this direction i desire to quote from a report made by dr g s hopkins and surgeon h e watkins addressed to general winder and which was made pursuant to his suggestion as embracing in a concise form many of the causes of the disease and mortality at andersonville causes of disease and mortality one the large number of prisoners crowded together two the entire absence of all vegetables and diet so necessary as a preventive of scurvy three the want of barracks to shelter the prisoners from sun and rain four inadequate supply of wood and good water five badly cooked food six the filthy condition of the prisoners and prison generally seven the morbific emanations from the branch or ravine passing through the prison the condition of which cannot be better explained than by naming it a morass of human excrement and mud preventive means 
one the removal immediately from the prison of not less than fifteen thousand prisoners two detail on parole of a sufficient number of prisoners to cultivate the necessary supply of vegetables and until this can be carried into practical operation the appointment of agents along the different lines of railroad to purchase and forward a supply three the immediate erection of barracks to shelter the prisoners four to furnish necessary quantity of wood and have wells dug to supply the deficiency of water five divide the prisoners into squads place each squad under the charge of a sergeant furnish the necessary quantity of soap and hold those sergeants responsible for the personal cleanliness of his squad furnish the prisoners with clothing at the expense of the confederate government and if that government be unable to do so candidly admit our inability and call upon the federal government to furnish them six by a daily inspection of bakehouse and cooking seven cover over with sand from the hillside the entire morass not less than six inches deep board the stream or watercourse and confine the men to the use of the sinks and make the penalty for the disobedience of such orders severe i will not stop now to notice with what flippancy and recklessness the practical suggestions made by these surgeons were put aside and totally disregarded both by general winder and by chief surgeon white i can hardly think that further proof inasmuch as the proof is already made cumulative from this class of witnesses is needed there have been examined with regard to the condition of the stockade and hospital over seventy witnesses and an examination of their testimony will as i have before stated show a complete and perfect concurrence we come now to the second class of testimony we learn by a letter dated macon georgia may five and signed howell cobb see extract number fifteen that pursuant to an order from the war department at richmond that officer visited andersonville for the purpose of informing himself of the condition of the prison after saying i presume the character of the prison is well understood at richmond and therefore give no description of it he remarks the prison is already too much crowded and no additional prisoners should be sent there until it can be enlarged the effect of increasing the number within the present area must be a terrific increase of sickness and deaths during the summer months i doubt very much whether the water will be sufficient for the accommodation of the increased number of prisoners referring to the report of dr eldridge which he enclosed in his letter and speaking of the erection of hospital buildings outside the prison he says upon that point there cannot be two opinions among intelligent men whatever may be said of the revulsion of feelings experienced by this distinguished rebel at a subsequent date as appears from the testimony of james burns walker it is certain that at this day may five eighteen sixty four the approaching horrors of andersonville were clearly visible to him and ought to have been to the rebel war department which it seems received this report on the twenty first of the same month on the eighth of may the prisoner wrote to major turner at richmond see extract number sixteen the necessity of enlarging the stockade is unavoidable from the same report it appears that from the first of april to the date of the report may eighth there had died seven hundred and twenty eight prisoners nearly ten per cent of the whole in a little over one month notwithstanding this protest and the fact of the overcrowded state of the prison being brought home to the notice of the war department at richmond prisoners continued to arrive at andersonville until at the close of may the journal kept by the commandant of the prison shows the total to have been nineteen thousand two hundred and one of whom seven hundred and eleven died in that month still prisoners were hurried forward to this sepulchre until at the end of june the journal shows there were twenty seven thousand six hundred forty one of whom one thousand two hundred and three died in that month 
it will be remembered that during these three entire months the stockade remained at its original capacity being an area of a fraction less than seventeen acres you will remember also that the deadline had previously to this time been established diminishing this area by a strip twenty feet wide running around the entire enclosure this with the uninhabitable portion of the swamp left less rather than more than an acre of ground to every two thousand prisoners what more is needed to paint the horrors of this place in july still referring to the journal there were thirty three thousand four hundred and forty three prisoners of whom one thousand seven hundred forty two are reported died by this time the stockade had been increased about one-third still leaving however to each prisoner a space of only one foot by six in this same month there seems to have been some correspondence between the rebel adjutant-general and general winder who was then on duty at andersonville from a letter written by general winder to adjutant-general cooper dated july twenty one see extract number seventeen i extract the following you speak in your endorsements of placing the prisoners properly i do not comprehend what is intended by it i know of but one place to place them and that is to put them into the stockade where they have between four and five square yards to the man this includes streets and two acres of ground about the stream it will be observed that general winder was very careful not to mention the strip twenty feet wide cut off by the deadline at the close of this month from what motive we can only conjecture colonel d t chandler of the rebel war department was sent to inspect the prison at andersonville and on the fifth of august eighteen sixty four he made a full report this report is no stronger than others from which we have already quoted but as it is destined to figure extensively in this case at other points in the argument i beg to make a few extracts from it he says a small stream passes from west to east through the enclosure furnishing the only water for washing accessible to the prisoners some regiments of the guard the bakery and the cook-house being placed on rising ground bordering the stream before it enters the prison renders the water nearly unfit for use before it reaches the prisoners from thirty to fifty yards on each side of the stream the ground is a muddy marsh totally unfit for occupation being constantly used as a sink since the prison was first established it is now in a shocking condition and cannot fail to breed pestilence no shelter whatever nor material for constructing any have been provided by the prison authorities and the ground being entirely bare of trees none is within the reach of the prisoners again the whole number of prisoners is divided into messes of two hundred and seventy and subdivisions of ninety men each under a sergeant of their own number and but one confederate states officer captain wirtz is assigned to the supervision and control of the whole in consequence of these facts and the absence of all regularity in the prison grounds and there being no barracks or tents there are and can be no regulations established for the police consideration for the health comfort or sanitary conditions of those within the enclosure and none are practicable under existing circumstances there is no medical attendance furnished within the stockade he says further many twenty yesterday are carted out daily who have died from unknown causes and whom the medical officers have never seen the dead are hauled daily by wagon loads and buried without coffins their hands in many instances being first mutilated with an axe in the removal of any finger rings they may have the sanitary condition of the prisoners is as wretched as can be the principal causes of mortality being scurvy and chronic diarrhoea the percentage of the former being disproportionately large among those brought from belle isle nothing seems to have been done and but little if any effort made to arrest it by procuring proper food 
raw rations have been issued to a very large proportion who are entirely unprovided with proper utensils and furnished with so limited a supply of fuel they are compelled to dig with their hands in the filthy marsh before mentioned for roots and so forth surgeon isaiah h white chief surgeon at the prison in a report to colonel chandler which was made an enclosure of his report to richmond says the lack of barrack accommodations exposes the men to the heat of the sun by day and the dews by night and is a prolific source of disease the point of exit of the stream through the wall of the stockade is not sufficiently bold as to permit the free passage of ordure when the stream is swollen by rains the lower portion of this bottom land is overflowed by a solution of excrement which subsiding and the surface exposed to the sun produces a horrible stench end of part two part four of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part four closing statement of judge advocate prosecutor part three evidence of rebel officers and soldiers i turn now to the testimony of the rebel officers and soldiers on duty at andersonville colonel alexander w persons of the rebel army the first commandant of the post who remained there until the latter part of may says that after he was relieved he returned there again and drew a bill for an injunction and when called upon to explain for what reason replied to abate a nuisance the graveyard made it a nuisance the prison generally was a nuisance from the intolerable stench the effluvia the malaria that it gave up and things of that sort the view here presented must strike the court as graphic indeed when without regard to the question of humanity or inhumanity involved persons living in the vicinity of andersonville could gravely begin a legal proceeding to abate the prison as a nuisance on the ground mainly that the effluvia arising from it was intolerable colonel george c gibbs who afterwards commanded the post gives evidence on this point no less important he was assigned to duty in october eighteen sixty four and although the number at that time was greatly diminished he speaks of the prisoners being badly off for clothing and shelter and in other respects destitute prior to this time some time in july he had visited the stockade and he uses this language in regard to its appearance then i rode around it on three sides i think and could see into it from the batteries that commanded it i never saw so many men together in the same space before it had more the appearance of an ant hill than anything else i can compare it to record page eighty four manuscript page sixteen nazareth allen a rebel soldier on duty at andersonville during the summer of eighteen sixty four fully corroborates these opinions and further in relation to the location of troops above the stockade and its effects on the prisoners says the cook-house was above the stockade and a good deal of washing was done up the branch consequently a good deal of filth went down some of the troops were encamped on the stream above on the side of the hill and the rain would wash the filth of the camps and sinks into the stream which would carry it through the stockade i have seen the prisoners using it when it was in this filthy condition the stench was very bad i have smelt it when i was at our picket camp about a mile in a straight line it was so bad that it kept me sick pretty near all the time i was round the stockade the soldiers preferred picket duty to sentry duty on that account william williams dillard another rebel soldier on duty at the same time fully confirms this he was on duty both on parapet and on picket and had opportunity of observation 
in reply to a question as to the condition of the stockade he says it was as nasty as a place could be on one occasion i saw a man lying there who had not clothes enough on him to hide his nakedness his hip bones were worn away he had put up two sticks and fastened his coat over them to keep the sun off his face there were a good many lying down sick and others waiting on them the crowded state of the men and the filthiness of the place created a very bad odour i have smelt it at the depot about a mile from the stockade record page eight o one manuscript page three twenty seven again he says the stream that passed through the stockade ran between the first and second georgia regiments and finland's battalion and passed the bakehouse all the washings from the bakehouse went right through the stockade and also the washings from the camps the pits used by the men were not five steps from the stream sometimes when it was rainy it was thick with mud and filth from the drainings of the camps inside the stockade record page eight o one manuscript page three thirty calvin honeycutt another rebel soldier on duty from april eighteen sixty four to april eighteen sixty five who was on duty at the stockade and also on picket corroborates the testimony of his comrades james mohan a rebel private afterwards made a lieutenant who was on duty at andersonville for about five months during the summer of eighteen sixty four gives similar testimony and john f heath regimental commissary with the rank of captain on duty from may till october eighteen sixty four fully confirms the testimony on this point already given evidence of residence of georgia samuel hall a prominent gentleman residing in macon georgia whose sympathies he tells us were from the beginning with the rebellion and who held a high civil official position says when first i saw it the prison in the month of august it was literally crammed and packed there was scarcely room for locomotion it was destitute of shelter as well as i could judge and at that time there was great mortality among the prisoners record page eight sixty four manuscript three fifty two rev william john hamilton also gives important testimony as to the condition of the stockade which he visited in the capacity of a priest he was there in may and at different periods subsequently he says i found the stockade extremely crowded and a great deal of sickness and suffering among the men i was kept so busy administering the sacraments to the dying that i had to curtail a great deal of the service that catholic priests administer to the dying they died so fast i waited only upon those of our own church and do not include others among the dying the stockade was extremely filthy the men all huddled together and covered with vermin the best idea i can give to the court of the condition of the place is perhaps this i went in there with a white linen coat on and i had not been in there more than ten minutes or a quarter of an hour when a gentleman drew my attention to the condition of my coat it was all covered over with vermin and i had to take my coat off and leave it with one of the guards and perform my duties in my shirt sleeves the place was so filthy record page nineteen sixty nine manuscript page eight seventy again giving an illustration of the sufferings of the prisoners and especially the effect of the intense heat of the sun he says i found a boy not more than sixteen years old who came to me for spiritual comfort without jacket or coat or any covering on his feet suffering very much from a wound in his right foot the foot was split open like an oyster and on inquiring the cause i was told it was from exposure to the sun in the stockade and not from any wound received in battle on returning to the stockade a week afterwards i learned that he had stepped across the dead line and requested the guard to shoot him he had no medical treatment nor had any others so far as i could see to whom i administered the sacrament in the stockade again he says on my second visit i was told there was an irishman at the extreme end of the stockade who was calling out for a priest 
i tried to cross the branch to reach him but was unable to do so as the men were all crowding around there trying to get into the water to cool themselves and wash themselves and i had to leave the stockade without seeing the man the heat was intolerable there was no air at all in the stockade the logs of which the stockade was composed were so close together that i could not feel any fresh air inside and with a strong sun beaming down upon it and no shelter at all of course the heat must have been insufferable at least i felt it so the priests who went there after me while administering the sacrament to the dying had to use an umbrella the heat was so intense record page nineteen eighty one manuscript page eight seventy ambrose spencer a gentleman of prominence in his state residing near andersonville during the war and a frequent visitor to that place gives us a graphic picture of the prison which i cannot refrain from quoting he says i had frequent opportunity of seeing the condition of the prisoners not only from the adjacent hills but on several occasions from the outside of the stockade where the sentinels grounds were and in reply to a question asking him to describe the condition of the prison he says i can only answer the question by saying that their condition was as wretched and as horrible as could well be conceived not only from the exposure to the sun the inclemency of the weather and the cold of winter but from the filth from the absolute degradation which was evident in their condition i have seen that stockade after three or four days rain when the mud i should think was at least twelve inches deep the prisoners were walking in or walking through that mud the condition of the stockade can perhaps be expressed most accurately by saying that in passing up and down the railroad if the wind was favourable the odour of the stockade could be detected at least two miles record page twenty four fifty five manuscript page ten forty nine there are others of this class who testify upon this point but it would seem useless to give further extracts evidence of union prisoners we come now to the fifth and last class of testimony upon this point this embraces the experiences and personal observations of the soldiers of the union who were themselves sufferers i will not allow an inference to be drawn that these witnesses are not to be believed by attempting a defence of their credibility with two exceptions in persons and a few in the details of immaterial facts i believe this evidence will bear the closest scrutiny with regard to the subject now being examined viz the condition of the stockade and the hospital gentlemen of the highest intelligence and professional attainments have told you upon the stand that it is indescribable and i cannot therefore doubt the strongest colouring given by these injured men many of whom exhibited to the court evidences of their sufferings when they undertake to add their personal experience to the testimony of science if a score of these men had come upon the stand unsupported with feelings embittered against their captors and given their tales of horror the world might well doubt but when they come from all arms of the service from all parts of the country and without collusion and in numbers overwhelming and are not only not contradicted in any material fact but are supported by concurrent testimony from all sources their evidence is entitled to the highest credence let no man ever say that andersonville was overdrawn by these men i hope it will not be considered out of place though it may not constitute a material part of the argument to give a complete list of these sufferers who have testified readers note here follows a half page of names and their units it is not my purpose in this connection to enter into a detail of the sufferings the acts of cruelty inflicted and the inhuman treatment they received or to inquire by whom these things were done reserving that for its proper place in the argument i shall simply refer to this testimony to assist us in ascertaining more certainly the horrors to which these brave men were subjected 
dr a w barrows hospital steward of the twenty seventh massachusetts regiment and acting assistant post surgeon at plymouth north carolina arrived at andersonville on the twenty eighth of may and remained there six months owing to his knowledge of medicine and efficiency he was paroled by the prisoner and assigned to duty in the hospital his testimony is important as showing the condition of the hospital mainly but he has also given some material evidence with regard to the stockade and from it i make the following extract i remember when there have been as many as from seventy-five to a hundred who died during the day in the stockade and who were never taken to the hospital that was in the month of august robert h kellogg entered the prison on the third of may eighteen sixty four and remained there until the following september he says we found the men in the stockade ragged nearly destitute of clothing totally unprovided with shelter except that which tattered blankets could afford they looked nearly starved they were mere skeletons covered with skin the prison seemed very crowded to us although there were thousands brought there after that they were in a very filthy condition indeed there were but two issues of soap made to the prison while i was there when we first went there the nights were very cold that soon passed away as the season advanced and during the summer it was intensely hot there were twenty-one rainy days in the month of june our supply of fuel was not regular nor sufficient we were allowed to go several times under guard six men from a squad of ninety to bring in what we could find in the woods on our shoulders but the greater part of the time we had to rely upon our supply of roots we dug out of the ground or grabbed for in the swamps pitch pine roots rations were issued raw many times without fuel to cook them the squad of ninety of which i was sergeant went from the thirtieth of june to the thirtieth of august without any issue of wood from the authorities record page three sixty one three sixty two manuscript page one thirty four one thirty eight again he says the quality of the rations was very poor the quantity greatly varied there were days when we got nothing at all i made a note of at least two such days there were other days when we got but very little other days enough such as it was when my regiment went there the men were healthy they gradually sickened until i remember one morning at roll call out of my ninety there were thirty-two who were not able to stand up this resulted principally from scurvy and diarrhoea this was on the twenty first of august a number of the men of my squad having died up to that time the mass of the men had to depend on the brook for their water it at many times was exceedingly filthy i have seen it completely covered with floating grease and dirt and offal after the prisoners had been there some time they dug some wells and there were some springs along the south side of the prison on the edge of the hill by the swamp but the supply from that source was entirely inadequate they supplied the wants of a few of the four hundred men captured with me more than three hundred are dead they died in prison or a few days after being paroled and that is a larger percentage of living than there is in many regiments the twenty fourth new york battery which was captured at plymouth was nearly annihilated record page three sixty seven manuscript pages one thirty four and one thirty nine this is the simple unvarnished narrative of perhaps as intelligent a witness as has been upon the stand he has written a book entitled life and death in southern prisons which has been used extensively by counsel for the accused i do not want to burden the record with a recapitulation of all that these witnesses have testified to but i think it can be safely said that not one word of robert h kellogg's testimony has been or can be disproved there are many of his comrades who fully confirm him without adding any special facts that would tend to elucidate this point these i shall omit in this connection there are others however who have additional facts bearing on this subject and i beg your indulgence while i refer to them 
boston corbett's testimony brings out some facts to which i will first call your attention speaking of the heat he says it was so great that i have the marks upon my shoulders yet record page four twenty five manuscript page one sixty six of the brook and the swamps bordering it he says it was a living mass of putrefaction and filth there were maggots there a foot deep any time we turned over the soil we could see the maggots in a living mass i have seen the soldiers wading through it digging for roots to use for fuel i have seen around the swamp the sick in great numbers lying pretty much as soldiers lie when they are down to rest in line after a march in the morning i could see those who had died during the night and in the daytime i could see them exposed to the heat of the sun with their feet swelled to an enormous size in many cases large gangrene sores filled with maggots and flies which they were unable to keep off i have seen men lying there in a state of utter destitution not able to help themselves lying in their own filth they generally chose that place near the swamp those who were most offensive because others would drive them away not wanting to be near those who had such bad sores they chose it because of its being so near to the sinks in one case a man died there i am satisfied from the effects of lice when the clothes were taken off his body the lice seemed as thick as the garment a living mass and again the water in the stockade was often very filthy sometimes it was middling clear at times i would go to those who had wells dug sometimes they would give me a drink sometimes they would not they used such rough language to me that i turned away parched with thirst and drank water from the stream rather than beg it from the men who had wells record page four thirty seven manuscript page one sixty five again the minds of the prisoners were in many cases so affected that the prisoners became idiotic record page four thirty nine manuscript one fifty two on page four fifty two of the record manuscript page one seventy two he says i have taken food given me to eat to the stream and washed the maggots from it i have seen them in the sores of soldiers there and i have seen them in such a way that it is hardly fit to describe to this court too horrible for belief as this may seem to be it stands confirmed by at least fifty witnesses martin e hogan is a witness whom the court will remember as among the more intelligent and at the same time truthful and candid his observations were confined mainly to the hospital but i feel impelled to make a brief extract from his testimony in regard to the stockade he says at the time of my arrival there speaking of the stockade it was very much crowded so much so that you could scarcely elbow your way through the crowd in any part of the camp i noticed a great many men lying helpless on the ground seemingly without care without anybody to attend to them lying in their own filth a great many of them calling for water a great many crying for food nobody apparently paying any heed to them others almost entirely destitute of clothing so numerous that i could not begin to say how many record page five seventy five manuscript page two ten then follows testimony similar to that of boston corbett in regard to the swamp and the vermin in it andrew j spring who went to andersonville in may eighteen sixty four says that upon entering the stockade i found the prisoners destitute of clothing i could not tell in many cases whether they were white men or negroes on the twenty ninth of the same month he was detailed for duty outside after being outside the stockade about six weeks he says i applied to the lieutenant of the guard at the gate and gave him twelve dollars in greenbacks to let me go in and stay an hour to see our boys i went in and spent an hour inside the stockade a great many of the boys were very poor there were some of my own best friends whom i could not recognize till they came and shook hands with me and made themselves known even then i could hardly believe they were the same men 
i have seen men acquaintances of mine who would go around there not knowing anything at all hardly noticing anything i have seen men crippled up so that they had scarcely any life in them at all they would lie on the ground to all appearances dead i went up to several who i thought were dead but i found they had a little life in them james h davidson record page nine thirty six and a half manuscript page three eighty six speaking of the condition of the stockade says i have seen men who had the appearance of being starved to death i have seen men pick up and eat undigested food that had passed through other men all through the camp it came from men who were not able to go to the slough and they would find it all through the camp this it will be remembered is testified to by very many dan w bussinger says i have seen men eat undigested food that had passed through other men they would wash it and eat it pick it up from the sinks record page eleven twenty five manuscript page four ninety without referring to names or going into particulars it may be stated that other witnesses testify to the prisoners watching for the bodies of the dead for the privilege of carrying them out that they might be allowed to return with wood one witness says there was a scramble for this privilege others testify that they paid at the rate of a dollar for a stick of wood three inches in diameter and two feet long and the witnesses of this class testify uniformly not only to the lack of quantity in the rations but to their bad quality and to the fact that very often they were stopped altogether condition of the hospital it is not proposed to enter as fully into the condition of the hospital as might be done from the reports and evidence before us sufficient will be given however to warrant the conclusion that it was very little better than that of the stockade itself and in view of the discrimination which the surgeons were directed to make in the admission of men from the stockade into the hospital we can readily understand why the prisoners almost uniformly bade their comrades farewell when they were taken from the stockade to the hospital the evidence which i shall bring to your recollection will also justify the remark made by one of the surgeons who says that it was really no hospital here also we have recourse to the official report of dr joseph jones in which we find his remarks upon the condition of the hospital quite as lucid and elaborate as those in reference to the stockade after speaking of the stream running through one corner of the hospital stockade and stating that its upper portion was used for washing by the patients and the lower portion as a sink he remarks this part of the stream is a semi-fluid mass of human excrement and offal and filth of all kinds this immense cesspool fermenting beneath the hot sun emitted an overpowering stench north of the hospital grounds the stream which flows through the stockade pursues its sluggish and filthy course the exhalations from the swamp which is loaded with the excrement of the prisoners confined in the stockade exert their deleterious influences on the inmates of the hospital within the hospital enclosure less than five acres he says the patients and attendants near two thousand are crowded and are but poorly supplied with old and ragged tents a large number are without any bunks in the tents and lay upon the ground oftentimes without even a blanket no beds or straw appear to have been furnished the tents extended to within a few yards of the small stream which as he before observed was used as a privy and loaded with excrement i observed he says a large pile of corn-bread bones and filth of all kinds thirty feet in diameter and several feet in height swarming with myriads of flies in a vacant space near the pots used for cooking millions of flies swarmed over everything and covered the faces of the sleeping patients crawled down their open mouths and deposited their maggots upon the gangrenous wounds of the living and the mouths of the dead 
mosquitoes in great numbers also infested the tents and many of the patients were so stung by these pestiferous insects that they resembled those suffering with a slight attack of the measles the police and hygiene of the hospital was defective in the extreme record pages forty three fifty fifty one manuscript page seventeen twenty one again many of the sick were literally encrusted with dirt and filth and covered with vermin when a gangrene wound needed washing the limb was thrust out a little from the blanket or board or rags upon which the patient was lying and water poured over it and all the putrescent matter allowed to soak into the ground floor of the tent i saw the most filthy rags which had been applied several times and imperfectly washed used in dressing recent wounds where hospital gangrene was prevailing it was impossible for any wounds to escape contagion under the circumstances record page forty three fifty four of the treatment of the dead he says the manner of disposing of the dead is also calculated to depress the already despondent spirits of these men the dead house is merely a frame covered with old tent cloth and a few brushes situated in the southwestern part of the hospital grounds when a patient dies he is simply laid in the narrow street in front of his tent until he is removed by the federal negroes detailed to carry off the dead if the patient die during the night he lies there until morning and during the day the dead were frequently allowed to remain for hours in these walks in the dead house the corpses lay on the bare ground and were in most cases covered with filth and vermin record page forty three fifty five manuscript page seventeen twenty one further on he says the cooking arrangements are of the most defective character two large iron pots similar to those used for boiling sugar-cane appeared to be the only cooking utensils furnished by the hospital for the cooking of nearly two thousand men and the patients were dependent in a great measure on their own miserable utensils the air of the tents was foul and disagreeable in the extreme and in fact the entire grounds emitted a most noxious and disgusting smell i entered nearly all the tents and carefully examined the cases of interest especially the cases of gangrene during the prosecution of my pathological inquiries at andersonville and therefore enjoyed every opportunity to judge correctly of the hygiene and police of the hospital record page forty three fifty seven manuscript page seventeen twenty one to show that this frightful condition of affairs did not cease after a great portion of the prisoners were removed dr jones observes the ratio of mortality continued to increase during september for notwithstanding the removal of half the entire number of prisoners during the early portion of the month one thousand seven hundred and fifty seven deaths were registered from september first to the twenty first and the largest number of deaths upon any one day occurred during this month on the sixteenth viz a hundred and nineteen afterwards remarking upon the causes of the great mortality among the federal prisoners he says the chief causes of death were scurvy and its results bowel affections and chronic and acute diarrhoea and dysentery the bowel affections appear to have been due to the diet and the habits of the patients the depressed dejected state of the nervous system and moral and intellectual powers and to the effluvia arising from decomposed animal and vegetable filth record page forty three seventy two manuscript page seventeen twenty one he also says almost every amputation was followed finally by death either from the effects of gangrene or from the prevailing diarrhoea and dysentery so far as my observation extended very few of the cases of amputation for gangrene recovered record page forty three seventy eight manuscript page seventeen twenty one the evidence of dr john c bates is important as showing the condition of the hospital he was a rebel surgeon on duty at andersonville from the middle of september eighteen sixty four to the last of march eighteen sixty five embracing a period when it is claimed the sufferings were much lighter than they had been 
this we have already seen by dr jones's report was not true even after those of the prisoners had been sent away and we shall see from the testimony of dr bates that it was wholly incorrect he says upon going to the ward to which i was assigned i was shocked at the appearance of things the men were lying partially nude and dying and lousy a portion of them in the sand and others upon boards which had been stuck upon little props pretty well crowded a majority of them in small tents i would go to the other parts of the hospital when officer of the day the men would gather around me and ask for a bone i would give them whatever i could find at my disposition without robbing others i well knew that an appropriation of one ration took it from the general issue that when i appropriated an extra ration to one man some one else would fall minus i then fell back upon the distribution of bones they did not presume to ask me for meat at all so far as rations are concerned that is the way matters went along for some time after i went there they could not be furnished with any clothing except the clothing of the dead which was generally appropriated to the living there was a partial supply of fuel but not sufficient to keep the men warm and prolong their existence as medical officer of the day i made examinations beyond my own ward and reported the condition as a general thing the patients were destitute filthy and partly naked the clamour all the while was for something to eat record page one twenty five manuscript page twenty eight dr g g roy whose testimony was before referred to in speaking of the hospital says i found it in a very deplorable condition there was no comfort attached to it whatever many of the tents were badly worn torn and rotten and of course permitted the water to leak through the patients were not furnished with bunks or bedding or bed clothing or anything of that kind record page four eighty manuscript page one ninety two he speaks as did all the other medical officers on duty there of the great dearth of medicines but also concurs with most of them in the opinion that medicine was not so much needed as proper diet and he confirms generally the description given by dr jones on the twenty sixth day of september dr amos thornburg assistant surgeon in a report to dr stevenson the surgeon in charge c x number thirty manuscript page nine eighty nine calls special attention to the very bad sanitary condition of the hospital he reports that the patients are lying on the cold ground without bedding or blankets also that we have a very scanty supply of medicines and that the rations are not of the proper kind and not issued in proper quantity on the fifth of september dr j c pellet in an official report directed to the chief of his division c x number nine manuscript page fifty seven says the tents are entirely destitute of either bunks bedding or straw the patients being compelled to lie on the bare ground i earnestly call your attention to the article of diet the cornbread received from the bakery being made up without sifting is wholly unfit for the use of the sick and often as within the last twenty-four hours the inner portion is found to be perfectly raw the meat received for the patients does not amount to over two ounces per day and for the past three or four days no flour has been issued the cornbread cannot be eaten by many for to do so would be to increase the diseases of the bowels from which a large majority of them are suffering and it is therefore thrown away all these men receive by way of sustenance is two ounces of boiled beef and half a pint of rice soup per day under these circumstances all the skill that can be brought to bear upon their cases by the medical officers will avail nothing we have but little more than indigenous barks and roots with which to treat the numerous forms of disease to which our attention is daily called for the treatment of wounds ulcers and so forth we have literally nothing except water our wards some of them are filled with gangrene and we are compelled to fold our arms and look quietly on its ravages not even having stimulants to support the system under its depressing influence 
similar testimony is given by doctors rice head fluellen and others of the medical corps on duty at andersonville this picture of human suffering might be intensified and presented in different phases if it were not to resort to the testimony of soldiers on duty in the hospital and those who were patients there but nothing can add to the truthfulness of the facts stated as we have shown in the official reports made at the time and made for no other purpose than to call the attention of the proper officers to the facts hence i do not deem it necessary to enlarge further on this branch of the subject End of part three part four of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part four closing statement of judge advocate prosecutor part four the charge of conspiracy we come now to a consideration of the third branch of the subject having presented a faithful representation faithful because the witnesses have given it of the conditions of the stockade and the hospital we shall proceed to unfold the extent of the conspiracy the purposes the conspirators and the cruel and devilish means resorted to to accomplish their ends i confess to you gentlemen that i enter upon this branch of the argument with regret and reluctance i confess that to a greater or lesser extent our nationality and the good name we bear are involved in the issue but i do not fear to present to the world on this account this great conspiracy of treason this confederation of traitors though it shock the moral sentiment of the universe for however much we may deplore the fact that its head and front were americans once prominent in the councils of the nation they have forfeited all rights they have ceased in any way to represent the true spirit of americanism they are outlaws and criminals and cannot by their crimes taint our fair escutcheon it is the work of treason the legitimate result of that sum of all villainies and which by many very many proofs during the past four years has shown itself capable of this last one developed when we remember that the men here charged and those inculpated but not named in the indictment are some of them men who were at the head of the late rebellion from its beginning to its close and as such chiefs sanctioned the brutal conduct of their soldiers as early as the first battle of bull run who perpetrated unheard-of cruelties at libby and belle isle who encouraged the most atrocious propositions of retaliation in their congress who sanctioned a guerrilla mode of warfare who instilled a system of steamboat burning and firing of cities who employed a surgeon in their service to steal into our capital city infected clothing who approved the criminal treatment of the captured prisoners at fort pillow fort washington and elsewhere who were guilty of the basest treachery in sending paroled prisoners into the field who planted torpedoes in the paths of our soldiers who paid their emissaries for loading shell in the shape of coal and intermixing them in the fuel of our steamers who ordered an indiscriminate firing upon our transports and vessels and railroad trains regardless of whom they contained who organized and carried to a successful termination a most diabolical conspiracy to assassinate the president of the united states when we remember these things of these men may we not without hesitancy bring to light the conspiracy here charged before entering however into a discussion of the evidence let me present the law governing in case of conspiracy i quote from the very able argument of john a bingham delivered for the prosecution in the trial of the conspirators for the assassination of president lincoln whose law propositions and authorities given cannot be gainsaid 
if the conspiracy be established as laid it results that whatever was said or done by either of the parties thereto in the furtherance or execution of the common design is the declaration or act of all the other parties to the conspiracy and this whether the other parties at the time such words are uttered or such acts are done by their confederates were present or absent the declared and accepted rule of law in cases of conspiracy is that in prosecutions for conspiracy it is an established rule that where several persons are proved to have combined together for the same illegal purpose any act done by one of the party in pursuance of the original concerted plan and in reference to the common object is in the contemplation of law as well as of sound reason the act of the whole party and therefore the proof of the act will be evidence against any of the others who were engaged in the same general conspiracy without regard to the question whether the prisoner is proved to have been concerned in the particular transaction phillips on evidence page two ten the same rule obtains in cases of treason if several persons agree to levy war some in one place and some in another and one party do actually appear in arms this is a levying of war by all as well those who were not in arms as those who were if it were done in pursuance of the original concert for those who made the attempt were emboldened by the confidence inspired by the general concert and therefore these particular acts are in justice imputable to all the rest one east pleas of the crown page ninety seven roscoe eighty four in ex parte bowman and swartart four crans one twenty six marshal chief justice rules if war be actually levied that is if a body of men be actually assembled for the purpose of effecting by force a treasonable purpose all those who perform any part however minute or however remote from the scene of action and who are actually leagued in the general conspiracy are to be considered as traitors in united states v cole et al five mclean six o one mr justice mclean says a conspiracy is rarely if ever proved by positive testimony when a crime of high magnitude is about to be perpetrated by a combination of individuals they do not act openly but covertly and secretly the purpose formed is known only to those who enter into it unless one of the original conspirators betray his companions and give evidence against them their guilt can only be proved by circumstantial evidence it is said by some writers on evidence that such circumstances are stronger than positive proof a witness swearing positively it is said may misapprehend the facts or swear falsely but that circumstances cannot lie the common design is the essence of the charge and this may be made to appear when the defendants steadily pursue the same object whether acting separately or together by common or different means all leading to the same unlawful result and where prima facie evidence has been given of a combination the acts and confessions of one are evidence against all it is reasonable that where a body of men assume the attribute of individuality whether for commercial business or the commission of a crime the association should be bound by the acts of one of its members in carrying out the design it is a rule of the law not to be overlooked in this connection that the conspiracy or agreement of the parties or some of them to act in concert to accomplish the unlawful act charged may be established either by direct evidence of a meeting or consultation for the illegal purpose charged or more usually from the very nature of the case by circumstantial evidence second starkey two thirty two lord mansfield ruled that it was not necessary to prove the actual fact of a conspiracy but that it might be collected from collateral circumstances parsons case one w blackstone three ninety two 
if says a great authority on the law of evidence on a charge of conspiracy it appears that two persons by their acts are presuming the same object and often by the same means or one performing part of the act and the other completing it for the attainment of the same object the jury may draw the conclusion there is a conspiracy if a conspiracy be formed and a person join in it afterwards he is equally guilty with the original conspirators roscoe page four fifteen the rule of the admissibility of the acts and declarations of any one of the conspirators said or done in furtherance of the common design applies in cases as well where only part of the conspirators are indicted and upon trial thus upon an indictment of murder if it appear that others together with the prisoner conspire to commit the crime the act of one done in pursuance of that intention will be evidence against the rest second starkey two thirty seven they are alike guilty as principles commonwealth v knapp nine pickering four ninety six ten pickering four seventy seven six term reports five to eight eleven east five eighty four let us see what the evidences are of a common design to murder by starvation these hapless helpless wretches first then who are officers high and low civil and military whom the evidence implicates in this great crime as i shall show you by the testimony there are associated in this conspiracy as directly implicated and as perpetrators the prisoner at the bar brigadier general john h winder surgeon isaiah h white surgeon r r stevenson dr kerr captain r b winder captain reed james h duncan w w turner and ben harris remote from the scene but no less responsible than these named nay rather with a greater weight of guilt resting upon them are the leader of the rebellion his war minister his surgeon-general his commissary and quartermaster-general his commissioner of exchange and all others sufficiently high in authority to have prevented these atrocities and to whom the knowledge of them was brought chief among the conspirators and the actual participators in the crime the immediate tool first and last of the rebel government we shall see was general winder it is proper therefore that we should know who he was and the precise relations which he bore to the government which he represented we learn from many sources that he had for a long time prior to the organization of the andersonville prison been at the head of the military prisons in and around richmond holding also the position of provost-marshal of that important centre of the rebellion we learn from the witness j b jones record page twenty five thirty one manuscript page twelve nineteen that his rule as provost-marshal was almost a reign of terror that his authority was so great he could arrest men indiscriminately even in distant states and that he was constantly sustained and supported by jefferson davis and his confidential adviser and premier mr benjamin the witness cashmere record page twenty eight forty forty one manuscript page twelve twenty one the confidential detective and constant companion of general winder till the close of the rebellion says their relations those of davis and winder were very friendly indeed and very confidential i often heard general winder say so i often saw him go there and come from there about the time that general winder's reign of terror was at its climax and there was great opposition felt and expressed towards him both in and out of the rebel congress a combined effort was made to have him relieved and sent away general bragg and ransom being prominent in the movement at this time cashmere says president davis was his winder's especial friend when the order relieving general winder came from the war department he took it and went up to mr davis president davis endorsed on it as well as i can recollect that it was entirely unnecessary and uncalled for 
some time after this it was thought wise by the rebel authorities to organize the andersonville prison and the whole matter was placed in the hands of general winder by the orders issued from the war department for the purpose general winder himself did not go to andersonville till about the first of june but he sent forward as we learn from the testimony of cashmire record page twenty eight forty two manuscript page twelve twenty one of spencer record page six hundred manuscript page ten fifty six of captain wright record page seven ninety manuscript page eleven seventy seven and others his son captain w s winder of his staff as his special executive officer and as we learn from the testimony of colonel persons record page six thirteen manuscript page two fifty with absolute discretion in the location of the prison this was in the latter part of december eighteen sixty three shortly after another officer of general winder a nephew of his captain r b winder a quartermaster arrived at andersonville and assumed the duties of his office captain wright in speaking of him record page twenty four forty seven manuscript page eleven seventy seven says he told me that he had no orders to report to any quartermaster at all that he reported directly to richmond and received his instructions from richmond subsequently in the month of march eighteen sixty four general winder sent still another of his staff officers the prisoner at the bar who as we learn from his report made may eighth c x number sixteen manuscript page six fifty eight was assigned to the command of the prison on the twenty seventh of march of him colonel persons says record page six o two and following manuscript page two forty nine he came direct from richmond my understanding was by order of general winder i saw an official order to that effect i received a communication about the time captain wirtz reached there from general winder it stated that captain wirtz was an old prison officer a very reliable man and capable of governing prisoners and wound up by saying that i would give him command of the prison proper from the return of staff officers made by general winder after he had himself arrived at andersonville and who he says were acting under the orders of brigadier general john h winder commanding the post at andersonville georgia commanding the camps and stockade containing the federal prisoners of war and the guard troops for the same the prison for federal prisoners of war at macon georgia etc etc we find that dr isaiah h white also on his staff was assigned to duty at andersonville by orders of the war department at richmond as chief surgeon in charge of the prison hospital he arrived at andersonville about the same time as the two captains winder this comprises the original corps of officers sent from richmond to carry out the hellish purposes of the rebel government and which as we shall see as we advance was most faithfully done by them can there be any doubt as to what the original purpose of the rebel government was let us go to the very origin of the prison ambrose spencer testifies record page twenty four seventy two to seventy four manuscript page ten fifty six as follows i saw captain w s winder at the time he was laying out the prison i asked him if he was going to erect barracks or shelter of any kind he replied that he was not that the damned yankees who would be put in there would have no need of them i asked him why he was cutting down all the trees and suggested that they would prove a shelter to the prisoners from the heat of the sun at least he made his reply or something similar to it that is just what i am going to do i am going to build a pen here that will kill more damned yankees than can be destroyed in the front these are very nearly his words or equivalent to them how was this plan thus emphatically avowed carried out 
the stockade was located across a stream which general wilson of our army says record page fifteen thirty nine manuscript page eight twenty two would not run more water than would supply for the purposes of an army a larger command than four or five thousand men a sluggish stream as dr jones calls it which with the springs along its banks sufficient probably to supply a regiment more was the only water originally intended for the prisoners from the inside of the prison everything was taken which could in any way contribute to the comfort convenience or health of the prisoners and was never replaced by shelter neither during the burning heat of the summer which dr thornburg tells you was not much short of a hundred and fifty degrees in the sun nor the cold which followed in the winter sufficiently severe as is shown by several witnesses to freeze and which did freeze many prisoners to death it will be remembered too that not four hundred yards distant below the site selected for the stockade was a stream of water which general wilson says was ample for any number of troops a stream that could not have been exhausted and which after careful examination as he says was found to flow a volume of water equal to fifteen feet by five feet with a velocity of a mile an hour record page eighteen seventy six manuscript page eight twenty two and which colonel persons says record page six ten manuscript page two fifty it occurred to him me should have been a preferable place to the one where the prison was located adding i suggested it to w s winder i believe i recollect distinctly it was one of the winders the mere location of the prison in the absence of other facts would not perhaps of itself convey a criminal intent but when we remember what followed and certain other facts which will be presented it becomes a very important link in the chain of evidence leading to the guilt of the parties alleged it will be remembered that the immense bakehouse the only accommodation of that kind furnished for the prisoners until late in the year was located so that all the filth and garbage and offal of that place which is described as itself almost as filthy as the stockade passed directly through the prison this it is testified to by many could with equal convenience have been located elsewhere and this was suggested to captain r b winder the quartermaster at the time of its erection immediately below the stockade as appears from the evidence of dr jones dr roy and others trees were felled in the stream and brush thrown into the swamp so that the filth escaping from the prison which ought to have been allowed to pass rapidly off was here caught spread over the surface and disseminated in the soil till as these medical gentlemen say it became a prolific source of disease and sent back into the prison a horrible stench these preparations of death did not cease here but with incredible malice or with recklessness equally criminal the troops arriving at the post for the purpose of defence were encamped above the stockade and along the stream in such a manner that as many witnesses testify all the washings of the camps and overflows of the sinks during storms swept into the stockade into this horrible pen were the prisoners of war ushered and here were they confined in hopeless captivity here too for many months with all these surroundings and everything calculated to make it certain death for the sick was the hospital retained and not until after earnest protests from many officers not until after frequent representations through official channels to the rebel government through general winder who was still in richmond not until after as we learn from the testimony of colonel persons humanity impelled him to take the responsibility was the hospital removed outside and this he tells us record page thirty fifty nine manuscript page thirteen o four was done in violation of general winder's orders and was tardily acquiesced in some weeks after by an order from richmond about the time of this clamour for the removal of the hospital considerations of humanity pleaded with equal fervour for an enlargement of the stockade 
prisoners had been sent forward under orders from richmond with such rapidity and in such numbers that they could only be turned into this place like cattle until at the time we speak of within an enclosure of little more than twelve acres excluding the swamp unfit for occupation and the deadline space the frightful number of over eighteen thousand were confined protest after protest went up through many sources to general winder at richmond colonel person says record page twenty sixty one manuscript page thirteen o five we sent an objection to the authorities at richmond to general winder and urged him to hold up and not ship any more prisoners there but he paid no attention to it this seething mass of humanity with scarcely room to stand upon crying for help the more conscientious officers of the post doing all in their power to alleviate their sufferings the commanding officer notifying the rebel government what they must have known all the time that the mortality was great and must be still greater unless something should be done colonel persons was aroused upon this subject as he had been upon the matter of removing the hospital and here again he took the responsibility as he tells us record page six twenty one manuscript page two fifty eight to order an enlargement of the stockade about one-third which was done under the direction of captain wright by the prisoners themselves colonel persons says record page thirty sixty three manuscript page thirteen o six that when he saw they did not intend holding up but continued to ship more prisoners and saw that the prison was overcrowded he directed the enlargement of the prison and he says after i had finished the extension or perhaps after i have got it partly finished orders came giving me permission to do it there can be no doubt that during all this time the precise conditions of affairs at andersonville was well understood at richmond general winder to whom the entire business of organizing and conducting the prison was assigned remained in richmond as the representative of the prison at that place he was in constant correspondence with the officers on duty at andersonville as is fully shown by what has just been stated that he frequently conferred with the officers of the war department is not only reasonably inferable but is absolutely certain general cobb in his letter to the adjutant-general of may five c x number fifteen manuscript page six forty nine says i presume the character of the prison is well understood at richmond and therefore give no description of it the introduction of his letter showing that his presumption was well founded is as follows under your order to inform myself of the condition of the prison at andersonville with the view of furnishing from the reserve corps the necessary guard for its protection and safety and so forth dr eldridge in his report forwarded to richmond at the same time as general cobbs in speaking of the necessity of removing the hospital outside and endeavouring to meet the objection made at richmond says such an enclosure as i should suggest a plank fence ten feet high would require but very few additional guards as the guard appears to be the objection urged at richmond to a separate enclosure on the eighth of may eighteen sixty four the prisoner at the bar made a report to major turner who as an officer on duty pertaining to prisons connected with the war department c x number sixteen manuscript page six fifty eight in which the condition of affairs at andersonville at that date was fully set forth this report reached richmond during the same month and was submitted to the war department by general winder with the following endorsement approved and respectfully forwarded captain wirtz has proven himself to be a diligent and efficient officer whose superior in commanding prisons and incident duties i know not we all know as officers of the army that the furnishing of subsistence of the material used by quartermasters and of hospital supplies and medicine was all done either through the chiefs of those several departments at richmond acting under the supervision of the secretary of war himself or by virtue of the orders of these chiefs and of that secretary 
it is not creditable that such an immense prison as that at andersonville used as a receptacle for prisoners from all parts of the south was unknown to the richmond government and that the whole management the subsistence of the prisoners their comfort their safety everything was left in the hands of this heretofore obscure man now on trial but it is said that during these straitened times the prisoner and the other officers charged were doing all in their power to alleviate the sufferings so well known at richmond and at andersonville without stopping now to inquire what could have been done and what is shown by a cloud of witnesses to have been in their power notice a moment what was done and whether or not it was in furtherance of the conspiracy captain r b winder as we learn from captain wright's testimony record page twenty seven forty seven manuscript page eleven seventy seven came to andersonville untrammelled by any orders reported to no one but received his instructions from the quartermaster general he told captain wright that all the quartermasters had been ordered by the quartermaster general to furnish him what supplies he needed to fill his requisitions with powers thus ample he erected a few scanty miserable sheds at one end of the stockade which were then used as a hospital and were not sufficient for the sick he built a cook-house which was a prolific source of suffering and death and which was not of sufficient capacity to prepare rations for more than five thousand men properly he built a hospital enclosure with some sheds within it covered but not sided he furnished the prisoners with wood for cooking purposes as we learn at the rate of three cord sticks to a squad of ninety he managed to transfer to his private till a large amount of money sent him by his government as intimated in the testimony of captain wright he folded his arms while colonel persons enlarged the stockade and removed the hospital work which belonged exclusively to him he did this omitting to do many things that were not only in his power but which it was his duty to do leaving the post finally in the latter part of the summer taking away nearly everything as captain wright says record page twenty seven forty nine manuscript page eleven seventy eight that pertained to his department not however until by his acts of omission and commission he had become answerable for the deaths of hundreds of these unfortunate prisoners captain w s winder remained true to his purpose as declared to mr spencer and in more ways than one demonstrated how true was his declaration i am going to build a pen here that will kill more damned yankees than can be destroyed in the front dr isaiah h white an important adjunct to this scheme and indispensable to its faithful execution was at the head of the hospital whence he reported to his superior officers at richmond from time to time the dreadful and increasing mortality the prisoner now before you despite all his pretended protests at the time despite the individual and widely separated instances of humanity which have been paraded here remained as he truly said in his letter to major-general wilson which was the first item of evidence introduced in this trial the tool in the hands of his my superiors see x number one manuscript page one he had introduced himself to the prisoners by stopping their rations the first day he was on duty he had instituted between that time and the time of general winder's arrival a system of the most cruel and inhuman punishments he had made his name a terror among the prisoners and his society a reproach to his comrades upon whom he inflicted it he had established the deadline and all its accompanying horrors he had given the prisoners a foreshadowing of the stocks of the balls and chains of the chain gang of starvation as a punishment and all that black catalogue of cruelty and suffering unknown even to a draconian code he had declared to several of the prisoners engaged in the burial of the dead this is the way i give the yankees the land they came to fight for he had scores of times told the prisoners when maltreating them that he intended to starve them to death 
he had boasted that he was doing more for the confederacy than any general in the field he had paraded the chain gang for the amusement of his wife and daughters he had with drawn pistol told a prisoner who dared to complain of the rations damn you i'll give you bullets for bread are you not prepared then to believe that at the time of general winder's arrival the prisoner was in the execution of the common design with a knowledge of its object and acting in harmony with its chief instrument general winder this is andersonville in part the suffering of our prisoners in part and something of the evidence of the conspiracy begun and continued up to the time of general winder's arrival we shall see now whether the law governing this question after a recital of the facts which follow does not direct you to find a verdict of guilty you will remember that when colonel persons was on the stand he told you that assuming to do what the law and the army regulations made it the duty of the quartermaster to do and which in this case captain winder had wholly neglected to do he sent to the different sawmills along the line of the railroad for lumber moved as he tells you by a feeling of humanity and a desire to alleviate in some ways the suffering of the prisoner he says record page six o eight manuscript page two fifty two i had concentrated there i suppose about five or six train loads of lumber i suppose nearly fifty car loads i quote further from the record the following question were you permitted to erect a shelter answer i was in the act of doing so was just carrying the lumber when i was relieved question by whom answer by general winder question had he arrived on the same day answer he arrived there about that time question was your plan carried out answer i went into the stockade several times after i was relieved from duty and i saw no shelter there i saw forty or fifty houses springing up outside of the grounds the lumber disappeared in that way at this time the journal of the prison shows there were over nineteen thousand prisoners in the stockade this was the first official act of general winder on his arrival it was the third time colonel persons had given mortal offence and he was not longer to be tolerated what could more strongly present the unmitigated diabolism of that friend of president davis that man upon the order relieving whom the rebel chief wrote it is entirely unnecessary and uncalled for this was the man who found a ready advocate in the rebel premier mr benjamin and who was not only sustained from first to last by his chief but was rewarded for official conduct that will place his name amongst those of the most infamous of any age or clime general winder's second act was to establish himself comfortably and at a respectful distance from the prison where he remained from the first of june until early in the fall notice now as we advance how the sufferings of this prison increased how everything from which torture and death could result was resorted to how all those methods of inhuman punishment instituted by the prisoner were approved and sanctioned by general winder and that during the whole period of his command not a single act is recorded which does not prove him to have been not only a brutal man as mr spencer says he was but that he was the chief instrument in the hands of a wicked treasonable conspiracy to murder the prisoners of war in his custody he came there with authority unlimited with discretion to do whatever circumstances required to carry out the purposes of his command in an appeal published by him to the citizens of the surrounding counties see x number twenty seven manuscript page seven o seven he calls for two thousand negroes properly supplied with axes spades and picks and supported by the requisite number of wagons and teams for the purpose of rendering more hopeless the imprisonment of our soldiers holding over the people of that vicinity the terrors of impressment which in this appeal he claims to have authority to make yet with all this power with all these appliances at hand and within reach of his call not a single shelter did he ever erect not a ditch did he dig to drain that horrible cesspool below the stockade and within it 
not a tithe of the wood absolutely necessary did he cause to be taken into the stockade not once did he visit that place over which he had supreme control not a well did he cause to be digged within it not an order did he issue to abate one jot or tittle of the frightful rigours of that prison pen not a kindly or humane sentiment is he shown during that whole time to have uttered towards those prisoners in his custody on the contrary he scattered to the four winds as we have seen that immense pile of lumber accumulated by colonel persons for the purpose of erecting shelter in the stockade he approved all that had been done by his subordinate the prisoner even recommending him for promotion he legalized the detail of turner who was a confederate soldier to take command of a pack of hounds to run down prisoners and afterwards permanently detached him from his regiment for that purpose he authorized and ordered the hanging of six prisoners of war within the stockade which by all the laws of war was no more nor less than murder so far as he was concerned he brutally refused the philanthropic ladies of americus twice in their attempts to render assistance to the sick at the hospital even intimating on one of those occasions to those ladies of the highest respectability that a repetition of their humane efforts would bring upon themselves a punishment too infamous to be named End of part four part four of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part four closing statement of judge advocate prosecutor part five is it still contended that there was no conspiracy that these things evinced no common design to destroy that of all these things the richmond government was in blissful ignorance let us see on the twenty first of july eighteen sixty four general winder addressed a letter to the war department at richmond c x number seventeen manuscript page six six two dated andersonville in which he uses the following language before quoted you speak in your endorsement of placing the prisoners properly i do not exactly comprehend what is intended by it i know but of one way to place them and that is to put them into the stockade where they have between four and five square yards to the man is it possible that he did not comprehend what was intended by the war department can it be that he knew of but one way to place those prisoners properly his government did not dare to speak more definitely nor was it necessary to such a man as general winder occupying the position he did and with the letter of robert ould in his private desk written as early as march eighteen sixty three a private letter to himself and endorsed by his own hand the one way was the way given in his original instructions it was the way understood by w s winder when he said it was the intention to kill more yankees at andersonville than they did at the front it was the way meant and well understood by general winder when he said to mr spencer that for his own part he would as lief the damned yankees would die there as anywhere else that upon the whole he did not know that it was not better for them record page twenty four sixty seven manuscript page ten fifty four and which he afterwards disclosed to colonel chandler in the remark it is better to leave them in their present condition until their number has been sufficiently reduced by death to make the present arrangements suffice for their accommodation it was the way well understood by the rebel government when in the face of the protests of humane officers and in the face of the official reports of the mortality of that place they continued to forward prisoners trainload after trainload to an already overcrowded prison it was the way dictated to the agent of that government robert ould and revealed by him in his letter to winder see exhibit number blank manuscript page nineteen twenty when he declares speaking of exchanges 
the arrangement i have made works largely in our favour we get rid of a set of miserable wretches and receive in return some of the best material i ever saw adding this of course is between ourselves it was the way understood perfectly by general howell cobb when in a speech at andersonville he pointed with terrible significance to the graveyard remarking that is the way i would care for them it was the way well understood by the prisoner at the bar who is shown to have uttered sentiments similar to those expressed by w s winder on more than a hundred occasions it was the way and the only way ever indicated by the chief of the rebel government and his secretary of war else why did he with this frightful picture before him deliberately fold general winder's letter endorsing it noted filed j a s let us advance another step in the evidence connecting the richmond government with these atrocities colonel d t chandler of the rebel war department pursuant to an order of his chief of july twenty five eighteen sixty four directing him to make an inspection at andersonville and other places in the confederacy submitted a report dated andersonville august five eighteen sixty four and which reached the war department august seventeenth eighteen sixty four this officer from whose report we have already quoted gives a graphic description of the sufferings of the prisoners of war and in earnest terms beseeches his government that no more be sent forward to that place and that immediate steps be taken to relieve the sufferings of those prisoners already there making many practical suggestions for their comfort which he thought could be readily carried out in a supplemental report also dated august fifth and which was received in richmond with the report first named he says my duty requires me respectfully to recommend a change in the officer in command of the post brigadier-general john h winder and the substitution in his place of some one who unites both energy and good judgment with some feelings of humanity and consideration for the welfare and comfort as far as is consistent with their safe-keeping of the vast number of unfortunates placed under his control some one who at least will not advocate deliberately and in cold blood the propriety of leaving them in their present condition until their number has been sufficiently reduced by death to make the present arrangements suffice for their accommodation and who will not consider it a matter of self-laudation and boasting that he has never been inside of the stockade a place the horrors of which it is difficult to describe and which is a disgrace to civilization the condition of which he might by the exercise of a little energy and judgment even with the limited means at his command have considerably improved in his examination touching this report colonel chandler says i noticed that general winder seemed very indifferent to the welfare of the prisoners indisposed to do anything or to do as much as i thought he ought to do to alleviate their sufferings i remonstrated with him as well as i could and he used that language which i reported to the department with reference to it the language stated in the report when i spoke of the great mortality existing among the prisoners and pointed out to him that the sickly season was coming on and that it must necessarily increase unless something was done for their relief the swamp for instance drained proper food furnished and in better quantity and other sanitary suggestions which i made to him he replied to me that he thought it was better to see half of them die than to take care of the men and to show that he cannot be mistaken in what he avers colonel chandler speaks of major hall his assistant having first reported to him similar language used by general winder to him and remarks i told major hall that i thought it incredible that he must be mistaken he told me no that he had not only said it once but twice and as i have stated he subsequently made use of this expression to me let us now see what the rebel government had to do with this report as i before remarked it reached richmond on the seventeenth of august 
immediately on its reception as we learn from captain c himself of the rebel war department it was carefully briefed and extracts made and sent to the heads of the different bureaus the commissary general and the quartermaster general a report of dr white's an enclosure of colonel chandler's report being sent to the surgeon general the entire report was then laid before the secretary of war mr seddon and there cannot be a shadow of doubt that it was immediately and fully and seriously considered nor can there be any doubt that mr davis and his war minister conferred together with regard to this momentous subject captain self speaking of a conversation between himself and colonel woods a staff officer of jefferson davis in regard to the prison at andersonville says during that conversation i obtained the impression that president davis had some knowledge of it record page eleven sixty one manuscript page six fifty nine this he says again was subsequent to the receipt of colonel chandler's report to the question would a paper of this kind on a subject of this magnitude find its way to the president of the so-called confederate states in the ordinary course of proceedings he answers yes sir i think it would it will not do to say that this report was buried among the multitude of papers that arrived daily in the war office or that lay upon mr seddon's table with piles of other papers unnoticed mr j b jones private secretary to mr seddon says record page twenty eight thirty six manuscript page twelve eighteen that he remembers when the report was received but only read the headings enough to see the purport of it and adds that he thinks it was sent for by the secretary of war mr r t h keen chief of the bureau of war says that he saw it lying on the secretary's table he also speaks of a conversation between himself and the assistant secretary of war judge campbell in which the report was spoken of and in which judge campbell speaking of the fearful mortality remarked this looks very bad captain self also testifies that the report excited general comment in the department but we are not left with this evidence alone this report was not sent in like ordinary inspections report but special attention was drawn to it by three officials on the day of its receipt it was submitted to the secretary of war as the following endorsement proves beyond doubt adjutant and inspector general's office august eighteen eighteen sixty four respectfully submitted to the secretary of war the condition of the prison at andersonville is a reproach to us as a nation the engineer and ordnance departments were applied to for implements and authorized their issue and i so telegraphed general winder colonel chandler's recommendations are coincided in by order of general cooper r h chilton assistant adjutant and inspector general the report passed through the hands of r b welford a confidential clerk employed in the war department for his legal abilities who also made a brief analysis strongly recommending colonel chilton mr welford's analysis being again endorsed and the whole laid before the secretary by j a campbell assistant secretary of war with the following endorsement these reports show a condition of things at andersonville which calls very loudly for the interposition of the department in order that a change may be made j a campbell assistant secretary of war what more could have been needed or what more done to bring authoritatively and strongly before the proper authorities at richmond the subject of the andersonville sufferings here were an intelligent inspecting officer of high rank colonel chandler the chief of the inspectors bureau colonel chilton the chief of the bureau of war mr keene a confidential clerk mr welford and the assistant secretary of war judge campbell all pressing in the strongest terms the necessity of an immediate interposition by the department and not hesitating to declare the prison at andersonville a reproach to them as a nation 
these appeals might have moved hearts of stone but addressed as they were to these representatives of a government based upon wrong and injustice that had its origin in a treasonable conspiracy to overthrow the best government on the face of the earth however much they may have moved the hearts of those representatives as individuals they seem to have still felt it their duty to adhere to a purpose so cruelly and wickedly begun and thus far so faithfully carried out and they dared not or would not for it is certain they did not abandon even then this atrocious conspiracy mr Keen says he is not aware the report was ever acted upon captain self says the same and we learn from his testimony that the report remained with the secretary never having come back to the inspector-general's department where it properly belonged till about the time mr breckinridge succeeded mr seddon some time in eighteen sixty five when colonel chandler having returned and demanded that some action should be taken on the report or he would resign it was brought to light and laid before mr breckinridge who would have acted upon it as captain self thinks but for the rapid change of affairs in the confederacy and the dissolution of their government soon after and here let me diverge a moment and follow a portion of this remarkable report to the surgeon-general's office we find endorsed upon exhibit twenty four manuscript page six ninety five the following surgeon white was authorized some time since to send his requisitions for supplies directly to the medical purveyor not having supplies is his own fault he should have anticipated the wants of the sick by timely requisitions it is impossible to order medical officers in place of the contract physicians they are not to be had at present s p moore surgeon general this is the flippant endorsement of the surgeon-general and the only evidence showing his notice of the condition of things at andersonville and this is all that he seems to have done in the matter while dr white was allowed to remain in charge of the hospital which as described by the surgeons who were on duty with him seems to have been little else than a dead house this dr white whose recklessness brutality and crime are so closely interwoven with that of general winder the prisoner at the bar and his associate staff officers that it is hard to discriminate between the cruelty of the one and that of the others it is strange truly that the surgeon-general passed over the matter with so slight a notice of it when we remember that several weeks previously it is shown that he had the whole matter before his office and took action upon it which makes him no less culpable than the others we have mentioned he had called into his counsels an eminent medical gentleman of high attainments in his profession and of loyalty to the rebel government unquestionable amid all the details in this terrible tragedy there seems to me none more heartless wanton and utterly devoid of humanity than that revealed by the surgeon-general to which i am about to refer i quote now from the report of the same dr joseph jones which he says record page forty three eighty four manuscript page seventeen twenty one was made in the interest of the confederate government for the use of the medical department in the view that no eye would ever see it but that of the surgeon-general after a brief introduction to this report and to show under what authority it was made he quotes a letter from the surgeon-general dated surgeon-general's office richmond virginia august sixth eighteen sixty four the letter is addressed to surgeon i h white in charge of the hospital for federal prisoners andersonville georgia and is as follows sir the field of pathological investigation afforded by the large collection of federal prisoners in georgia is of great extent and importance and it is believed that results of value to the profession may be obtained by careful examination of the effect of disease upon a body of men subjected to a decided change of climate and the circumstances peculiar to prison life the surgeon in charge of the hospital for federal prisoners together with his assistants will afford every facility to surgeon joseph jones in the prosecution of the labors ordered by the surgeon-general 
the medical officers will assist in the performance of such post-mortems as dr jones may indicate in order that this great field for pathological investigation may be explored for the benefit of the medical department of the confederate armies s p moore surgeon general pursuant to his orders dr jones as he tells us proceeded to andersonville and on september seventeenth received the following pass andersonville september seventeenth eighteen sixty four captain you will permit surgeon joseph jones who has orders from the surgeon general to visit the sick within the stockade that are under my medical treatment surgeon jones is ordered to make certain investigations which may prove useful to his profession by order of general winder very respectfully w s winder a a g captain h wirtz commanding prison when we remember that the surgeon general had been apprised of the wants of that prison and that he had overlooked the real necessities of the prison shifting the responsibility upon dr white whom he must have known was totally incompetent it is hard to conceive with what devilish malice or criminal devotion to his profession or reckless disregard of the high duties imposed upon him i scarcely know which he could sit down and deliberately pen such a letter of instruction as that given to dr jones was it not enough to have cruelly starved and murdered our soldiers was it not enough to have sought to wipe out their very memories by burying them in nameless graves was it not enough to have instituted a system of medical treatment the very embodiment of charlatanism was not this enough without adding to the many other diabolical motives which must have governed the perpetrators of these acts this scientific object as deliberate and cold-blooded as one can conceive the surgeon-general could quiet his conscience when the matter was laid before him through colonel chandler by endorsing that it was impossible to send medical officers to take the place of the contract physicians on duty at andersonville yet he could select at the same time a distinguished gentleman of the medical profession and send him to andersonville directing the whole force of surgeons there to render him every assistance leaving their multiplied duties for that purpose why not to alleviate the sufferings of the prisoners not to convey to them one ounce more of nutritious food to make no suggestions for the improvement of their sanitary condition for no purpose of the kind but as the letter of instruction itself shows for no other purpose than that this great field for pathological investigation may be explored for the benefit of the medical department of the confederate armies the andersonville prison so far as the surgeon general is concerned was a mere dissecting room a clinic institute to be made tributary to the medical department of the confederate armies but let me return from this digression one can hardly believe all these things of a government pretending to struggle for a place among civilized nations yet horrible as it seems the facts cannot be resisted do i injustice to the leaders of the rebellion have i drawn inferences that are unwarrantable is it indeed true that these men high in authority are not responsible i think not motives are presumed from actions and actions speak louder than words what was the action of jeff davis and his war minister upon these reports the papers were pigeonholed in the secretary's office not even being dignified by being placed upon the regular files in the proper office while general winder the chief accomplice instead of being removed immediately and broken of his commission and tried for violation of the laws of war for cruelty inhumanity and murder instead of being held up by that government as a warning to others giving a color of justice to their cause was promoted rewarded and given a command of wider scope and greater power but still in a position to carry out the purposes of his government toward prisoners of war history is full of examples similar in character where a government seeking to carry out its ends has selected as tools men not unlike general winder and history 
faithful in the narration of the facts is faithful also in fixing upon the government who employed such persons and sustained and rewarded them the responsibility for the acts of their agents james the second had his jeffreys philip the second his duke of alva louis the fourteen his duke de louvet the emperor of austria his hey now and jefferson davis his winder the closest scrutiny of the immense record of this trial will show that up to the very close of that prison there were no steps taken by the rebel government by general winder or by any of the officers of his staff clothed with proper authority to alleviate in any material particular the great sufferings of that place you will remember the uniform testimony of the medical officers as well as of the prisoners who remained there during the winter of eighteen sixty four and eighteen sixty five that there was no perceptible change in the condition of the prison and an examination of the hospital register and the death register will show that the mortality was even greater during that period in proportion to the number of prisoners confined than it was during the months of its most crowded condition from the prison journal kept by the prisoner himself we find that in september the mean number of prisoners being seventeen thousand the deaths were two thousand seven hundred in october the mean strength being about six thousand seven hundred the number of deaths was one thousand five hundred and sixty nearly one out of every five in november the mean strength being two thousand three hundred the deaths were four hundred and eighty five while those who remained to the very close till the prison was broken up are described by general wilson and others as having been mere skeletons shadows of men nor must it be forgotten that the marks of this cruelty were so indelibly stamped upon its victims that thousands who survived are yet cripples and will carry to their graves the evidence of the horrible treatment to which they were subjected the surgeons of our army who treated those shadows of men when they arrived within our lines at jacksonville and hilton head tell you of hundreds who died before they could be resuscitated of others permanently disabled of others who upon their partial recovery were started on their way homeward being again treated at annapolis dr van der Kieft of our army speaks of the condition of those prisoners while under his treatment at that place he says they were reduced suffering from chronic diarrhoea and scurvy some of them in a dying condition some of them died a few days after they arrived and those who did recover were obliged to remain a long time in hospital before they were able to return to their homes record page five o five manuscript page two o seven and with that certainty with which science reasons from effect to cause oftentimes after describing the condition of the men as it has been brought out in this testimony he concludes the symptoms and conditions of the patients presented cases of starvation nor must it be forgotten in the summing up of the cumulative proofs of the andersonville horrors that numerous photographs of returned prisoners were introduced here and identified by doctors vanderkrieff balzer and others as representing cases no worse than hundreds and thousands they had seen so impressive indeed and so strong seemed this evidence of rebel cruelty that the counsel for the prisoners sought in his cross-examination to show that they were fancy sketches are we told that these things are improbable and cannot be believed because it is said that mr davis is a good man not capable of such cruelty are we told that no direct order of his is shown and therefore notwithstanding all these facts and circumstances narrated he must be acquitted of all blame the law governing cases of conspiracy does not require us to show a direct order circumstances from which guilt may be inferred are sufficient the rebel chief did not find it necessary to issue direct instructions nor indeed could it reasonably be expected he was too wary too sagacious for that michelet relates an anecdote of louis the fifteenth not malapropos the illustrious quesnay physician to louis fifteen who lived in the house of the latter at versailles saw the king one day rush in suddenly and felt alarmed 
madame de hosette the witty femme de chambre inquired of him why he seemed so uneasy madame returned he whenever i see the king i say to myself there is a man who can cut my head off oh said she he is too good the lady's maid thus summed up in one word the guarantees of monarchy the king was too good to cut the man's head off that was no longer agreeable to custom but he could with one word send him to the bastille and there forget him it remains to be seen whether it is better to perish with one blow or suffer a lingering death for thirty or forty years mr davis was not capable of being the instrument of death he was too good to be keeper of a prison and withhold from starving men their scanty rations but he could send them out of his sight away from the prison in plain view of his own residence into the dense forests of georgia and there forget them if jefferson davis be ever brought to trial for his many crimes and may heaven spare the temple of justice if he be not it will not do for him to upbraid and accuse his willing tools winder and wirtz as king john did hubert for the death of prince arthur they will turn upon him and say here is your hand and seal for all i did and in the winking of authority did we understand a law end of part five part four of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part four closing statement of judge advocate prosecutor part six the law of nations before advancing further in the argument let us define briefly the laws of war which it is alleged by the government in its indictment against this prisoner and his co-conspirators have been inhumanly and atrociously violated one would suppose that an enlightened conscience need not consult the opinions of writers upon law or ethics to determine the violation of rules governing civilized warfare with sufficient certainty to condemn the treatment of prisoners at andersonville yet as the averment is traversed by the prisoner and it is insisted that no violation of the humane principle governing nations in war is shown i must trespass upon the court a moment before proceeding in the forum of nations there is a higher law a law paramount to any rule of action prescribed by either of them and which cannot be abrogated or nullified by either whatever the peculiar forms or rights of this or that government its subjects acquire no control or power other than is sanctioned by the great tribunal of nations we turn then to the code international where the purest morals the highest sense of justice the most exalted principles of ethics are the cornerstones that we may learn to be guided in our duties to this prisoner grotius derived the jus gentium from the practice of nations and living in an age when the greatest cruelties were practised in the operations of warfare his rules as laid down often seem to have been the inspiration of barbarity itself rather than laws which should govern nations yet even he in books three and four insists that all acts of violence which have no tendency to obtain justice or terminate the war are at variance both with the duty of the christian and with humanity itself manning an author of great force and clearness says page one sixty four at the present day a mild and humane treatment exists with regard to prisoners of war which is perhaps in some degree attributable to the deference paid to the writings of vatel who appeared to have been the first author who established the true principle upon which prisoners should be treated he says that as soon as your enemy has laid down his arms and surrendered his person you have no longer any right over his life unless he should give you such right by some new attempt or had before committed against you a crime deserving death 
prisoners of war he says may be secured but cannot be made slaves unless for personal guilt which deserves death nor be slain unless we be perfectly assured that our safety demands such a sacrifice after having discussed at some length this subject he sums up the whole question thus page one sixty five it may be remarked in conclusion that the same principles which have been appealed to in the preceding chapter afford also a clue to the right treatment of prisoners of war the usages of former ages proceeded from the supposition that any violence was allowed in warfare and that the rights of the victor upon the vanquished were unlimited and that having the right to deprive his antagonist of life the captor had a right to impose any treatment more lenient than death upon his prisoner but we have seen that so far from the rights of the belligerent being unlimited the law of nature strictly limits them to such violence as is necessary that thus when an antagonist no longer resists there can no longer be any right to use violence towards him and that whenever the purposes of warfare are not frustrated by the granting of quarter the belligerent cannot refuse to give quarter without a direct violation of the law of nature which warrants no further hardships towards prisoners than is required by the purposes of safe custody and security another author remarks prisoners of war are indeed sometimes killed but this is no otherwise justifiable than it is made necessary either by themselves if they make use of force against those who have taken them or by others who make use of force in their behalf and render it impossible to keep them and as we may collect from the reason of the thing so it likewise appears from common opinion that nothing but the strongest necessity will justify such an act for the civilized and thinking part of mankind will hardly be persuaded not to condemn it till they see the absolute necessity of it rutherford's institutes page five twenty five kent in speaking of the barbarous usages of war checked and done away with by the progress of civilization says public opinion as it becomes enlightened and refined condemns all cruelty and all wanton destruction of life and property as equally useless and injurious and it controls the violence of war by the energy and severity of its reproaches grotius he says even in opposition to many of his own authorities and under a due sense of the obligations of religion and humanity placed bounds to the ravages of war and mentioned that many things were not fit and commendable though they might be strictly lawful and that the law of nature forbade what the law of nations meaning thereby the practices of nations tolerated montesquieu he says insisted that the laws of war give no other power over a captive than to keep him safely and that all unnecessary rigour is condemned by the reason and conscience of mankind battle he says has entered largely into the subject and he argues with great strength and reason and eloquence against all unnecessary cruelty all base revenge and all mean and perfidious warfare and he recommends his benevolent doctrine by the precepts of exalted ethics and sound policy and by illustrations drawn from some of the most pathetic and illustrious examples to the same effect writes wheaton page five eighty six and halleck page blank so strongly did the principles here laid down impress themselves upon our government that during general jackson's administration mr livingston then secretary of state instructed mr buchanan our minister in russia to insert in the treaty proposed to be negotiated stipulations in order to restrain citizens or subjects of the one or the other of the high contracting parties respectively from infringing any of the known rules of modern warfare and among other things mentions for injuries offered to the bearers of flags of truce for the massacre of prisoners who have surrendered for the mutilation of the dead 
for other breaches either of this treaty or of the laws of nations for preserving peace or lessening the evils of war the object of this mr livingston said was to express a national reprobation of the doctrine which considers a state of war as one of declared hostilities between every individual of the belligerent nations respectively to massacre an unresisting and unarmed enemy to poison his provisions and water to assassinate a prisoner and other similar acts are universally acknowledged to be breaches of international law and to justify retaliation and an increase of the horrors of war ex doc number one 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 first session thirty third congress h r it would seem that these teachings so long recognized so long practised by civilized nations ought to have found some advocate even among the councils of treason whatever the form of government may have been to which the leaders of the confederacy so called aspired whatever of wrong and injustice they sought to embody in their system with whatever of oppression and tyranny they sought to grind down their subjects the moment they asked a place among nations they were bound to recognize and obey those laws international which are and of necessity must be applicable alike to all with what detestation then must civilized nations regard that government whose conduct has been such as characterized this pretended confederacy an ordinary comprehension of natural right the faintest desire to act on principles of common justice would have dictated some humane action would have extorted from some official a recognition of international rules of conduct it was not retaliation for they had the example of our government in sending to their homes on parole whole armies that had been captured it was not punishment for these unfortunate prisoners had been taken in honourable battle it was not ignorance of the law for they had constantly with them all those great lights just quoted and if these failed to convince they could have found recorded back of these if thine enemy hunger feed him and still further back they might have found an example worthy of imitation which i cannot refrain from here giving a large number of syrians had been by a cunning piece of strategy taken captive and became prisoners of war whereupon the following dialogue occurred and the king of israel said unto elisha when he saw them my father shall i smite them shall i smite them and he answered thou shalt not smite them wouldst thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master and he prepared great provisions for them and when they had eaten and drunk he sent them away and they went to their master second kings chapter seven no gentlemen it was not retaliation punishment nor ignorance of the law it was the intrinsic wickedness of a few desperate leaders seconded by mercenary and heartless monsters of whom the prisoner before you is a fair type cruelties practised towards prisoners thus far we have not pretended to enter with any particularity into the questions of the cruel treatment of prisoners there may be two objects or two reasons for at this time dwelling more in detail upon the conduct of the prisoner these are first to connect him more certainly with the conspiracy and second to enable us more understandingly to examine the second charge here as at other points in the argument i desire only to present the evidence avoiding all embellishment and all augmentation for this case must be decided upon the facts proven and not the colouring of counsel i cannot hope to recapitulate all the facts bearing upon this point as it will be remembered that each day's record bears witness to an accumulation of horrible details which there can be no necessity for now repeating and to give all of which would require almost the entire proceedings to be duplicated we may however perhaps to some purpose 
present briefly the proofs of each phase of cruelty alleged stopping of rations it will be remembered that upon the first day of the arrival of the prisoner at andersonville and of his taking charge of the prison the rations of the whole camp were stopped for no other reason than to facilitate him completing the rolls and roster of the prisoners the testimony on this point is so widespread and comes from so many sources from witnesses on the defence as well as from witnesses on the part of the government that the fact cannot be denied nothing but the strongest necessity after all other means had been exhausted could justify a measure of this character for no other purpose than that alleged in defence merely to secure a correct account of the prisoners an intelligent and humane mind can conceive of very many methods that would suggest themselves before a resort to such an extreme measure as this there was an impassable stream made so by the swamps bounding it running through nearly the centre of the stockade at that time there was only about eight thousand prisoners in the stockade if it was merely the desire of the prisoner to correct his roles and not to inflict a cruel punishment upon the prisoners many of whom were then reduced to mere skeletons by the deprivations and exposure to which they had been subjected at bell island and in other prisons what was there to prevent him from placing them all on one side of that stream and transporting them counting them as they crossed the bridge to the other side this is one of many simple means that could have been resorted to without depriving the prisoners of any part of their scanty rations but as we advance in the testimony and follow this prisoner through the many succeeding months of torture inflicted by him we cannot resist the conclusion that this was intended only as the beginning of greater sufferings and greater punishments we find also from the concurrent testimony of all the witnesses both for the prosecution and the defence that a rule was daily established and adhered to throughout stopping the rations of a whole squad of ninety or a division of three nineties whenever upon the roll-call it was discovered that any one man of that squad or division was absent and could not be accounted for this occurred times too numerous to mention as we learn from the testimony of many witnesses the same witnesses have also informed us that it was absolutely impossible owing to the peculiar circumstances which were themselves the result of their treatment and the result of the common design to destroy to prevent an unbroken number at roll-call or give satisfactory excuse for the absence of particular prisoners we know that diarrhoea and dysentery prevailed to an alarming extent that prisoners were compelled to go to the stream for the purpose of defecation that often they would fall by the way or be compelled to remain at the sinks or owing to their sickness and debility and the crowded state of the prison would be totally unable to return to their quarters this the sergeants could not and did not always know or if they did and gave it as an excuse it was not received as satisfactory the order of the prisoner in such cases was to stop the rations of the whole ninety as a punishment thus imposing undeserved suffering i will not say upon the innocent because all were innocent but upon the unoffending as well as upon those who were classed as offenders but who were not such because they were governed by an overpowering necessity all the cases were most cruel and inhuman violations of the laws of war so well defined and in violation also of every principle of justice and humanity you will remember that the rations of the whole stockade were stopped july third and fourth for the alleged reason that information had been given of numerous prisoners intending about that time to tunnel out of that horrible pen the order being that no rations should be issued to the camp till the culprits as they were called could be found and given up many of the witnesses told you they had been promised double rations on independence day and they were expecting to celebrate the occasion the third of july came and no rations the fourth came and no rations 
and instead of jollification and feasting starvation and suffering were theirs instead of a universal jubilee they were all compelled to turn spy and inform on their own comrades who were doing no more than their duty required of them to their government or submit to further torture of their prison-keeper who can know the consequences of such rigorous treatment who shall say that scores of these men thus shut off from even their inadequate supplies did not owe their deaths directly to the hands of this prisoner the dead line while treating of the rigors of prison life at andersonville let us here notice for a moment the establishment of the dead line without stopping to dwell upon the fact that the strip twenty feet wide extending around the entire enclosure needlessly taken from the area allotted to the prisoners was of itself a cause of great suffering as it necessarily deprived the prisoners of that much room let us notice to what extent it was resorted to as a means of death to our soldiers the order was absolute and imperative and came directly from the prisoner at the bar to his subalterns and the guards on duty at the stockade that any prisoner of war crossing the dead line should be shot i do not pretend to claim that the mere establishment of such a line or the orders given with regard to it of themselves constituted crime or of themselves show any criminal intent for we know as soldiers that lines are drawn around encampments beyond which soldiers are not allowed to pass that there are picket lines to armies which cannot be penetrated except in violation of orders that where as in this case a prison is overcrowded some such measure may be necessary for the safety of the prisoners but what we complain of and what we insist was a barbarous violation of every principle governing in like cases was the utter recklessness with which these orders were enforced the shooting of prisoners who were not in any way attempting to escape but who by accident in that crowded place might happen to be pushed upon that line or who might reach under it for a piece of bread or to regain any little articles of their own which they had accidentally dropped or who were attempting at the stream to reach under this line to obtain a cup of water when all outside of it was reeking with impurity that in cases of this kind with the full knowledge and approval of the prisoner and not only that but by his direct orders these hapless soldiers were fired upon it will be remembered that during the whole course of this trial no instance has been shown where a soldier confined in the andersonville stockade was shot at the dead line while making any attempt to escape while the cases are numerous some of which will be hereafter noticed under charge second where prisoners wholly unoffending were shot the law governing in cases of this kind is as well defined as the law upon any other point and it will be seen upon an examination that nothing would justify a soldier on duty in shooting a prisoner under his charge unless the prisoner was attempting to escape or the guard had reasonable cause to believe that that was his purpose every act of shooting which resulted in death under the orders given in this instance was murder on the part of the officer giving the order and of the soldier executing it a case in point is given in scott's dictionary page two sixty seven ensign maxwell was tried in eighteen o seven before the high court of justiciary of scotland for the murder of charles cotier a french prisoner of war at greenlow by improperly ordering john low a sentinel to fire into a room where cotier and other prisoners were confined and so causing him to be mortally wounded maxwell was in charge of three hundred prisoners of war the building in which they were confined was of no great strength and afforded some possibility of escape to prevent which the prisoners being turbulent an order was given that all lights were to be put out at nine o'clock if not done at the second call the guard would fire upon the prisoners due notice having been given them on the night in question there was a tumult in prison maxwell's attention being drawn to it he observed a light burning beyond the appointed hour and twice ordered it to be put out 
this order not being obeyed he directed the sentry to fire which he did cotier receiving a mortal wound maxwell was found guilty with recommendation to mercy and was sentenced to nine months imprisonment it is laid down a book of authority that if a ship's sentinel shoot a man because he persists in approaching the side of the vessel when he has been ordered not to do so it will be murder unless such an act be for the ship's safety ibid two sixty eight the case of rex versus thomas sustains this opinion the case of maxwell is similar in many respects to instances of shooting on the dead line given in evidence and bears directly upon the guilt of the prisoner at the bar the case of rex versus thomas bears directly upon the soldier in the reckless carrying out of the orders given with regard to the dead line i would fail in my duty if i were not to notice in this connection a feature of this dead line which has been indignantly denied by the counsel for the prisoner but which is too strongly proved for us to resist belief and that is the inducement held out to the guards by the promise of a furlough to every one who should shoot a union prisoner at the deadline the evidence of this is both direct and circumstantial some of the witnesses heard the prisoner at the bar speak of it as a fact i shall not repeat the language he used on those occasions as it was profane and vulgar others give the declarations of the guards at the time of shooting prisoners which was properly admitted by the court as a part of the res geste still others speak of its being the custom almost universally to relieve a guard soon after his having shot a prisoner one of them it will be remembered speaks of the guard calling for the corporal immediately upon shooting a prisoner and states that the corporal came went away again and in a few moments returned with a sentinel who relieved the one then on the post the rebel soldiers who were here as witnesses testify that although they never knew of a case where a furlough was granted for that cause yet it was talked of among the troops at the post an examination of the record will show that at least forty witnesses have testified to these facts the name of whom it is hardly necessary to mention when we remember the horrors of that place and the many modes of cruelty resorted to the systematic starvation of prisoners the recklessness of life and the absence of all humanity in the conduct of the prison it is not difficult to believe even this to be true it is said for the defence by officers who were on duty at andersonville that they never knew or heard of a case where a soldier received a furlough for this cause this may be true and the fact remains as claimed the officers who testified were not the officers in all cases who granted furloughs some of them were required to approve but none of them had this matter of furloughs in their hands they did not pretend to deny that such furloughs might have been granted without their knowledge they did not pretend to deny that in cases of this kind the reasons for granting the furloughs would not be given upon paper they did not pretend to deny that soldiers procured furloughs through the influence of the prisoner indeed they said that under the organization of that prison even officers of the rank of colonel on duty with the troops received their leaves of absence through the prisoner who was himself but a captain this negative evidence the only evidence presented by the defence cannot explain away circumstances so plainly pointing to guilt may not the reward thus given explain to this court the fact that in no instance was a prisoner of war shot in the act of escaping or under the circumstances justifying the sentinel in supposing that to be the intention of the prisoner shot and may it not explain the criminal recklessness in this particular shown throughout the whole trial the stocks there was another mode of punishment instituted at that prison and carried on under the direction of this prisoner which we must notice and that is the stocks these implements of torture were of two kinds in the one the prisoner was lashed to a wooden framework his arms extended at right angles from his body and his feet closely fastened and in this condition unable to move either hand or foot 
he was compelled to stand erect or as was sometimes the case to lie upon the ground with his face turned upwards exposed to the heat of the sun and to the rain in the other the prisoner's feet were fastened in a wooden frame and so much elevated above the centre of gravity that it was difficult for him to sit and he was therefore compelled to lie on his back with his face exposed to the sun this was a favourite mode of punishment with the prisoner witnesses have given very many harrowing and frightful pictures of his tortures martin e hogan tells us page three twenty manuscript page two fifteen i escaped from the prison about the eighth of october and was captured about two days afterwards and brought back after some of the most profane abuse from captain wirtz that i ever heard from the lips of man i was ordered to the stocks i was fastened at the neck and ankles and left for sixty-eight hours without food except such as was stolen to me by my paroled comrades j r acuff a prisoner who had escaped by bribing a guard and who was afterwards caught by dogs and returned to andersonville says page eighteen eighty five manuscript page four sixty six i was taken to captain wirtz he ordered me into the stocks i was put into the stocks with my hands fastened by a board and my arms stretched out i was kept in the hot broiling sun for thirty-six hours i had nothing to eat and but two drinks of water when i appealed to captain wirtz about it he told me to dry up or he would blow my damned brains out that i deserved to be hung after i was taken out of the stocks i was ironed i had shackles fastened around each leg an iron ring and a bar of iron between my legs thomas joseph adler page twelve ten manuscript page five thirty one says i know of one man who was lying senseless in the stocks for three hours before they would take him out the order was to leave him till captain wirtz ordered him taken out the captain was nowhere to be found and the guard did not dare to take him out and he lay five or six hours in the stocks until captain wirtz came and they took him out he was in there for trying to make his escape thomas n way having attempted to escape was captured by dogs and brought back and was taken to headquarters he says page twelve twenty five manuscript page five fifty captain wirtz said i am going to take care of you this time i put you in the stocks for four days he was so confined and upon the same page in answer to the question explain what was the effect of the stocks upon you he says it was very severe i was laid on my back with my feet and arms in the stocks so that i could only move my head my face was right upwards to the sun i was four hours in and one hour out during the twenty-four hours william m peebles a rebel employee at andersonville says i was passing around one day during a hard storm and i saw a prisoner in the stocks he seemed to be near drowned i rode up and put an umbrella over him i passed up to captain wirtz's headquarters and told him the prisoner was there and might drown he remarked let him drown using an oath his words as well as i can remember were let the damn yankee drown i do not care in a few minutes afterwards some one from his headquarters went down and released the prisoner this is the testimony of a few which is confirmed by the stories of many others this mode of punishment was resorted to on the most trivial occasions and for the most trivial offences usually however in cases where prisoners had attempted to escape or had made their escape and been recaptured is there any defence for this barbarous method of punishment was not the punishment wholly out of proportion to the violation of prison rules can it be defended upon any known laws of war when colonel chandler a rebel officer was put upon the stand page sixteen ten manuscript page seven forty two he was asked this question in your report you speak of paragraph four of the rule submitted by captain wirtz which you did not approve can you tell us what that paragraph was his reply was i cannot speak positively as to that 
my impression now is that it had reference to punishing men who attempted to escape i remember having a conversation with general winder on this subject and calling his attention to the fact that it was the duty of a soldier to his country to escape if he could and that it was his winder's duty to keep him to prevent his escape but not to punish him for doing his duty and he concurred in that colonel chandler stated what all writers lay down as the law upon this subject see woolsey's international law section one twenty eight hefton one twenty nine polson's principles of law of nations forty two the prisoners then in attempting to escape were not committing an offence but were in the exercise of a duty they owed not only to their own self-preservation but to the government they served and the infliction of infamous disgraceful and cruel punishment for the exercise of this right was as illegal as it was barbarous it would have been lawful to shoot down a prisoner of war in the act of escape or in the act of trying by force or stealth to pass the guard but having escaped and being recaptured and in the power of his captors that moment it was the captor's duty to protect and save him from violence rather than inflict upon him such tortures as we have described the chain gang another mode of punishment not less cruel and infamous than the stocks was the chain gang and the use of balls and chain jasper culver describes this relic of barbarism he says i saw twelve men in the chain gang chained together under guard they came down to the bakery to wash i gave them some water in pails to wash and also carried their rations to them from the bakery i saw them almost every day for over a month or six weeks they were together i may remark here that the witnesses concur in the statement that the chain gang was a permanent thing but that the men composing it were changed from time to time some being taken out and others substituted the witness continues they were chained in two files with a thirty-two pound ball chained to each outside leg of the file on the right side and on the left leg of the left file then they were chained to what seemed to be two one hundred pound balls at least they called them one hundred pounders there were three men in each file with chains attached to each one of these one hundred pound balls they had also a band of iron riveted around each man's neck and a chain attached from one man to another if one man moved the whole twelve had to move the prisoners were thus confined for offences similar to those before mentioned often as we learn when sick and at all times with a total disregard of any precautions against exposure or any provision for their subsistence the mind needs no aid to discover at once the severity of such punishment nor does the conscience need to be quickened by being reminded of the law in order to condemn this shockingly brutal practice other punishments another means of punishment not greatly differing from this was the use of the ball and chain which was a sort of adjunct to the chain gang and a part of it and need not be dwelt upon there were still other modes of punishment and tortures which must not be overlooked these were bucking and gagging tying up by the thumbs flogging on the bare back and chaining to posts and trees the first of these is inflicted by fastening a stick in the mouth so as to keep the mouth constantly open the hands are then tied together and placed over the knees and a stick is passed over the arms and under the legs bending the victim almost double thomas n way after describing this punishment page twelve sixty two manuscript page five fifty one says the result is that you cannot speak it is pretty severe punishment i have seen a hundred men or more punished in that way from the same witness we learn something of the cruelty of tying up by the thumbs in reply to the question state what you know of your knowledge with regard to personal acts of cruelty committed by him the prisoner at andersonville page twelve fifty four manuscript page five four nine he says i know what he did to myself 
i was in the stocks eight or ten days i was bucked and gagged a day and a half i was tied up by the thumbs for fifteen minutes because i was sick and unable to fall in to roll call question was all this by order of captain wirtz answer yes sir i heard him give the orders question describe the punishment of being tied up by the thumbs answer i was taken and held up with my arms elevated a guard took me on each side i could not stand myself they tied my thumbs by strings and then let me hang with my feet some distance from the ground the whole weight of my body on my thumbs i could not use my hands for two months afterwards several instances of flogging have been testified to captain honeycutt a rebel soldier on duty at andersonville says i saw one of them the prisoners of war whipped i did not count the strokes but to the best of my knowledge it was about twenty-five or thirty he was a white man i saw a man come from captain wirtz's quarters who took him out and whipped him he was a prisoner who had attempted to escape by blackening his face and passing out of the stockade among a squad of negro laborers this person vincentia bardo was subsequently put upon the stand as a witness for the defence the object of the counsel for the prisoner in calling him was it is supposed for the purpose of discrediting a government witness who said he thought the prisoner himself applied the lash or gave the order bardo however says that after his capture he was sent down to the front of the dutch captain's quarters he then states a lieutenant i don't know his name asked me what i was doing around there then he took hold of me and took me and put me in the stocks the stocks came around my neck and my hands were stretched out he gave me twenty-five lashes on my back when i was taken out of the stocks i was put in the stockade for four hours then put in the stocks again for four hours and then i was put in the stockade again it is immaterial who inflicted the lashes the fact not being doubted that it was done by the prisoner's orders as we learn from other witnesses it will be remembered that two other prisoners colored soldiers were given by orders of the prisoner two hundred and fifty lashes each on the bare back one of these men was punished because he refused to work in the entrenchments owing to sickness resulting from a wound he had received in battle and the other for the alleged offence of forging a pass whipping as a punishment was long since abolished in the navy by act of congress and prohibited in the army by general orders that it should have been revived at andersonville is not strange when we reflect upon the many and more severe modes of punishment adopted the last in the catalogue of punishments which we shall notice here is described by the witness de la bombe record page nineteen thirty three manuscript page eight fifty nine and the incident occurred in the month of december eighteen sixty four speaking of one of his fellow prisoners he says i saw him tied with iron collar around his neck to a post as i was passing i heard this man say something to captain wirtz whereupon captain wirtz said one word more and i will blow your damned brains to hell holding a pistol towards his head the witness then presented to the court a pencil sketch of the scene representing the guard with drawn sabre and the prisoner with his pistol in his hand the evidence presents many phases of these differing modes of punishment which i will not torture myself or you by here presenting it was a system not only illegal and in violation of all the laws of war but cruel inhuman and damning to its perpetrators in no instance given in this record was there a provocation for a single act of this kind it will not do to say that some of these modes of punishment were resorted to in armies it will not do to say that they are legalized by state laws of the south in the case of criminals it will not do to say that the discipline of that prison required rigors of this kind the relations sustained by prisoners of war to their captors present a case quite different from either of those mentioned in the barbarous ages we learn from vital and grotius that prisoners of war became the property of the captors and could be sold or put to death at his will 
but the progress of civilization modified this manifestly unjust rule substituting those already referred to from these it will be seen that the relation is a fiduciary one imposing an obligation upon the captor wholly at variance with such cruelties as have just been recounted a prisoner of war does not become a criminal until he commits a crime and the captor has no right to inflict upon him the punishment of criminals until he shall have committed a crime and not then until after trial and conviction before a proper tribunal End of part six part four of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution by united states army staff judge advocate part four closing statement of judge advocate prosecutor part seven use of hounds in this connection as further illustrating the barbarous treatment of our soldiers and the cruelty of the prisoner at the bar as well as systematic violation of the laws of war at andersonville it seems proper to notice the method adopted for recapturing prisoners the court will remember that the counsel for the prisoner laid great stress on the fact that a law existed in the state of georgia authorizing the use of dogs for the capture of fugitive slaves and attempt was made to prove by judge hall the witness who testified to this fact that a justice of the supreme court of that state had made a decision sustaining the law the court very properly excluded the evidence but i will give the prisoner the benefit of the decision it was made by justice lumpkin and is another evidence of the extent to which a naturally strong mind may be warped and turned from a strict view of justice when compelled to square it with the system of slavery the case referred to is moran v davis eighteen volume georgia reports the facts are substantially these a negro ran away and was pursued by dogs and in trying to escape from them plunged into a creek and was drowned the slave had been hired to the man who pursued him and the owner brought suit for the value of the negro the court below held that the hirer or overseer had no right to chase the slaves with such dogs as may lacerate or materially injure the slave should he do so he will be responsible to the owner for all damage that may ensue to the slave exceptions were made to the rulings of the court and on appeal justice lumpkin reversed the decision remarking the south has already lost sixty thousand slaves worth between twenty-five and thirty millions of dollars instead therefore of relaxing the means allowed by law for the security and enjoyment of this species of property the facilities afforded for its escape and the temptation and encouragement held out to induce it constrain us willingly or otherwise to redouble our vigilance and to tighten the cords that bind the negro to his condition of servitude a condition he adds with a flourish of rhetoric and a shameful distortion of scripture which is to last if the apocalypse be inspired to the end of time unfortunately for the argument of counsel prisoners of war are not property neither are they slaves and with all his adroitness he can hardly torture this case to his purpose especially in view of the fact that the decision was given in support of a relic of the dark ages now happily passed away when two nations are at war neither has a right to prescribe a code of laws for the other a moment's reflection will show the injustice of such a thing but both are governed by a higher law than that prescribed by either that is the law governing civilized nations and it seems to me that no refinement of reasoning is necessary to show that judge lumpkin's decision given in the interest of barbarism is plainly in violation of the rules of enlightened civilization 
dogs were kept at andersonville from the organization to the close of the prison and of this the rebel government had notice from several sources dr eldridge reported it as we learn from exhibit number fifteen a manuscript page six five four the prisoner also reported it as we learn from exhibit number thirteen mr benjamin harris and a man named w w turner were employed and paid for this despicable business the first named a citizen was a professional negro catcher who kept a pack of hounds for that purpose the other was a detailed soldier detailed by order of general winder and paid as an extra duty man see testimony of colonel fannin captain wright and ambrose spencer these hounds were fed with provisions taken from the cook-house and furnished the prisoners of war taken too from the scanty supply issued by the commissary for those prisoners see testimony of jasper culver they were mustered into the military service of the rebel government the same as cavalry horses see testimony of colonel gibbs commandant of the post at andersonville they were of two kinds tracking hounds and catch dogs and if anything were wanting to show the deliberate purpose to injure prisoners by resorting to this means of capture it would be found in the presence of these packs of hounds of catch dogs which are described by many as fierce and bloodthirsty if there had been no desire to injure why were they used at all they have none of those qualities peculiar to the tracking they run only by sight and has been testified to always remain with the pursuer until approaching a prisoner the tracking hounds would have been sufficient to discover the prisoners and as they are usually harmless would have served the purpose of the pursuer and at the same time inflicted no injury upon the pursued the evidence however convinces one that this was only another means of putting prisoners of war out of the way the prisoner at the bar frequently accompanied harris and turner in their chases after prisoners and as we shall see hereafter gloated over the pain inflicted by those bloodthirsty beasts cannot we safely stop here and ask that the prisoner at the bar be recorded as one of the conspirators i know that it is urged that during all this time he was acting under general winder's orders and for the purpose of argument i will concede that he was so acting a superior officer cannot order a subordinate to do an illegal act and if a subordinate obey such an order and disastrous consequences result both the superior and the subordinate must answer for it general winder could no more command the prisoner to violate the laws of war than could the prisoner do so without orders the conclusion is plain that where such orders exist both are guilty and a fortiori where the prisoner at the bar acted upon his own motion he was guilty you cannot conclude that this prisoner was not one of the conspirators because he is not shown to have been present and to have acted in concert with all the conspirators if he was one of the conspiracy to do an illegal thing it matters not whether he knew all his co-conspirators or participated in all that they did it is not necessary to prove any direct concert or even meeting of the conspirators a concert may be proved by evidence of a concurrence of the acts of the prisoner with those of others convened together by a correspondence in point of time and in their manifest adaptation to effect the same object starkey's evidence page three twenty three and four these rules of law place beyond doubt the guilt of the prisoner for in every respect there is plainly discoverable a correspondence of time and a manifest adaptation to effect the same object in all that he did and these principles apply not only to the prisoner but to all others on duty at andersonville whose acts concurred with those of others of the conspiracy and were adapted to effect the same object 
the prisoner at the bar appeals to you through his letter of may seventh directed to general wilson and asks shall i now bear the odium and men who were prisoners here have seemed disposed to wreak their vengeance upon me for what they have suffered who was only the medium or i may better say the tool in the hands of my superiors strongly as it may strike you that strict justice would require the punishment of the arch-conspirator himself strongly as this wreck of a man with body tortured by disease and over whom already gather the shadows of death may appeal to your sympathies you cannot stop the course of justice or refuse to brand his guilt as the law and evidence direct while i would not dignify the chief conspirators in this crime without a name by associating with them the prisoner at the bar yet he and they so closely connected as they are must share the same fate before the bar of a righteously indignant people nothing can ever separate them and nothing should prevent their names going down to history in common infamy i have said that philip the second had his alva that jefferson davis had his winder i might add that the duke of alva had his de vargas and winder his Wirtz. as the duke of alva rises out of the mists of history the agent of a powerful prince so winder stands out with fearful distinctness no less perfect for his willing obedience to the government he served than for his skill to devise and ability to select agents as capable to execute the refinements of cruelty nor does the parallel cease here has not history repeated itself in making Wirtz a man cast in the same mould as the infamous de vargas a hand to execute with horrible enthusiasm what his superior had the genius to suggest motley tells us in his rise of the dutch republic volume two page one forty of these men alva and de vargas whose spirits after the pythagorean theory seemed to have centuries afterwards infused themselves into the bodies of this prisoner and his immediate superior winder he says of the subordinates of alva del rio was a man without character or talent a mere fool in the hands of his superior but juan de vargas was a terrible reality no better man could have been found in europe for the post to which he was thus elevated to shed human blood was in his opinion the only important business and the only exhilarating pastime of life he executed the bloody work with an industry which was almost superhuman and with a merriment which would have shamed a demon his execrable jests ringing through the blood and smoke and death cries of those days of perpetual sacrifice there could be no collision where the subaltern was only anxious to surpass an incomparable superior there are other conspirators in this crime whom we must notice further than has yet been done before coming to charge second these are surgeon isaiah h white and surgeon r r stevenson surgeon white as we have already seen went to andersonville under orders from the rebel war department and was there at its organization it is he who was responsible for the erection management and condition of the hospital there which dr jones said did not deserve the name and to enter which as a patient was almost certain death it is he to whose account stands recorded the deaths of over nine thousand prisoners whose neglect malpractice and prostitution of his abilities as a surgeon make him no less a criminal in the light of testimony showing a criminal intent than if he had deliberately killed those who were placed in his charge and of his criminal intent there can scarcely be any doubt when it is remembered that in his house and in his presence letters directed to union prisoners were opened rifled of their contents and their messages of love turned into merry-makings as we learn from the evidence of lewis dyer it was he who often spoke of the mortality with shocking levity and who uniformly neglected to take any notice of the suggestions made by the surgeons in their morning reports to him 
it was he who drove major boyle out of the hospital in the stockade and refused to allow his wound to be dressed because he was an officer of a colored regiment it was he who established the system and enforced it by orders of practicing by formulas and numbers which in the opinion of doctors rice head and thornburg was the sheerest empiricism it was he who kept in his employment as hospital steward one dr kerr who in the disguise of a federal soldier robbed the patients in the hospital and was a man of a notoriously cruel and brutal nature and it was he with regard to whom surgeon general moore remarks in his endorsements see exhibit twenty four manuscript page six nine five not having supplies is his own fault he should have anticipated the wants of the sick by timely requisitions and who upon the recommendation and by the order of this same surgeon-general in the face of the fact of his incompetency was less than two months afterwards assigned to duty as surgeon-in-chief of all the military hospitals east of the mississippi and who departed from andersonville in company with and on the staff of general winder rewarded rather than punished as was this general for his faithfulness in carrying out this conspiracy with all dr white's incompetency and as we learn from dr bates testimony stepping into the shoes of his predecessor without instituting a single reform or showing himself in any way his superior was surgeon r r stevenson further than this indeed he showed himself not only willing to perpetrate the evils that existed under dr white but he showed himself also wanting in the principles of honesty it is not necessary to enter into the details of his administration we learn enough of him through the witnesses doctors bates roy flewellen thornburg and rice the evidence of these witnesses and others show that he refused to distribute bed sacks and bedding to the suffering patients for the alleged reason that they would be destroyed that he refused to allow dr rice to go home and bring vegetables that were rotting in his garden for the use of the sick or to send a person for them that he constantly converted to his own use and loaded his own private table with viands sent for distribution among the sick that he misappropriated the hospital fund which accumulated by commuting in money a ration for each patient at the rate under his administration of about two dollars per ration and to increase which we learn from the evidence of dr thornburg he caused to be entered upon the hospital register the names of hundreds of persons as having been treated in the hospital who really died in the stockade without any medical treatment whatever and that for his glaring malfeasances and crime he was compelled to leave that post vaccination the record so far presented cannot fail to excite a feeling of horror and disgust but there is still another and a very important feature of the case yet to be brought out namely the inoculating of prisoners of war with poisonous vaccine matter this i believe is the only allegation set out in the charge not yet noticed but which when compared with other specific acts of cruelty seems to me the most revolting in the whole catalogue before speaking particularly of the effects of this alleged precautionary action on the part of the surgeons in charge who it seems acted under orders from the rebel authorities through winder and the prisoner i would call your attention to the evidence so that no man may say that this averment is false the evidence on this point proves distinctly one of two propositions either of which fixes on the persons responsible a most atrocious crime these are one that the vaccine matter used was poison and known to be such or second that it was knowingly and purposely applied under circumstances which made it almost certain that death would ensue the defence has set up that impure vaccine matter was used throughout the south with similar consequences and several medical gentlemen of the rebel army were called to prove that fact among others dr flewellen and dr castlin 
but it will be remembered that their experience and their knowledge was limited to observations in the year eighteen sixty three and they distinctly told you that orders were issued directing the surgeons upon the discovery of these fatal consequences to cease the use of the virus how then can the council presume to use this circumstance as a defence to the injurious results arising from the use of this spurious matter as late as eighteen sixty four with the full knowledge of a year's practice and year's experience before them i would rather think that the andersonville prisoners were made the victims of this experience not it may be with the knowledge of many of the surgeons on duty at that place for some of them seem to have been conscientious men but doubtless with the knowledge of the surgeons in charge their chief in richmond the prisoner at the bar and his immediate chief this evidence of the soldiers on this point is homely and blunt but it enables one to determine with some certainty that the effects described by them were by no means the ordinary results of vaccination oliver b fairbanks says record page ten twenty four manuscript page four thirty one large sores originated from the effects of poisonous matter they were the size of my hand and were on the outside of the arms and also underneath in the armpits i have seen holes eaten under the arms where i could put my fist in these cases were in the stockade in reply to the question state the circumstances under which you were vaccinated he replies record page ten twenty six manuscript page four thirty one i was in the south gate one morning when the operation was being performed while i was standing there looking on one of the surgeons came to me and requested me to roll up my sleeves that he was going to perform the operation on me i told him i could not consent to such an operation he called for a file of guards and i was taken to captain wirtz's headquarters arriving there one of the guard went in and directly captain wirtz came out of his office saying he wanted to know where that goddamned yankee son of a bitch was i was pointed out to him as being the person he drew his revolver and presented it within three inches of my face and wanted to know why i refused to obey his orders the witness proceeds to narrate his interview with the prisoner and says i told him captain you are aware that the matter with which i would be vaccinated is poisonous and therefore i cannot consent to an operation which i know will prove fatal to my life this prisoner flourished his revolver around and stated that it would serve me right the sooner i would die the sooner he would get rid of me the witness still refusing he was kept in chains and after a punishment of two weeks finally consented to the operation he says as soon as it was performed i went immediately to the brook and took a piece of soap and rubbed the spot and wrung it and thereby saved myself as confirmatory of fairbanks's statement that the prisoner interfered in this matter of vaccination and as tending to show that there was criminal design i quote the evidence of frank maddox record page eleven seventy three manuscript page five one four in reply to a question whether he ever heard the prisoner give orders in regard to vaccination he says i heard him tell the doctor at the gate to vaccinate all those men they were talking about having the smallpox there the doctor told him that according to his orders he would do it the same witness record page eleven seventy three manuscript page five fourteen being asked whether he saw the prisoner and any of the surgeons at the graveyard and heard them speak of vaccination replied they were laughing over it one day the doctors had been examining and had cut some bodies open had sawed some heads open in some cases a green streak from the arms had extended to the bodies they were laughing about it killing the men so george w gray says record page twenty seven o five manuscript page eleven sixty two it affected their arms the sores began just to rot around and to eat in until it got to the bone they generally lost their arms a great many of the men who had been vaccinated had their arms amputated 
john l yonker who was engaged in burying the dead in speaking of the amputated arms which were constantly sent to the graveyard to be buried says record page twenty one ninety three manuscript page nine fifty i noticed it daily the great part of it originated from vaccination the sores were mostly right there on the outer part of the arm near the shoulder and under the arms you could look into the ribs and see the bone it looked all black and green and blue lewis dyer record page twenty seven seventy one manuscript page eleven eighty four says i have seen men going around who had been vaccinated and two or three days after all their arms would be eaten out and their arms would have to be taken off charles e tibbles record page twenty forty four manuscript page eight ninety one who was also engaged in burying the dead says i saw many extra arms at the graveyard that were not cut but were disjointed at the shoulder they would be brought out with the dead and almost always the next day the bodies would be brought out belonging to them they were generally eaten up with vaccination william kraus record page fourteen sixty manuscript page six forty three says i saw men get vaccinated there it broke out i saw about twenty of them die and i saw five of them get their arms amputated doran h stearns record page twelve seventy nine manuscript page five six two speaking of amputation says the result was almost invariably death i do not remember a single case of recovery after an operation this witness was on duty at the hospital and is a man of much intelligence and candor to the same purport is the testimony of charles e smith record page twenty five forty manuscript page ten eighty five who also speaks of these orders with regard to vaccination and says he the prisoner said any one who would refuse to obey his orders would have a ball and chain put on there was a man named shields belonging to the second iowa infantry who refused to be vaccinated they took him out and put a ball and chain on him until he consented to have the matter put in his arm several of the surgeons on duty at andersonville have also testified to the fatal result of vaccination you will remember that the surgeons who have testified through their reports and upon the witness stand have spoken largely of hospital gangrene that prevailed at andersonville as a consequence of vaccination and indeed as they have universally testified as a consequence of even the slightest abrasion of the skin in cases of vaccination however resulting in appalling mortality vaccination with a genuine virus has never before resulted in such frightful mortality the records of medicine and pathology nowhere in no country and no age afford or approach a parallel to andersonville and it is eminently important that an explanation be reached if possible and if criminality attached to any one let its just consequences be upon him the best medical and pathological authorities agree in describing hospital gangrene as a variety of mortification and ulceration with rapid contamination of the whole system depression and exhaustion of the vital powers all of the conditions necessary to produce this terrible disease we learn from many sources in this record were abundantly supplied at andersonville and that there was scarcely a prisoner who was not more or less affected by it or in a scorbutic condition to a greater or less degree now we all know what is the normal effect of pure vaccine virus properly introduced into a healthy system one not previously vaccinated a local inflammation is set up a fever ensues attended with a general disturbance of the constitution and the insertion of the virus is the centre and source of it all with which the whole system sympathizes more or less and from which under the most careful circumstances and attention alarming and sometimes fatal results follow this is so well understood by the profession as all of us have experienced who have submitted to the operation that they always counsel a preparatory process by sanitary observances 
these facts drawn from reliable and recognized medical sources will enable the court and the world to appreciate in some degree the heartlessness and implacable cruelty of the rebel authorities at andersonville in persistently compelling prisoners of war to be vaccinated in the condition they are shown to have been in it will not do to say that this was resorted to as a preventive or precautionary measure the record shows but few cases of death by smallpox while the evidence establishes beyond doubt the fact that of many hundred prisoners vaccinated few recovered no one will pretend after a perusal of this record that the course of the rebel surgeons in this particular can in the slightest degree be excused and with the fair inference of evil intent and wicked purpose on the part of the chief surgeons doctors white and stevenson and the prisoner at the bar who with pistol in hand stood ready to enforce their direction which can be drawn from the evidence can you hesitate to find them guilty as laid in the charge the court cannot fail to observe that after having drawn from the record this long black catalogue of crimes these tortures unparalleled these murders by starvation implacable as could have been perpetrated had the spirit of darkness controlled them there are yet many very many phases of andersonville prison life that i must leave unnoticed has there been any defence made to these horrors is there any palliation for their perpetrators lives there a witness who has denied or can deny them the counsel for the prisoner has had unlimited control of the strong arm of the government he has had days and weeks for preparation he has as all must admit labored sedulously and untiringly for his client constituting himself at the same time counsel for his co-conspirators yet with all his efforts so earnestly put forth he has utterly signally failed the special acts of cruelty committed by the prisoner at the bar he has sought to explain with what success i leave to you to judge the general management and discipline and his responsibility for the same while at andersonville he has sought to deny by showing the presence at that place of a superior officer general winder who he alleges had chief control all this is swept away by the fact that before general winder's arrival the fearful rigors of that prison began they continued during his stay from june till october and they subsided only in proportion as the number of prisoners became less after general winder's departure and notwithstanding his earnest appeal made to you in his final statement begging that he a poor subaltern acting only in obedience to his superior should not bear the odium and the punishment deserved with whatever force these cries of a desperate man in a desperate and terrible strait may come to you there is no law no sympathy no code of morals that can warrant you in refusing to let him have all justice because the lesser and not the greater criminal is on trial to the charge of suffering and death by starvation something excusatory could be urged in the fact that supplies were not to be obtained had this been established but here as elsewhere the defence has wholly failed while the burden of proof rested upon the defence to show that the sufferings at andersonville were unavoidable it will be remembered it was part of the elements of the case made by the prosecution to show not only the fact of starvation but also that it occurred in a region of plenty and in view of this fact so clearly proven we find reason for concluding beyond all doubt that this crime against nature was the work of a deliberate malicious traitorous and hellish conspiracy to aid a most treasonable rebellion i desire now to present to the court the evidence which supports me in the belief just declared here as always i desire that the witnesses may speak that no man shall gainsay the facts major-general j h wilson of our army who perhaps can speak as advisedly upon this point as any witness who has been upon the stand for reasons shown in his testimony says record page eighteen thirty six manuscript page eight twenty 
after passing through the mountainous region of northern alabama i found supplies in great abundance on our lines of march in sufficient abundance to supply a command of seventeen thousand men without going off our lines of march for them his lines of march he says were from the northwest corner of alabama to a point called montebello and from thence south to selma from selma southward to montgomery from montgomery two lines one to columbus georgia and the other to west point georgia and thence by two converging lines to macon georgia and then all over the state of georgia from there to the gulf record page eighteen thirty seven manuscript page eight twenty in reply to the question if the rebel government drew supplies from that part of the country he says yes from central alabama to southwestern georgia for the wants of their armies operating in the field that was their grand region of supplies and speaking with regard to railroad communication by which these supplies could reach andersonville he says we found lines of railway running very nearly in the direction of the march from montebello and between the parts of country spoken of and macon and andersonville ambrose spencer a resident of georgia for many years says record page twenty four fifty eight manuscript page ten fifty southwestern georgia i believe is termed the garden of america it was termed the garden of the confederacy as having supplied the greater part of the provisions of the rebel army our section of georgia sumter county is perhaps not as rich as the counties immediately contiguous but still it produces heavily i suppose that the average of that land would be one bale of cotton to the acre the wheat would average about six bushels to the acre the average of corn about eight bushels and the court will recollect that he says he is stating the general average and not what one cultivated acre will produce and adds we have land in that county that will produce thirty-five bushels of corn to the acre speaking of the subject of vegetables in eighteen sixty four he says record page twenty four fifty nine manuscript page ten fifty one it struck me that there was an uncommon supply of vegetables heretofore at the south there has been but little attention paid to garden on a large scale but last year a very large supply of vegetables was raised as i understood for the purpose of being disposed of at andersonville james van valkenburg of bibb county near macon georgia says record page six fifty one manuscript page two six nine he has resided in that section for nineteen years and that in the year eighteen sixty four speaking of the crops i should suppose as to provisions it was more than an average crop inasmuch as no cotton was planted and all the ground was pretty well planted in provisions i should think the provision crop was larger than before the war this witness says that at macon which is about sixty-five miles by rail from andersonville there were a great many storehouses where provisions of various kinds were stored sugar rice molasses meat bacon corn wheat flour and so forth at americus he says there seemed to be very large quantities i saw a great deal of stores in various warehouses americus it will be remembered is only about nine or ten miles from andersonville the court will remember that of this more than ordinary crop of provisions the farmers were compelled by law to pay to the rebel government one-tenth i make a few extracts from the evidence of one of the agents of that government a tithe-gatherer w t davenport says record page twenty one forty four manuscript page nine thirty seven i was tithe agent from april eighteen sixty four till the surrender for sumter county the amount of bacon received at that depot from sumter county and from the counties of shashley webster and marion of which my depot being on the railroad was the receiving depot for the year eighteen sixty four was two hundred and forty seven thousand seven hundred and sixty eight pounds we received of corn thirty eight thousand nine hundred bushels of wheat three thousand five hundred eighty seven bushels we received three thousand four hundred and twenty pounds of rice in the rough 
of peas we received eight hundred and seventeen bushels of syrup of west india cane and sorghum three thousand seven hundred gallons of sugar one thousand one hundred sixty six pounds this was all in the year eighteen sixty four in eighteen sixty five he says record page twenty one forty five manuscript page nine thirty seven from the first of january till the nineteenth of april which was the time of the surrender i received from these same counties one hundred fifty five thousand seven hundred twenty six pounds of bacon thirteen thousand five hundred and ninety one bushels of corn and eighty six bushels of wheat this was the remnant due on the old crop the new crop not having been gathered i received of rice rough two thousand seventy seven pounds of peas eight hundred fifty four bushels of syrup five thousand eighty two gallons and these he says were not the only tithes gathered in these counties there were besides his depot others from which he has no account he says there was a depot at andersonville some portions of the tithes were delivered there and some portions were delivered to travelling companies that received tithes and were not reported to me on page twenty one forty seven manuscript page nine thirty nine he says referring to the counties named two of them schley and webster were quite small sumter and marion are fair average counties this immense amount of provisions is but a small portion received by the rebel government through their tithe gatherers it being brought to the depots by the farmers themselves and was only one-tenth of the amount produced by them these stores were turned over to w b harold who was commissary agent for these counties and who was also purchasing agent record page twenty one forty nine manuscript page nine forty w b harold says record page twenty five ninety seven manuscript page eleven twelve for the last three years i have been purchasing and shipping supplies for the commissary department of the rebel government for a district embracing from four to six counties in southwestern georgia one of the counties being that in which andersonville is located i was ordered at all times to hold all supplies which i had at americas after may or june i think subject first to andersonville in case they should get out of provisions there at any time my provisions were rather reserved for andersonville to be called on in case of an emergency i was ten miles distant such provisions as i had there bacon and meal i don't think they were ever out of at andersonville he continues i don't think i was ever called on for provisions that i did not furnish with the exception of meal in the early part of eighteen sixty four they depended on my arrangements for meal altogether during the first two or three months of the prison say february march and april before the crowded condition of the prison the orders were to issue five days rations at a time on requisition i kept up very well until they began to crowd the prisoners in and then i could not furnish sufficient meal and other arrangements were made the meal was afterwards obtained in large quantities from the palace mills in columbus on page twenty six o one manuscript page eleven thirteen when asked was there ever a time when there need to have been suffering at andersonville because of the inability to get supplies there he answers not so far as cornbread and meal were concerned i quote further from the record question was there any difficulty with regard to supplies answer no sir question was there no time when transportation could not have been procured answer at all times i think they could have procured transportation and did procure it on cross-examination he says the same provisions were furnished to andersonville that were furnished to the army and the same were furnished there as were furnished to the hospital but we have the evidence of scores of witnesses that they were never received by our starving prisoners end of part seven part four of henry wirtz commander of andersonville confederate prison trial and execution 
by united states army staff judge advocate part four closing statement of judge advocate prosecutor part eight james w armstrong was commissary at andersonville from the thirty first of march eighteen sixty four until august first eighteen sixty four and from the tenth of december eighteen sixty four until the close of the war record page forty four eighty four eighty five manuscript page eighteen ten until the fourteenth of july all the rations were delivered to r b winder or to his sergeant for him and after that time to captain wirtz's sergeant he says he doesn't pretend to know whether the rations issued by him were actually delivered to the prisoners or not on page forty four ninety six manuscript page eighteen thirteen we find the following question you never were at any time so short that you could not issue to the prisoners answer no sir in three or four instances i issued rice instead of cornmeal but i always made up the rations question you never found it necessary to diminish the rations except by substituting one thing for another answer that is all question you always had plenty to issue answer yes sir colonel ruffin who was in the commissary department at richmond and who was called for the defence to show that lee's army suffered for the want of provisions record page forty four thirty thirty one manuscript page seventeen eighty nine says that at that time the prisoners were consuming general lee's reserve of thirty thousand barrels of flour the removal of prisoners from richmond to the seat of plenty was urged by the commissary department after a while he says the prisoners were sent to the place of comparative plenty or to the place of supply he further says record page forty four thirty three manuscript page seventeen ninety that in sending the prisoners to georgia the only object of his department was to get them to what was considered a good region of country that they were drawing supplies from georgia to feed general lee he says on page forty four twenty eight that the armies of the southwest fared better than general lee's army because they were in georgia where there was more abundance and in the same connection on cross-examination says that general lee's army suffered because it was cut off from the southwest by federal raids which destroyed their railroad communication ambrose spencer says record page twenty four fifty six manuscript page ten fifty that section of southwestern georgia is well supplied with mills both grist mills flour mills and saw mills between andersonville and albany about fifty miles there are five saw mills one of them a large one there is one at a distance of six miles from andersonville that goes by steam there is another about five miles from andersonville that goes by water there are saw mills on the road above andersonville and in this connection as touching the question of shelter and the facilities with which it could have been furnished the prisoners the witness says further it is a very heavily timbered country especially in the region adjoining andersonville it may be termed one of the most densely timbered countries in the united states on page twenty four sixty manuscript page ten fifty one i was there andersonville during june and july very frequently at the time governor brown had called out the militia of the state their tents were all floored with good lumber and a good many shelters of lumber were put up by the soldiers i noticed a good many tents that were protected from the sun by boards there seemed to be no want of lumber at that time among the confederate soldiers colonel person says record page six twenty one manuscript page two fifty two that about five trainloads perhaps fifty carloads in all came to andersonville while he was there this he says would have covered two three four or five acres with barracks thus we have shown from evidence of the highest character that the defence based upon want of supplies within the reach of the rebel authorities and which is popularly believed to have been the real cause of the sufferings of andersonville is entirely overthrown and without foundation in fact and the same may be said of every question entering into the defence incident to the matter of supplies 
with whatever truth the straitened circumstances of the south may be urged to exculpate those in charge of other prisons certainly so far as andersonville is concerned no one will hereafter with seriousness dare to urge it having shown with certainty that supplies were abundant and available i cannot omit to mention what amount was actually issued as the only means of sustenance to the prisoners i quote dr bates whose acknowledged credibility on the part of the accused in his statement to the court makes it unnecessary to support him by the many witnesses who testify to the same point but the court will remember that his estimate is several ounces more than the prisoners themselves testify to having received he says record page one seventy four manuscript page thirty seven i wish to be entirely safe and well guarded on this point there might have been less than twenty ounces to the twenty-four hours but i do not think it could have exceeded that the ration it will also be remembered consisted of one unvarying diet of cornbread and salt meat with an occasional issue of peas and with no vegetables whatever in comparison with this scanty allowance which the concurrent testimony of all the witnesses shows was the immediate cause of the great mortality at that prison i desire to call your attention to some interesting and instructive facts showing the amount of food necessary to sustain life i quote from a work on the economy of armies by medical inspector lieutenant colonel a c hamlin united states army the data of french's show that eighteen ounces of properly selected food will be sufficient and the observations of sir john sinclair are to the same effect yet dr christian maintains that thirty-six ounces are required to preserve the athletic condition of prisoners confined for a long term to preserve the athletic condition with these small quantities the nutrient substance must be of known value in the public establishments of england the following quantities are given british soldier forty five ounces seaman royal navy forty four ounces convict fifty seven ounces male pauper twenty nine ounces male lunatic thirty one ounces the full diets of the hospitals of london give guy twenty nine ounces with one pint of beer bartholomew thirty one ounces with four pints of beer or tea st thomas twenty five ounces with three pints of beer or tea st george twenty seven ounces with four pints of beer or tea kings twenty five ounces the russian soldier has bread sixteen ounces meat sixteen ounces turkish soldier has bread thirty three ounces meat thirteen ounces french soldier has bread twenty six ounces meat eleven ounces hessian soldier has bread thirty six ounces meat six ounces english sailor has bread twenty ounces meat sixteen ounces the united states soldier receives three quarter pound of bacon or one and one quarter pound of fresh or salt beef eighteen ounces of bread or flour or three quarter pound of hard bread or one and one quarter pound of corn meal with rice beans vegetables coffee sugar tea and so forth in proportion when we remember that there seems to have been no difference made in the rations issued to the sick in the hospital and prisoners confined in the stockade that is we have seen by the testimony of dr jones the mortality was proportionately the same in both places and all the surroundings so prolific of disease added to the fact that for months the prisoners had barely room to stand upon we are prepared to comprehend the force of the illustrations above given and those which i shall now give the number of patients treated in the hospital at andersonville is shown by the hospital register to have been something less than eighteen thousand the number of deaths a little short of thirteen thousand and to this number must be added two thousand more who as we have shown with reasonable certainty died before reaching their homes making in all fifteen thousand and this falls far short of the maximum number giving as we see the frightful ratio of mortality of over eighty three per cent 
quoting from the same learned author we find that the average mortality of the london hospitals is nine per cent in the french hospitals in the crimea for a period of twenty-two months the mortality was fourteen per cent the city of milan received during the campaign in italy thirty four thousand sick and wounded of whom fourteen hundred or four per cent died the city of nashville tennessee received during the year eighteen sixty four sixty five thousand one hundred and fifty six sick and wounded of whom two thousand six hundred thirty five or four per cent died during the year eighteen sixty three washington received sixty eight thousand eight hundred and eighty four and of these but two thousand six hundred seventy one or less than four per cent died and in eighteen sixty four her hospitals received ninety six thousand seven hundred and five sick and wounded forty nine thousand four hundred fifty five sick forty seven thousand two hundred and fifty wounded of whom six thousand two hundred and eighty three or six and four tenths per cent died the mortality of the rebel prisoners at fort delaware for eleven months was two per cent at johnson's island during twenty one months a hundred and thirty four deaths out of six thousand prisoners this is the record of history against the charnel house of andersonville let the mouths of those who would defend these atrocities by recrimination charging the united states government with like cruelty forever hereafter be closed fort delaware and johnson's island with their two per cent of dead andersonville with its eighty three per cent look upon this picture and then upon this and tell me there was no design to slay let no mind be it warped never so much by treason and treasonable sympathies doubt this record for if damned custom have not blazed its soul that it be proof and bulwark against sense it must believe it cannot deny these things may it please the court i have done with the argument under charge first i leave it with you to answer by your verdict whether this charge of conspiracy solemnly and seriously preferred can be frittered away and disposed of without a single explanatory line in defence i place before you gentlemen on the one hand the protestations of this accused who speaks for himself and his co-conspirators on the other the testimony of dr bates where he declared as you well remember with faltering tone and feelings overpowered i feel myself safe in saying that seventy-five per cent of those who died might have been saved had those unfortunate men been properly cared for i leave it with you to say whether the prisoner at the bar can acquit himself and his associates in crime by declaring the charge here laid to be as he has told you a myth a fantasy of the brain a wild chimera as unsubstantial as the baseless fabric of a vision at this point the court on the suggestion of the judge advocate adjourned until to-morrow morning at ten o'clock united states military commission washington d c saturday october twenty one eighteen sixty five the commission met pursuant to adjournment present all the members and the judge advocate the prisoner and his counsel were also present the proceedings of the last meeting were read and approved the judge advocate continued his argument as follows may it please the court we now come to notice charge second alleging murder in violation of the laws of war under which there are laid numerous specifications alleging with all the particularity that was possible the circumstances in each case in presenting the evidence under this charge i shall try to do so in the briefest and simplest manner i shall not endeavour to torture the evidence to support any preconceived theory nor ingeniously dovetail scattered scraps of testimony to make out a case i am content to leave the court to reach its own conclusions and therefore i shall except in two cases 
which have been particularly referred to in the defence do little more than simply recite the evidence of the witnesses my simple purpose is to aid the court in the discharge of the arduous task upon which it is about to enter in making up a verdict on this voluminous record the various cases of death which are justly to be laid to the charge of this prisoner as murders may be considered under four heads one the cases of death resulting from mutilation by the hounds two the instances of death resulting from confinement in the stocks and the chain gang three the cases of killing of prisoners by the guards pursuant to the direct order of the accused given at the time and four the cases of killing by the prisoner's own hand this classification does not embrace those very numerous cases which it is not deemed necessary to recount in detail where prisoners at or near the deadline were shot by the guards when the accused was not present the responsibility of the prisoner for these murders for such wanton unprovoked and unjustifiable destruction of human life was nothing less has been treated of in a previous branch of the argument without repeating that argument i will say in addition that there is no truth in the assumption put forth as a defence in the written statement of the accused that the prisoners within the stockade had ample notice of the deadline regulation and that if any were shot in crossing that line he was not responsible the evidence of the defence failed to show although i believe it was attempted that the deadline regulation was posted up within the stockade besides many of the witnesses on this stand testified that going to andersonville as new prisoners they received no authoritative notice of the deadline regulation but accidentally or casually acquired that knowledge from their companions and some have told us of their hairbreadth escapes from being shot soon after entering the stockade in consequence of their ignorance of that regulation and a number of witnesses have described how their comrades lost their lives in consequence of similar ignorance after all the evidence on this subject i was astonished as i doubt not was the court when the prisoner in his statement inquired with singular effrontery page forty seven eighty is it within the range of probability that there was a single prisoner within the stockade who did not know the penalty for encroaching upon the deadline before proceeding to refer to the evidence as to the deaths from mutilation by the hounds and from the confinement in the stocks and chain gang it may be proper to say a few words as to the criminal responsibility of the prisoner for these deaths in the first place i need hardly remind the court of that fundamental principle of law that a sane man is conclusively presumed to contemplate the natural and probable consequences of his own acts one greenleaf on evidence section eighteen this principle i submit applies in this case with great force i maintain that the deaths resulting from the use of the stocks and the chain gang as an indiscriminate punishment for the healthy and the sick the strong and the feeble and the deaths consequent upon the pursuit of escaping prisoners with ferocious hounds were but the natural and probable consequences of the act of the prisoner in maintaining and carrying out this barbarous system of discipline what more natural and probable than that a prisoner emaciated by disease and starvation should when confined in the chain gang or the stocks die from such confinement what more natural and probable than that a ferocious dog when pursuing an escaping prisoner should tear and mortally mutilate such prisoners particularly if he were in the debilitated condition which characterized most of the prisoners at andersonville and when death results under such circumstances and from the adoption of such methods of treatment an intention to kill on the part of him who adopts them is the necessary and rightful presumption of the law just as an attempt to murder is conclusively inferred from the deliberate use of a deadly weapon one greenleaf on evidence section eighteen 
again it has been laid down that the crime of murder is consummated whenever any one wilfully endangers the life of another by any act or omission likely to kill and which does kill to starkey on evidence seven ten note it has also been declared by high legal authority that it is not essential that the hand of the party should immediately occasion the death it is sufficient if he be proved to have used any mechanical means likely to occasion death and which do ultimately occasion it as if a man lay poison for another with intent that he should take it by mistake for medicine or expose him against his will in a severe season by means of which he dies to starkey on evidence seven ten note as illustrative of the same legal principle allow me to quote from wharton's criminal law four thirty five if a person breaking in an unruly horse wilfully ride him among a crowd of persons the probable danger being great and apparent and death ensue from the viciousness of the animal it is murder for how can it be supposed that a person wilfully doing an act so manifestly attended with danger especially if he showed any consciousness of such danger himself should intend any other than mischief to those who might be encountered by him so if a man maliciously throw from a roof into a crowded street where passengers are constantly passing and repassing a heavy piece of timber calculated to produce death on such as it might fall and death ensue the offence is murder at common law from these principles it follows that when we show the prisoner's responsibility for the use of the chain-gang and the stocks and for the employment of the hounds we show that every death resulting from these was a murder for which he is to be held accountable in this connection allow me to refer hastily to some of the evidence showing the responsibility of the prisoner for the use of the stocks and the chain-gang and for the employment of the hounds robert tate page twenty six forty eight manuscript page eleven thirty three george w gray page twenty six ninety eight manuscript page eleven fifty seven colonel gibbs page one o eight manuscript page eighteen charles f williams page thirteen ninety one manuscript page six fifteen j h goldsmith page twenty fifty three manuscript page nine o two j h burns page twenty two ninety five manuscript page nine eighty four and numerous other witnesses testify as to the prisoner ordering men into the stocks and the chain gang in some cases the men subjected to this treatment were very greatly debilitated and in other cases they had just been brought back wounded by the hounds several of the witnesses testify that the accused would go round the stockade every morning in company with the hounds to get the track of prisoners who had escaped a w barrows page two twenty four manuscript page eighty six p v holly page ten forty six manuscript page four fifty three and many others testify that the accused gave orders for starting the dogs in pursuit of prisoners who had escaped j d keyser page five seventy four manuscript page two forty three states that he heard him tell turner to get the dogs james mohan a rebel officer who was on duty at andersonville testifies that when frenchy escaped the prisoner gave orders to get the dogs after him and he was captured the prisoner going with the dogs and this the court will remember is admitted in the statement submitted by him boston corbett page four four three manuscript page one sixty eight testifies that after being captured by the dogs he was brought before the accused who said to the captor why did you not make the dogs bite him j h davidson page nine thirty five manuscript page three eighty four saw a prisoner torn by the dogs the accused being present dr f g castlin who was a surgeon in the rebel service relates an instance page six eighty nine manuscript two seventy seven where a man was ordered down from a tree and bitten by the hounds the prisoner being present john f heath a rebel officer who was on duty at andersonville testifies page seven seventy eight manuscript page three nineteen 
that when frenchy was pursued the prisoner ordered him down from the tree and the dogs rushed at him and bit him the prisoner not trying to keep the dogs off this rebel witness it will be observed contradicts the allegations made by the prisoner in his written statement that he endeavoured to keep the dogs off james p stone page twenty two twenty manuscript page nine ninety says that the dogs were fed with rations drawn from the bakery most frequently by a young man who assisted turner and that the prisoner signed an order once to give this man all the bread and meat he wants for the dogs joseph adler testifies page twelve o five twelve thirty four manuscript page five twenty nine five forty that on one occasion dr white and the prisoner were looking at a man who was so mangled by the dogs as to be almost dead when the prisoner said it was perfectly right that it served the man right that he had no business to make his escape and that he would not care if all the damned yankees in the stockade could be served in the same way as that as he wanted to get rid of them the prisoner himself in his consolidated return for august eighteen sixty four exhibit thirteen speaks of twenty-five prisoners who escaped during the month but were taken up by the dogs these citations which might be multiplied are sufficient to show the responsibility of the accused for the punishment of the prisoners by the stocks and the chain gang and for the pursuit of prisoners by the hounds and according to the principles already referred to every death resulting from such punishment and such pursuit must justly be considered as having been murderously caused by him remembering also that the use of the means resorted to and the means themselves were a gross and wicked violation of the laws of war i will now proceed to recite the evidence as to the cases where death resulted from the pursuit of prisoners by the hounds william henry jennings page twelve forty five manuscript page five forty five testifies that a month or two after he was whipped which was in the month of march he being in the hospital saw a man come in who was torn by the dogs bitten from his feet up to his head and all around his neck and that the man died shortly afterwards bernard corrigan page thirteen fifty one manuscript page five ninety eight states that in may he saw a prisoner who was badly bitten by the dogs in both legs and he had a piece of his ear cut off the man was carried to the hospital the day following and the witness never saw him afterwards james e marshall page seventeen fourteen manuscript page seven sixty six testifies that in may he saw a man whose leg was torn by the hounds and who afterwards died in the hospital john l yonker page twenty one eighty seven manuscript page nine forty seven testifies that just before the raiders were hung which was about the eleventh of july a man belonging to an indiana regiment tried to make his escape from the hospital was recaptured by the hounds and sent back to the stockade in the evening that his right ear was almost off and that he was bitten in several places in the legs and had hardly any clothing on him that witness gave him a piece of his shirt and helped to tie up his wounds that the wounded man gave his friend a picture to give to his mother if he should never recover because he believed he would die that the next morning he was dead that the man stated that he had tried to climb a tree but the dogs pulled him down in connection with the incident just narrated it may be pertinent to adduce the evidence of joseph adler and george conway apparently having reference to the same transaction george conway page twenty two forty three manuscript page nine sixty six testifies that on one occasion he does state the date he saw a man who had been caught by the hounds while making his escape from the hospital the man was bitten on his legs and in his cheek joseph adler page twelve o five manuscript page five twenty nine states that in the latter part of june or the beginning of july dr white and the prisoner were looking at a man who had been mangled by the dogs the prisoner said it was perfectly right george w gray page twenty seven o four manuscript page eleven sixty one states that on one occasion he saw a young man who had just been brought into the stockade after having been caught by the hounds part of his cheek was torn off 
his arms hands and legs were bitten so that he only lived about twenty-four hours after having been brought into the stockade thomas n way page twelve fifty seven manuscript page five fifty two states that in the latter part of august he and two others with whom he escaped were pursued by the hounds and that one of his comrades was caught by the foot as he was climbing a tree and was torn all to pieces a w barrows page two forty four manuscript page eighty seven states that about the end of august a man who had been bitten by the dogs when trying to escape was brought into his ward and died about five days afterwards james p stone page twenty two twenty three manuscript page nine fifty nine states that in july or august he saw a man who had made his escape who had been caught and badly torn by the dogs that he was bitten badly in the legs and also a great deal about the neck and shoulders that he had made his escape and climbed a tree that the accused and harris shook him down and allowed the dogs to tear him frank maddox page eleven sixty eight manuscript page five thirteen testifies that when he was burying a man who had been bitten by the dogs had afterwards been placed in the stocks by order of the prisoner and who had died turner who had charge of the hounds came to the graveyard and said that there had been two men bitten by the hounds and that they let the dogs tear up the other one in the woods and that they left him there w w crandall page seventeen forty two manuscript page seven seven eight testifies that on one occasion he does not give the date he saw a man with his legs badly torn by the dogs that a ball was put upon his foot and that he was kept that way for several weeks that witness went to the prisoner and pleaded with him to take the balls off the prisoner said he could not do it witness asked the surgeon to do it the surgeon examined the man and said that he could not conscientiously take off but one the man's leg became badly swollen and witness believes the man died as he three weeks afterwards buried a man whom he thought he recognized as the same i have thus hastily passed over the evidence touching this class of murders i shall presently endeavour to individualise the instances mentioned and to reconcile and unite the separated and in some instances apparently complicated circumstances but before doing so let me suggest that on the review of this evidence while the testimony must be and ought to be subjected to the closest criticism and scrutiny and while the court should be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of the guilt of this accused still i submit it as worthy of grave consideration that there are many circumstances peculiar to prison life as it was at andersonville which make the ordinary test applied in tribunals of law for the verification of testimony altogether inappropriate in this case the court will not forget that there existed at andersonville a condition of affairs for which it would be impossible to find a precedent the prisoners were deprived to a great measure of facilities for ordinary intelligence or for communication with each other and the outer world they were subjected to the closest and most cruel confinement and discipline most of them were constantly racked with the pangs of hunger or disease or engrossed from hour to hour in a struggle with death in which the odds were fearfully against them their companions were constantly dying around them either from emaciation disease or acts of violence so that as the prisoners themselves have declared in the presence of the court they became so habituated to these horrible surroundings that the death of a comrade under what would ordinarily seem the most frightful circumstances made in many cases but a slight impression upon their minds and certainly they would not charge their memory with dates or circumstances even should they be able to fix the time and it will be remembered that many of them state that they lost all knowledge of the days of the week and the month besides they never expected to emerge from that scene alive and never hoped that a day would come when their persecutor would be arraigned before a tribunal of justice and they themselves be summoned as witnesses to his iniquitous acts it is not to be expected that under these circumstances 
witnesses should evince such precision as to dates and minute particulars as might be expected in an ordinary trial for the investigation of offences disturbing but rarely the tranquillity of civilized society a court of justice never requires higher evidence than the best of which the case will admit for as has well been remarked by a distinguished legal writer the rules of evidence are adopted for practical purposes in the administration of justice and must be so applied as to promote the end for which they were designed first greenliff's evidence section eighty three but i have no apology to offer no defence to make for the testimony upon which the prosecution relies for the conviction of this accused under the charges now being examined in every case where you are asked to hold the prisoner responsible for the death of any one of those in his custody you will find the evidence direct positive and clear you are not asked to find this prisoner guilty upon vague uncertain doubtful testimony but you are asked to apply the rules of evidence properly applicable to cases occurring under the peculiar circumstances to which we have alluded always remembering that your duty is to arrive at the truth in the most direct manner possible End of part eight